Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another week, another edition of ESL Open Cup Asia, number 219. And oh, I just realized that I have the wrong title. Un momento here, but welcome to ESL Open Cup Asia 2019, your weekly dose of ESL Asia StarCraft. I'm, of course, your host, Live VIP, and with me, I'm joined by the lovely people in the chat, by these amazing players as well, exclamation mark B in the chat if you guys want to have a look at the bracket yourselves again plenty of amazing players are lying before us and we have our first series it's going to be a pvp between oh it's going to be a pvp between two predators between stats and jeshi oh boy here we go again these players have been on the rise one of these players has been looking pretty hot right now as well and i'm ready to bear witness as spawning in the bottom left hand corner we have the chinese protoss player representing dragon kai z gaming dkz it is jeshi And spawning in the top right-hand corner, we have his opponent, we have the South Korean Protoss player, the Red Protoss representing himself, it is Stats. Ah. <laughs> and speaking of, a big shout out to the people in the chat, and a big shout out to Complete Noob as well, oh my god, for the gifted sub, gifting a sub to Canuck Prime. Thank you, Papi. Thank you so much for the support. We do appreciate it. Thanks for all the support that we get in the chat. We're able to, again, we're able to commit. We're able to fund our tournaments. We're able to host our events. Thank you, Papi. Thank you. Always much appre appreciated. Quack. Quack, Papi. Quack. And uh, here we go. We're getting into said PvP. And as we were mentioning our players stats he has been on the rise recently he has been on the rise he has been getting better and better getting better results as well taking maps off of dark taking series of some big players i would not yet confidently say that stats is back in form but he has been improving that is what i will say he has been improving and his rate of improvement has been continuing here uh throughout these past couple of months so i'm excited to see how far he can go and how high he can climb also, speaking of a shout out, <laughs> a shout out as well to Kibrit in the chat. Oh my god, Kibrit, Kybrit, thank you, thank you, Papi, thank you so much for subscribing for four months. Oh, four months, thank you so much for all the support. That's a lot of months, that's a lot of support. Quack, thank you, thank you so much. Hope you enjoy the emotes, hope you enjoy the replay packs, hope you enjoy the content and the casting on the Cranky Ducklings. Gracias, Papi, gracias. Oh. Again, the night is still young. You know, there are plenty of matches ahead of us here tonight. And we might have a couple of extra matches as well. Because we do have ESL Open Cup Europe later on in the evening. We also might be diving into some Stars War qualifiers as well. Which is starting up in a couple of hours. So, right after this, we have the Stars War qualifiers. Then right after that, we do have the ESL Open Cup Europe weekly as well. As it is going to be a two-gate open out of stats, it's going to be a two-gate open out of Jeshi as well. Of course, we casted stats during the KSL over the weekend. Uh, stats was able to... Uh, did face off against Hero and did struggle against Hero, but he was able to bring down some other big Protosses nonetheless. So it was great to see stats thrive, at least in the PvP matchup. Did he take down Classic? I'm just quickly double-checking. Um, it was KSL 46, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, KSL 46, and sorry, it was stats. He didn't take down Classic, he took down Parting. He 2 0 Parting in the KSL, which was very impressive. Then went down to Hero, but I mean, that's Hero. Now he's here against Jeshi. Jeshi, of course, another rising star, another top tier player in the Chinese region. One of the best Protoss in all of China, in all of the Asia region. But here we go, we are moving out with our initial depths. It is going to be four depths for the time being. We have a fifth and sixth depth as well. In the, ah, God. <laughs> All the notifications. A fifth and sixth depth as well. A big shout out to Aistan in the chat. Oh, my God. Giving a gifted sub to Herm. Oh, God. Henrik B. There we go. Henrik. 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 Oh, thank you. Henrik B. Even. Thank you so much for gifting your sub. And thank you for the bits as well. God, Papi, God. Thank you for the 100 bits. Complete new. Thank you. Thank you. All the support. All the support. As the depths, they do not quite shade into the main base. They are going to be denied. And thankfully, not too much craziness has occurred yet. Both players have taken their expansions. Jeshi has a slight worker lead, um, but has a later expansion in general here. And we are getting into our text of choice. 
Twilight Council. Twilight Council opener here out of stats. Jeshi himself going for a Robo opener instead. Robo opener typically is more defensive here. We're able to get into faster immortal production to make up for a stalker deficit, but stats will have the much more mobile army with the blink stalkers. Meanwhile, the adepts are going to be getting across the map once again. We do pick off a couple of probes. Two probes are going to be going down. We get two workers so far, and we should be able to barely get a third probe as well. Oh, we barely do not. Shield battery putting in a lot of work there, barely saving all of these workers, and only two probes go down. Two probes for four adepts. Sorry, two probes for six adepts. Not really worth it here for Jeshi. But he's not done. Continuing to shade in those depths, keeping stats on the back foot, keeping him pinned back at home. We do manage to pick off a couple more workers. Good target find. We get three probes in total. Much better trade for Jeshi. And he continues to warp in, by the way. Just non-stop adept aggression here from the Chinese Protoss. Behind this, there's that immortal production we spoke about, that we spoke about. We have to build up these immortals. The reason for this is because Jeshi is throwing away his army for economic damage which means he has almost nothing here to defend he has two sentries we need immortals to hold on speaking of stats is coming in for a counter attack now thankfully because jeshi has been producing all these immortals and alongside the sentries with force fields with guardian shield with the overcharge with the shield battery we should be okay we should be a-okay here from the side of jeshi at say move out once again and oh can they barely break through they do not we came into the shade and we cannot get any additional damage done either. Two more depths thrown away and I'm worried for Jeshi. Now Jeshi does have a higher worker count because of all the economic damage he's been doing. That is true, but the army is struggling as a result. And because of that, Jeshi's stuck at home. Now it makes sense for Jeshi to expand. He's taking his third base because he has no map control right now. He lost all of his army. He's stuck at home and taking a faster third. Meanwhile, stats with a later third base, but he's got an army. He has an army. He has blink stats. Even though breaking this army is going to be difficult, there's no shield battery at the third. This position here is actually a little bit vulnerable, and we, there is a window. There's a timing that we can break through this. Otherwise, we could bypass the army and try to head into the main, or even into the natural. Now, stats pushing in does trigger the shields on one of the immortals. And we go for the dive. There we go. One immortal is going to be going down. We're going to try to focus on the other as well. We got one, we get two sentries, a third of all has arrived. Ooh, and the shield battery finishes up just in time. Stats, this was not worth it. Killing the first immortal, that was all well and good, but the second immortal refused to go down. Shield battery finished up just in time there to save Jeshi. And with that Jeshi, he does push back. And Stats getting punished hard here. Boris over extension. Also, it is not the Sparkling Tunica, but I will get rid of that as well. <laughs> Don't apologize. Uh, we were casting the Sparkling Tunica yesterday, and I will have to get rid of that Logos mod. But with that, Jeshi he holds on. He gets away with his third base. He maintains his economic lead, and behind this, we're getting into plus one. We have completed Blink. Jeshi now has Blink alongside his opponents. Speaking of... Oh, stalkers are going down. We do miss a couple of blinks there. The immortals doing what they can. Jeshi is slowly breaking through. And now the pendulum swings. The pendulum swings in favor of Jeshi. Suddenly, stats is in a bit more trouble. He's throwing down a second shield battery. Warping in some zealots just to be safe. We see Jeshi rotating around. And we won't quite commit. Oh. Uh, yeah, we're just waiting for more reinforcements. Looking at the unit stat, we have an even amount of stalkers plus the defender's advantage. So stats, he should be able to hold on. Yeah, Jeshi knows that he backs up. He's going to rotate around. Could make his way towards the main. Stats in the midst of expanding. Jeshi already has his fourth. He already threw down his fourth base. We diamond on the prism. Prism goes down. Big snipe there from Stats, and he takes down one. He's going to take down the second Immortal, and Jeshi, he did overextend. He did just overstay his welcome. Stuck around a little bit too long, and Stats, upon building up his army, upon kicking in with charge, now he's getting out of hand. Now this is becoming a bit too much. Stats, he does have the better army. The better composition, I should say. And it's also doing an amazing job here, just tanking shots. Uh, stats, though, were bleeding out of units here, and I was about to say that Stats, he can't really commit without a warp prism. He needs reinforcements. He needs those warp ins, and Stats, he bleeds out quite a lot here in the attack. 
At the same time, where's the prism? Not with the main army. It's going for her ass. Bold move. Bold move out of stats here. Gonna be moving out for a counterattack instead. So I'll take it into the mineral line. Probes are going down. Looking at the units that Jeshi does have the stalker lead. So stats he can't win a head on engagement. Four probes full. Let me back up. We force the overcharge. And stats he will retreat. And this is still very neck and neck here. Jeshi, remember, he had the faster fourth. In general, Jeshi also had the faster third base. He's had the higher worker count for most of this game. Jeshi maintains that economic advantage, and with that, he does have a higher stalker count in general. Now, the Immortals were killed, so we're lacking Immortals, making up for that in Stalkers. Sats so moves right through the center. Jeshi has to respond. Uh, does he, though? We could commit. We could try to, but Sats, he keeps up. He does fall back in time. Sees the main army. Shield battery isn't done, by the way. Yeah, we can focus that down. And we won't quite commit. We're going to back up from here. We get three probe kills. At the same time, the Zealot run by does come in. A big Zealot counterattack as we break the shield battery. We break the cannon. These Zealots, they're getting a lot done. At the same time, Stats pushing through. He's pulling Jeshi apart as we get the warp in into the main base. Zealots in the natural. Zealots in the main. We force a recall. The main army is breaking through. The tri front attack at a Stats. And even though Jeshi has the higher army supply, he's just being pulled apart. He just doesn't have enough where he needs it. Zealous, they are reinforcing. It looks like Jeshi will hold, he will hold on to his fourth. And he's lost eight workers, and that evens up the worker count. As we're trying to get some more damage done, another big warping into the main base. A massive amount of Zealots here. Can we deny plus two? Oh, we will delay it. The pylon goes down, and oh, it's quite a bit depowered. We get 10 worker kills. We recall back home. Statsy takes a slight worker lead. Meanwhile, Jeshi, he takes, well, he's the first to take a fifth base towards his opponents. A bold base to be taken here by Jeshi. Stats, he's going for the gold. He is going for the gold, and this is still a very scrappy game state. Like, it's still very close between these two players. The economy is pretty neck and neck. You know, at one point, swinging in favor of one player, then the other. Zealot Rabbi is being sent out. We are going to be reinforcing. And it looks like Stats is going to be calming things down. This is calming things down. The Zealot aggression for the most part has ended. We do have another run by setup for the natural. We do have the prism poise for the main. But you can see Jeshi taking this very seriously. We have cannons and shield batteries all on the way. We we'll leave some units in position. Meanwhile, at the same time, Jeshi just scattered the goal, I believe. I, at least he saw the army. Have the enemy. Now, from here, we haven't taken up even further, or uh, further at all. I'm waiting for Templar Archives, a robotic spade, destructive production, or Archons. That's not really on the table yet. Both players are getting into plus three. Both players are sticking with gateway heavy compositions. Basically, Stalker Zealot versus Stalker Zealot. A very mobile army. Not very expensive either. So both players are, they should be maxing out. When it comes to the plus three timing, even though the, rope, the forge was depowered, it's still faster. Still faster than that of stats. Stats going for a second forge. That's going to be for shield upgrades or even armor upgrades as well. Both do have their place. Stats, he returns around. He catches the fifth. Army's out of position. The fifth base taking some damage. Five probes go down. At the same time, a big Zealot run by here at the third. Only one shield battery. Yeah, we do see a weak point here in the defense. Three for the Zealots. Gonna be able to hold on. We'll hold, we will survive. At the same time, Jeshi going for his own Zella drop, but is gonna be cleaned up. It gets three probes and a cannon, not too bad. Going for a warp in. Trying to get a bit more done, but the prism goes down at the same time. We do see Jeshi pushing th straight for the center. Straight for the goal base. Overcharge is pop. Zealots are running out on both sides. 
Yeah, Jeshi is going to be falling back, but he does get nine probe kills. Remember, he came in from behind. He got the workers in the gold, in the mineral line. Sell it run by Zay. Just don't stop. Don't stop, Pappy. And stats he is breaking through here towards the south. Getting a couple of stalker kills. Big pickoffs. Jeshi does defend. He does clean this up. He does maintain a higher worker count. Again, again, killing those nine pros was pretty big. Was pretty huge. But Jeshi needs time to recover. Dreamax plus three is done for our purple Protoss. So Jeshi has the upgrade advantage. This is an anti-timing out of stats. He does have the better concave, but I spoke too soon because here come reinforcements. Jeshi is collapsing on this army. Plus three just now finished for stats. At the same time, Zellarambe comes in. Site Defense is trying to buy some time. We do have a warp in. And Jeshi should clean this up. We do mix in an Immortal. That is going to help out quite a lot, actually. Ah, stats is breaking through. And Jeshi doesn't have enough to defend. He's trying to rotate back around. The natural base has been broken. And Stats, he dives on the army. Catching out some free units. Zelt's going to be going down. Stats, he's maxed out. He does have momentum on his side. Again, Stats, he breaks the base. He catches a bunch of units. And we're going for a base trade. We're going for a straight up base trade. Stats, he kills the fourth. Meanwhile, his fifth gold base is going to be going down. And we're going to keep on pushing. Stats splitting up his army. Weren't quite. There we go. He should be able to take down the fifth and the third. Stats, he's just so much faster with the base trade. We're running out of buildings. We have to recall. Yeah, we do have to recall back home. Jeshi is down to two bases. The main base and the fifth. Because the third is going to fall. Meanwhile, Stats, he still has so much mining going on. He can warp in. Yeah, it's like, again, Stats, he was just so much faster to pull the, to pull the trigger on the base trade. He has the economy. He has the production. Jeshi just now finishing up with his shields. He is collapsing on this. He does have that one immortal. Ah, but Jeshi didn't kill the third. Ay, ay, ay. With that, it's all or nothing for Jeshi. He's all in. Doesn't have an economy. Not anymore. Stats, he still has more than his opponent. Is bleeding out a lot of stalkers. That is true. It's also going ham in the main. Stats getting ready for a backstab. Ah, this is not a fight that Stats really wants to take, but he's coming in from behind of the surround. <laughs> The surround has arrived. We collapse on Jeshi. And it looks like he will be cleaned up. He just doesn't have enough left. Takes down the prison, but it's not enough. GG gets called, and Stats will take game number one. GG. GG, well played. Whew, a solid game there. Out of both players, actually, it was very back and forth. But Stats does barely take game number one in general stats he was a little more active he was very in the face of his opponent um constantly going for zealot drops and zealot run buys as well warp ins big pushes and big counter attacks and even though jeshi was holding on like he was slowly losing a little bit too much until eventually he was broken eventually he started dropping bases and that's when stats was finally able to gain some momentum until that point though until the end jeshi was keeping up is what i will say I do think both these players are pretty comparable in skill at the moment. And I would not be surprised if this goes to the ace match. Would not be surprised. But here we go. We're getting into game number two. I'm catching up in the chat. First time was right. A Kybrit. Ah, there you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Not Kybrit. For some reason, I was thinking of, like, Kybrit crystals. Uh, but Kybrit. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Thank you. Always, always. Love you too, Bap. Yeah. Bap. Hi, Bap. <laughs> Can we petition for lights to switch name to... S Swato? Oh, Swato? Oh, God. Light in Polish. You're an animal. You're an animal. Right, but here we go. We're getting into game number two and spawning in the top left-hand corner of 
Oceanborn. We have our Chinese Protoss player, the purple Protoss representing Dragon Kai Z Gaming down in the series. Looking to bounce back. Let's see if he can. It is Jeshi. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have as a we have the South Korean Protoss player, the red Protoss representing himself, currently teamless but leading the series one to zero. It is stats. Here we go. And again, that was a pretty intense uh, game there between Jeshi and Stats, especially in the early to mid game. It was a very back and forth, just constant, the constant push and pull between uh, Stats and Jeshi. Eventually, things settled down, and it did turn into a game where Stats, even though he was behind in the economy, he was just constantly going for this harassment. Zella run by, Zella drops, the Stalker pushes on the right hand side, and he did pull Jeshi apart. Again, Stats was in the driver's seat. But we'll see how things differ here as we get into game two. We'll see if Jeshi will try to be a little bit more assertive and aggressive. We'll see if he becomes more greedy here. What tech are we going to go for? How do we spice things up? I'm here for it. I'm ready for it. For now, we do see our two gate opener from both players. Likewise, we have our second pylon in the main base for stats, second pylon in the main base for Jeshi, so there's no proxy, and both players are fully aware. Both players are aware that there's nothing amiss, nothing awry. And we should be getting into our game. Our first units of choice from Jeshi is gonna be double stalker. We do have a stalker sentry out of stats instead. This is a much safer way to open up. For those that are curious, this opener is gonna be buffed in the next patch. Um, as the sentry is going to get uh, a little bit more DPS and more shields as well in PvP. It's going to become beefier and more effective in general. So we do love to see it. But uh, this is a very safe opener because even though stats, what he lacks here is DPS. You know, he doesn't have as much firepower as Jeshi has, but he does have some scouting information. Again, the hallucination scout should soon be moving out across the map to get a read on what exactly the opposing Protoss is up to. Again, scouting is paramount in PvP because there are so many different builds, so many different tech switches and tech structures, and you can really spice things up. And I have to get rid of the tuna. I have to get rid of the tuna after this. I'll, I'll try to remember. As the hallucination scout is moving out, and we will be getting eyes on our opener. So far, it is going to be a faster nexus. Going to be the nexus here from his opponent's stats. He will confirm. Natural base has been taken. No early tech. No early aggression. But here come the Stalkers. Again, we do have our shield battery finishing up just in time. Again, it was very necessary here for Stats to throw down that shield battery earlier because he does know he's down in Stalkers. So, does make up for it. Does defend. Does hold him to the natural. Behind this, Twilight Councils are on the way. Twilight Councils are on the way. That's going to be for Blink. From both players so it should be blink stalkers from jeshi and blink stalkers from stats you can see jeshi just fanning out his units he knows he has map control because he has a stalker lead so he's free to just fan out his units and try to get a read on any kind of hidden tech that stats could be working with meanwhile here comes another hallucination scout again this is the power of the century opener the non-stop or the constant hallucination scouts to try to get a read on the tech, and we can confirm it's not a Stargate, it's not a Robo, it is a Twilight Council. So, Stats just confirms that it's going to be the same build, but he doesn't see the third. Jeshi going for a very fast third base, Stats going to be a little bit behind him, but not by too long. There we go. A couple of seconds behind in that third base timing. Meanwhile, Jeshi coming in with his own with his own hallucination is going to confirm the third the third base and the Twilight Council as well. So very similar to the last game in the sense that both Jeshi and Stats are mirroring each other. No big deviations. I guess if you remember, Jeshi's opener last game was a Robo opener into Immortals. If you remember that, so there was a variation in game one, but here in game two, it's basically mirrored builds. There are. There are a couple of deviations, like slight variances here and there when it comes to the timings of certain things, like the slightly faster third base for Jeshi or the sentry opener of stats, but all roads lead to Rome in the sense that both players are headed in the same direction. The end points, the, the goal, 
is the same destination. The destination is the same for both players. Here we go. We do end up catching the hallucination. Good pick up. Stats moving out on the right hand side. There is a shield battery and an overcharge. Again, Stats trying to force the issue here. Ideally trying to force the overcharge as well. And at the same time, distracts the main army of Death's Age into the natural. Ooh, this is a lot of damage. Four or five probes going to be going down. Again, Jeshi was distracted. We're going to get a six and a seventh. No shot. We get a seventh probe as well. Stats, he backs off with the main army. He's content with the damage he's dealt. Seven workers go down for two adepts. That is an insane amount of damage dealt already. And Stats, he's able to take a worker lead. Remember, he had a later third base, so Jeshi had the worker advantage, but not anymore. Not anymore. As from here, we're going to be backing off. We're getting into charge. Both players are into plus one. Gateway explosions on the way. Stats is the first to take his fourth. Jeshi going to be slightly behind Stats in that, in that fourth bait timing. Is now on the way. And Jeshi, I did notice that he did go for a faster war prism. He did sneak out with that faster war prism, so he has potential for a backstab. Prism is now on the way for stats. I believe this is for the main push. Yeah, you can see it's rallied to the main army, so we're going to be moving out with plus one. With this prism. And Jeshi getting ready for his other counter attack. Stats going to be maneuvering with his army. Consolidating his forces, bringing everything together, and we are pushing. Now, on the one hand, a Zealot run by could do a lot of damage here. It could do a lot of damage to Stats, but at the same time, Stats has a hefty army. He does have the supply lead, and even if he loses a mineral line, or even if he loses a base, the main army may just win the game. As Stats, he's up, what, 20 army supply. Moving out with mass Zealot. And even though he's down in Stalkers, the Zealots, they make up for it. Zealots, they do amazingly when it comes to just tanking for the army of stats. He has numbers on his side. He chases down these stalkers, gets one, gets two. At the same time, Prism gets into the main base. Big warp into the main of stats. And again, stats, he doesn't carry. Keeps on pushing, takes down the shield battery. Overcharge runs out. In the main base, Zealots are wreaking havoc. They're getting a lot of damage done in the main of stats. But he's collapsing on the main army. That's the problem here is that Jeshi is losing his main force. Uh, desperately blinking back. Trying to warp in. Trying to reinforce. Can Jeshi hold? Can he hold on? A shield battery is a bought some time. And Jeshi has the Zella lead. Yeah, he is holding. Did lose 21 probes. But Jeshi will clean this up. At the same time across the map. Also being cleaned up though. And as the dust does settle. Even with stats falling back, he still has the army lead. He has the worker lead because he killed 22 probes. I'm a little bit shocked, but that's how Jeshi was able to hold on. He was he had to pull the boys, lost a lot of workers. And Jeshi's in a rough position here. I would have assumed that the Zealot warping into the main would have dealt more damage, but it didn't. Again, only eight probes died. Somehow stats he minimizes losses in the main. We're pushing. We're going for another big push. Zella drop across the map. He's going to be distracting Jeshi. Main army pushing forward. And we do force the overcharge. Shield battery going to be focused down. Does fall. At the same time, uh, once again, a big Zella warping into the main base. They're getting stuck on some of the production buildings. So not the most ideal harass here, but we're breaking through nonetheless. The Immortal has arrived. Jeshi is holding on. He's holding on. Force the warp. It's forced to recall. But that's a lot of zealots. And this recall, it was not in. No, they recall into their deaths. The stalkers go down. The Immortal as well. A big loss there for Jeshi. And it looks like Stats, he has done it. He's broken his opponent. GG gets called. And Stats will take the series 2 to 0. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Stats for taking the series. My condolences to Jeshi as he is knocked out of the tournament. 
but that was a pretty close series. Game two was more in favor of Stats. Stats was more in control, but game one was very back and forth. It was very back and forth and very hard to call as well. At times, Jesse was ahead. At other times, Stats was ahead. Game one was very dynamic, but in the end, Stats does make it through. GG, well played. Stats will advance on into the next round. And the question becomes, who does he face off against next? Who is waiting for stats in the next round? We have an answer. We do have an answer. Exclamation mark B in the chat. If you guys want to have a look at the bracket yourselves. Let's have a look together. Let us have a gander here. At the... Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Un momento. Bam. There we go. As I should get rid of this frame. And from the top here... We have Dark. Dark, he got the walkover in the first round. He got seated right in the round of 16. And Dark was waiting for the winner of this series. It is going to be Dark versus Stats up next. Let's go. <laughs> Let us go. As I'm going to quickly set that up. And get things going. So Dark vs. Stats is going to be up next here on the channel. Meanwhile, scrolling down a little bit further, we have other series going on. We have Bunny vs. Bonobo, uh, the Polish player. I'm not familiar with him, but uh, I do see uh, Bunny up against Bonobo. Meanwhile, we have Hero vs. Uh, Nachmintag, and Bunny vs. Hero is poised to happen. I don't know what it is. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not crazy, but I feel like Bunny vs. Hero has been happening like three weeks in a row. <laughs> Unironically, in ESL Asia, like it's been very, a very common matchup. Very common Bunny vs. Hero. They just keep facing off time and time again. I guess seeding-wise, they're, they're just destined to face off. Likewise, Dark vs. Stats has also been happening relatively frequently as of late. And Dark vs. Hero in the quarterfinals, I mean... That's like a weekly event that does occur. So, uh, yeah, we'll see if anyone can stop the Dark vs. Hero quarterfinals match. I want to believe that either Bunny or Stats can stop them. But, uh, yeah, they're all kind of like... This is a pretty intense portion of the bracket that we're going to be focusing on. Scrolling down a little bit further, we have Bjorn waiting for the winner of Fork and Firefly. Fork, he's an amateur uh, up-and-coming Korean player. And Firefly is going to be favored there. So, Firefly vs. Versus B versus Bjorn is going to be a lot of fun. We have seen Firefly take it to Beyond in the past, so we'll see if he can do it again. We shall see. Uh, meanwhile, I'm just quickly setting things up. Make sure things are okay. Scrolling down. Uh, we do have Solar. Solar waiting in the round of 16 for Nightmare Lemon. Lemon has been looking impressive recently. He's a Taiwanese Protoss player. But Nightmare is going to be favored there. And the Nightmare versus Solar rematch, I look forward to it. Do look forward to it, Nightmare. I mean, Solar is the favored player. But Nightmare has been able to take maps and series from time to time against Solar. So, going to be a very spicy matchup. Scrolling down a little bit further, we have Gumiho waiting for the winner of Lunacy and DRG. Bit of a PVZ going on there when it goes up against Gumiho. Scrolling down, we have Creator versus Balance into Classic. Creator and Classic have been playing a lot as well. This PvP has not been uncommon, so once again, Creator and Classic going to be duking it out in the early rounds of ESL Asia. We have Oliveira up against uh, Plazam. We have Faint versus Shin. Faint is another amateur Korean player. I think he's a Zerg player. Wish him the best. Shin versus Oliveira is going to be an amazing ZVT. That's that's going to be so good here in the round 16. Meanwhile, we have Coffee versus Rex in another TVZ. Winner goes up against Cure as well. So honestly, a really, really stacked bracket. And that's how things are typically here at ESL Asia. It's the most stacked weekly here between Asia, Americas, and Europe. Asia always has, maybe not the numbers, it doesn't have the quantity, but it has the quality. The quality of play here early on is brutal, and it's crazy thinking that Dark and Hero are poised to face off in the quarterfinals. We have Shin versus Oliveira in the round of 16. You know, we have uh, DRG, Lunacy, Gumiho facing off in the round 16 as well. Solar versus Nightmare. Like, these big names are already facing off this early in the tournament. It's, uh, it's pretty insane. 
pretty insane. And I'm a little bit jealous because well, I'm a little bit heartbroken because I want to castle everything. <laughs> like I mentioned before, Oliver vs. Shin looks really damn good. Uh, I'm a bit of a coffee fan, so seeing coffee or even Rex against Cure would be a lot of fun as well. Classic vs. Creator. Korean PvP is typically very short and very sweet and very high octane. So the aggressive, the aggressive nature of Classic and Creator kind of clashing there is going to make for an intense PvP. Solar versus Nightmare. Again, I, I do want to see if Nightmare can bounce back and face off against Solar again and bring him down. It's still the underdog there, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And you all know that I'm a Firefly fan. You, you, all, you know it. <laughs> I'm a Firefly fan. fan. Seeing him against Bion is going to be amazing as well. So I wish everyone the best of luck. And I hope that you're able to tune into some of these other matches as well. I know that some of the English coverage this week is a little bit light. Um... Wardy isn't here. Uh, maybe there's something up. Maybe there's uh, maybe they're going on a bit of a break. But um, Wardy uh, isn't here, and Chicken Man hasn't been casting ESL Asia for quite some time. It's been a couple of weeks or a couple of months, so uh, has been busy with IRL commitments, I imagine. So unfortunately, we don't get a lot of English coverage this week. It is a shame, um, but you know, hopefully. Uh, some of the other language streams are able to cover some other matches. You know, we have Coca casting in French. We have Into the Inu casting in Korean. We have, I believe, a Russian caster as well. So, yeah, we do have some other coverage in other languages at least. As we are getting ready here. And I, this just in, if you want to tune into Bunny vs. Hero, it's about to start on Inu's channel. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, into the Inu is casting Bunny vs. Hero in Korean. But let's head on over. Vitos are done. And we are diving into our next game. Uh, just making sure we have everyone here. There we go. We have all of our casters. Dark versus stats is about to be upon us. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Papi. <laughs> Someone in the chat just reminded me to uh, remove the Tuna Cup logo, and I completely forgot, I'll be honest. <laughs> I completely forgot. So thank you for the reminder. It has been removed, and we should be good to go. Should be good. Scrolling down. Refresh the backup. Up. Oh, were there updates? Oh, my apologies. Oh, I should have refreshed. Uh, when it comes to... Okay, okay, okay. Nothing too crazy. <laughs> I did refresh, and um, yeah, we have Bunny versus Hero currently uh, starting up. We have Beyond versus Firefly, Nightmare versus Solar, and Creator versus Classic alongside Oliver and Shin. So, you know, the matches that we expected to occur in the round of 16 are upon us. They are underway. As it uh, looks like the round of 32 is wrapping up. Is wrapping up. On ladder in diamond, I get a lot of uh, void ray carrier sky toss and ZVP, but I never see it in pro play. Is there a reason why? Um, void ray openers are very out of meta, if that's what you're referring to. Sky toss isn't like sky toss is still a thing in pro play. Uh, in ZVP in the late game, um, but getting there is typically done in a different fashion. Uh, Void Ray openers are very, like, 2022. Like, it's been a couple of years, um, but, yeah, since then we have had some more varying openers. Void Ray openers are just very out of fashion. They can be punished a lot easier nowadays as well, um, but we can get into that so once we get into this matchup. Ah, there you go. You know, it's, it all comes together here as spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Oceanborn, we have our South Korean zerg player the red zerg representing talon esports it is dark and spawning in the top left hand corner we have as opponent we have the south korean protoss player the blue protoss representing himself 
but he just took down Jeshi. Two to zero, it is stats. For those of you that remember the a couple of patches ago, the Void Raver was actually nerfed. Um, Void Raver was nerfed, and kind of in that period with the change to the Void Ray and the change to the Stargate, um, was also the period of like hero rising to power and really um, having this Oracle opener come to prominence. Just triple Oracle opener into a third base into Blink Stalker play. So the meta shifted away from Void Ray openers, which, which used to be very meta back in the day, a couple of years ago, um, into Oracle and Stalker play instead. Again, that did occur. Um, Void Ray openers, they did make a bit of a resurgence a couple of, uh, a couple of months ago. When I say a couple of months ago, I'm talking like November, December of last year. Um, if you're familiar with Classic, Classic was very fond with Void Ray openers. Specifically though, it's not Sky Toss. Uh, a Void Ray opener is for a Void Ray first leading into hidden tech afterwards after you kill the Overlord. So a single Void Ray, and then you can go into Glaive Adepts, you can go into a Charge All-In, you can go double Stargate into Carrier, like a Carrier Rush. There is a lot available there. Like, massing Void Rays early on, it's just really immobile, it's quite expensive, it doesn't really give you much map control, it's very all-in, and players have just gotten a lot better at scouting and punishing it in general here. It's, it's almost never seen. It's basically never seen nowadays. Regardless, with that, we're getting into our openers. It is going to be a hatch gas pull into a third base. Uh, was a standard opener out of dark, likewise, a standard opener out of stats as well. Do you love to see it? Yo, does anyone remember like the Void Ray, uh, the Void Ray committed play where they would just open up like three Void Ray, they'd come in, they'd snipe your spawning pool? <laughs> like back then, a couple of years ago, like this spawning pool placement is like is brutal it, you would never see it because this this spawning pool placement would be exposed to void rays and it would get sniped so zerg players they got they became accustomed to hiding their spawning pool behind the mineral line just because of how prevalent uh mass void ray was early on so uh yeah those th those were dark times those were very dark times <laughs> aye, aye, aye. As Adepts are going to be threading the shade, it is a Stargate opener out of stats going into Oracles. We don't really expect much deviation here from stats in this series. Um, he's very fond of Stargate openers into his fast third. Nexus is on the way. Oracle going to be dipping in. And we do manage to get a couple of drones here at the natural. We do get two worker kills. Not too bad here. Stats, he does keep the Oracle alive at least. Dials keep alive, can regenerate those shields. Meanwhile, ooh, that is a very fast Roach Warren out of Dark. Okay, so this is a four-minute Roach Warren. And Dark, he knows it's a Stargate opener, of course, by seeing the Oracle. Um, with a four-minute Roach Warren, this should be leading towards a very early Roach push. We do see additional gases being taken. Queens are amassing. We are on Oceanborn. Specifically, the reason why we see a lot of Roach and Queen-based all-ins on this map on Oceanborn is because of the third base. I don't know if you realize this, but on other maps, the third will usually have a point of elevation. Uh, for example, a map like Hecate has that, where you do have a ramp leading into the third. Here, the ramp leading into the third is in the center of the map. So you can get onto the same point of elevation as the third base really early on, which means Queen Walks are ideal. Queen Walks, Roach all ins, all ins in general can hit very hard here on Oceanborn. Shorter rush distance by ground as well. And the Queens, they are coming. Dark is all in. He's spotted. He knows. Stats knows what's going on, but a late reaction. Uh, shield battery just now starts up. He does cancel in the main base, his production build, his tech building. Going down a second shield battery, a third shield battery as well. But again, is this too late? It still takes a little bit for the Queens to get across the map, but again, they're already here. And we're ready to lay siege upon that third. Again, no point of elevation here, no high ground advantage that you otherwise would have on other maps. Ravagers are amassing. Lings are here. Shield batteries. It looks like they're going to finish up just in time. We're barely finishing up the shield batteries. We do have our oracles amassing as well. No stasis traps. There we go. The army has arrived. Bile's going to be thrown down. The first cannons are finishing up as well. Can we hold on? So far, so good. We get a queen. 
Queen goes down. Second Queen falls as well. Good pickoffs. Good pickoffs so far, but we're waiting out the overcharge. Overcharge now runs out, and now we can dive in. Without the overcharge, the cannons are falling. We're running out of links. We're running out of links, and Stats, he's getting on top of the Ravagers. He's a big pickoffs. He's holding. He is holding on right now. Queens are falling left and right. The Ling reinforcements, they may be a little bit too late. As we focus on almost every single queen. We have one queen left. Lings are doing a lot of damage here. They do, uh, they do provide a great buffer for the Ravagers, but good target firing out of stats. Gets another Ravager. He's being forced further back, but Dark, he's running out of steam. He's running out of units. We're down to two Ravagers and one queen. That's all we have left. It's not enough. And stats he holds. I was concerned he didn't scout in time. I was concerned that, hey, seeing the army moving out would be too late. But no, he had a really good reaction. Again, did not underprepare. Three shield batteries, two extra cannons. Did cancel his Twilight Council to defend as well, to just warp in extra units. Dark, though, he does end up catching the army. There's no blink. Uh oh. There is no blink. We catch the Stalkers. Big pick up here. Stalkers are going to be going down. A very efficient trade by Dark. And that does help make up for that failed all in. But now Dark is droning. Dark, he's droning up back at home. Now we just start the lair. Very late lair. 7 minute 30 lair timing. Ay, ay, ay. Ay. And Dark is behind. He's in a rough place. Killing all those Stalkers helped. But tech-wise, upgrade-wise, he's on 0, 0 Again, no lair. He's on 51 drones against 64 probes. Stats is getting a fourth base. Dark stuck on, stuck on three. And I worry. I worry here for Dark. That he's going to be reinforcing. Does clean up all this creep. Again, very limited, very limited creep here available for Dark. He's trying to build up his defenses. Has rebuilt a lot of those queens. But the reality is that Stats doesn't have to push in. So the win condition for Stats is deny the fourth. If he can contain Dark to three bases, Stats can freely take his fourth base and be the first to max out. And just max out and out macro Dark. Dark does sneak out with a couple of links. He's going to force a defensive warping back at home, potentially. Shouldn't force more than that. Will we pick up a queen? Queen does fall. Yeah, the soul, because they do defend back at home. And yeah, there it is. GG gets called. The writing is on the wall. Dark, he cannot expand. And stats, he takes game number one. GG. GG, well played. A solid game there out of stats. Able to scout the all-in in the center of the map and was able to prepare, prepare in time. Again, with the shield batteries, with the cannons. I was concerned that it was a bit of an overreaction for stats to cancel his Twilight Council, um, which meant that Blink was delayed as well. But despite that, it did mean that he could afford extra warp ins. And with that stats, he's one game away from eliminating Dark from the tournament. One game away. Meanwhile, Dark, the pressure is on. He has to fight back here and now to force the ace match. Again, Dark, he is a favorite to at least make it on to face off against would-be hero in the next round. But And Dark, he is the best Zerg player in all of South Korea. But he has to respect that. You know, the all-in failed. And I doubt we're going to be seeing another all-in in this series. Like, Dark, he wanted to end it early on. But Stats, he's like, mate, you're trying to cheese me out? Nah, play macro, Poppy. Poppy, you know, show me your best. Not your worst. Show us what you're made of. And here he is, spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Site Delta. Down in this series, the best Zerg player... Oh, I forgot. The best Zerg player in South Korea. The Red Zerg, we do have representing Talon Esports. It is Dark. Just letting Inu know... And spawning in the top left-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the South Korean Protoss player leading the series 1-0, to zero, surviving the all-in, defending and asserting himself in game one, proving us, proving to us all, mate, Dark, you can't just all-in stats. you got to take it to at least the mid-game. you got to play a straight-up game here against him. He is the Shield of Ire. He is stats.
Let's go. It's indeed been a while since the last Wardy stream. I hope everything is well with him. I know he was traveling abroad, right? Like he, um, I think he went to Disneyland. He was in America for a while. He may just be taking a break. Uh, maybe he got, I don't know if, um, you know, maybe he got a little bit unwell from the trip, but I'm sure he'll be back alongside many of the other streamers out there or casters. As for now, stats going for a gate expand, a standard opener out of our Protoss player. Dark, likewise, going for a hatch gas pool. Standard opener as well. Uh, no early gases, no early aggression. Nothing too spicy early on. Now, that advantage that we spoke about it when it comes to Oceanborn, how you can get onto the same kind of like point of elevation as the natural and the third base in the center of the map, that isn't quite applicable here. Site Delta is one of the few maps that has a ramp leading into the natural, so it's a much more defendable base here, at least at the natural. The third is a bit more exposed, but we do have a much more narrow choke point here at both third base locations, whereas on Oceanborn, it's Oceanborn is a lot more wide open, a lot more exposed. So all ins are less applicable or less popular here on Site Delta. Not saying that you can't do it, but uh, the map is working against you a little bit more. So it is a little bit harder to pull off. So most likely we're going to be seeing Dark macker up, get into three bases, and get into the mid game. Meanwhile, we do have a st uh, Stargate on the way. It's going to be a Stargate opener here by stats. I'm going to be into Oracles, just like the last game. And this time this should lead into a third base, into three base saturation, and into a more back and forth. I imagine. See in the chat. I'm pleasantly surprised to see how well Stats is doing. Yeah, definitely, right? Like, um, I mentioned in the previous series, but maybe if you weren't here for it, uh, at least in my opinion, Stats has been improving over the past couple of months. Um, it did feel like he was a little bit stagnant uh, around, like, November, December. But post Katowice, maybe because he was motivated by IEM Katowice, uh, Stats has been improving, 100%. He's been getting better and better over the past, like, month, two months even. So it's been really cool to see stats improve. I would still not say he's a favorite player here, but he has been getting better. And it's really cool to see as a stats fan. Really cool to see. We'll see how far he can go. As Ling's a do catch out the adepts. One adept. Ooh, the second adept should be going down as well as we shade into the main. Oracle does dive in. We're going to get two drone kills, but that's a lot of hits on the Oracle. Bit of miscontrol there. Almost going for another drone. And a lot of hole damage is dealt at the same time because the deaths went down that can trigger a counter attack and Dark threatens the third base. Thankfully, Stats stays at home with that Oracle. But Dark is coming back in. And he's waiting for the Oracle to run out of energy. And it does. It's out of energy. Dark can still threaten that third base. But we do warp in another wave of adepts. Just in time. Dark is coming in, but Stats is in position. Now, just to briefly talk about this dynamic, because Stats lost the first two Adepts um, very prematurely, that triggered the counterattack. That's why Dark has been here. That's why he's been harassing and applying pressure to the third. But Stats holds. Does hold for now. Dark still trying to find some damage, though. Is reinforcing. And thankfully, because Stats stuck around a little bit longer with these Oracles, he does defend. Forces his back. Adepts take him into the Shade. We do pick off a good chunk of lings. Behind this, Twilight Council and Forge is on the way. Stats working towards plus one, and I imagine Blink. I say I imagine Blink because this could also be Charge. One or the other. Blink is more standard. Lings are going to be collapsing on these units. They don't quite get us around. So far, good trades out of stats. Doesn't quite commit. Behind this, Dark, he's getting saturated on three bases, getting his fourth up and running. Plus one melee is on the way. But now going for a Ling Heavy style. We should see a Roach Warren by now. And there it is. Roach Warren has been thrown down by Dark. So he's going into Ling Roach. Or Ling Bane Roach at least. Once again with the abundance of Lings. He does try to get us around. Triggers the Oracles. Does trigger the Pulsar Beam. Leading out Lings. So far really efficient trades out of stats. I mean look at this. We've lost 2 Adepts and 2 Probes for 21 Lings so far. 
Good trades. Once again, we come in for this round. The Oracles are out of energy. The Oracles are out, but we do shade away. So again, an efficient trade here from Stats. Behind this, it is Blink, as we did mention. Again, a much more standard transition, plus one and Blink. We have a bit of a gateway explosion, but not much. And we're headed in towards a Templar Archives. This is going to be for Archon production, potentially even Storm. It is a little bit risky going for Storm instead of Colossus, so we'll see which one we go for. For now, at least Archons are going to be available. Meanwhile, Dark back at home, going to be droning up. Still getting up to three base saturation, but he's droning up further than that. Getting up to four bases. And I was waiting for his tech of choice. So far, it's been Lings and the Roach Warren, but he didn't start Roach Speed. Spire. It is going to be the Spire. It is going to be Mutas instead. So we're, we have the safety Roach Warren, but we're not really investing into Roaches. We're holding back. We're preserving our gas in favor of Mutas. Risky move here. We've seen this before. Basically, if this Spire goes unscouted, Dark, he can pop off. He can do so much. He can gain so much value and wreak so much havoc with Mass Muta. It's going to be on Stats' scout. Now, Stats, he does have these three oracles. He needs to be active. He needs to be active when it comes to not just killing workers, but scouting his opponent, trying to get a read on whether it's a Spire. Maybe it's a Hydrogen. Maybe it's an Infestation bit for fast Hive Tech, for Ultras. It could be anything. Stats needs to figure it out. But now he doesn't. And the Spire is about to finish. You have a big Ling Roach run by or yeah, counterattack here towards the center. Not the most committed push. Remember, we don't even have Roach speed. Oracles are getting into the main. We get the Revelation at the fourth. We get eyes on the lack of saturation, at least at the fourth base. Dark is droning. Ling run by comes in. We do get a Revelation in the main. We're headed towards the natural. 13 meters are on the way. And we miss the Spire. Revelation barely does not see it. The enemy has discovered As I say that, yeah, the oracles are being focused down. We are making a safety phoenix, thankfully. It looks like we've seen a lot, and we haven't seen much. I mean, that tells us something, in a sense, that stats, he sees all the tech, he sees the gases, did not spot any hydrogen or infestation pit. He's reading that it could be a spire, is making that call. And phoenixes are amassing. Yeah, Mutas are popping out. They're now revealed. They're on the way. Now Stats knows. And we're throwing down cannons. We're throwing down shield batteries. Mutas are headed for the natural, but we are in position. We are ready for it. Yeah, plenty of stalkers. We dive on top of those Mutas. They're not really getting much damage done. They're not getting much done. We force a second shield. Sorry, a second Stargate and a Fleet Beacon as well. Now, the thing is that Stats didn't know how many Mutas there were. And we do get six, seven probe kills. We do get away. Looking at the units last time, that was seven probes for three Mutas. Pretty good trade so far by Dark. And he's committing. Plus one air attack. Again, we're just completely skipping Roach Speed. It's just pure Ling Muta. And now that Stats saw the, the size of the Muta flock, now we're getting to the second Stargate. Uh, we're going to deny plus one. We're trying to. Plus one, it's so low, and it's going to be shut down. We deny plus one air attack. Ling's threatening a dive as well. The wall is sold. We force the overcharge. We dive on top of the Phoenixes. We got one. One Phoenix goes down. Shield battery gets targeted as well. And Dark, he might just have too much. He's going to overwhelm this army. Yeah, Ling's are flooding on forward. We get, they get on top of the Stalkers. We needed the Archons. Storm is done, but we needed the Archons. We needed the Storm. It might be a little bit too late as we break into the main. Again, we're just a, a little bit too far behind. GG gets called and Dark overwhelms that and takes game number two. GG. GG, well played. Again, stats, he did accurately kind of determine, like he deduced that it was going to be a Spire. He was ready for Mutas, but he wasn't ready for committed Mutas the way that Dark went for it. He just made mass Muta, was able to break through. Um, honestly, I do think that Stats could have held in a head-on engagement, in a head-to-head -head fight, if only Stats had his Archons and High Templar. Remember, he kept his Archons and High Templar at his fourth. He had them at his fresh mining base, which is why it took them so long to rotate over once he realized that Dark was committing to his push at the natural. So the Archons and the High Templar, they were late. Essentially, they were late to the party. 
if they were there a little bit sooner, if they were there to begin with, then the storms would have shut down the Ling Muta. Ling Muta is so fragile, it's so vulnerable. Storms would have been amazing there, but Stash just didn't have the opportunity to really make use of that. Unfortunately, GG. GG, well played. We're going to the ace match. We're going to game number three. Let's go. Oh, they're talking about the list. <laughs> uh, I'll say what's been said about the GOAT list. Uh, you're talking about the TL Meisenhower GOAT list. Um, you know, it's just, it's just you know, a very subject subjective, opinionate, opinionated list. I have my own thoughts about it. Um, I don't really pay it too, mi too much mind. Um, it's not like official by any means or anything like that. It's just some guy's opinion. And I mean, you know, he's... You can have it, right? Everyone has their biases. Everyone has their favorite players and stuff like that. It's, you know, it's he, he does have a bigger platform to voice that opinion. And maybe that's that's why people are like, yo, TL is saying this. It's like, ah, kind of, not really. <laughs> yeah. You know what you, you know what you can do? We, we can make our own tier list. We can make our own tier list. It's all good. It's all good. Don't have to get too upset about it. Even though I, I don't agree with it. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't agree with that tier list, but it's, it's fine. It's fine. Whatever he wants. But here we go. We're getting into game number three. And spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Hardled, we have our South Korean Zerg player. The Red Zerg representing Talon Esports. It is Dark. Tying up the series one to one, forcing the ace match and spawning in the top left-hand corner. We have his opponent. We have the South Korean Protoss player. The blue Protoss. Representing himself, currently teamless, being forced into the ace match. It is Stats. Here we go. So we are settling in. And again, we're going to be spawning into Hard Lead. Hard Lead, the shortest rush distance map in the map pool. It is a very aggressive uh, aggressive map in general. The rush distance by ground is disgustingly short. And because of that, all ins are possible. In saying that, I don't want to harp too much on that because, as we saw in game one, even if the map is working in your favor, even if it's a late scout and a late realization of what's happening, Stats is still the shield of ire, and he's, his defensive play is still on point, so Dark embracing an all-in here in the ace match, I feel like, especially after game one, probably isn't going to happen. Most likely will not occur here. I, I know that Dark is unpredictable that that is true i know that he's a very chaotic player true true but i'll i'll say that at least that we most likely won't see an all in here we shouldn't i should say we'll see we'll see but now stargate opener it's gonna be another stargate opener here from stats there's gonna be a stargate opener here from stats uh should be for oracles initially should be for oracles. Should be for oracles into a third base. Likewise, Dark getting into his own three base setup as well. Everything looking as it should. Everything looking as it should here. As Stats is going to be backing up, getting into his oracle production. What I will say is that Stats wasn't able to accomplish too much harassment with his oracles and adepts in the last game. Was able to pick up a couple of drones here and there, but nothing too major. Again, Dark, known for his queen defense. Is what he does excel in. And that queen defense is going to be put to the test once again. Adept threatening a shade. Overlord being forced back. Uh, Stats investing in... Oh, sorry, Dark investing into additional links just to be safe against the Adept. The first oracle has arrived. Does reveal itself here to Dark. First oracle moves out. Likewise, Dark fanning out his lings, hoping to delay the third base. But this time, Stats has kept both adepts alive. But did I speak too soon? The lings, they dive on top of the probe, and they will get a kill. They do delay the third base at least by a couple of seconds. Not a bad pick off there by Dark. Oracle moving out across the map. As 
so do see stats just rotating around with said oracles. Again, still just sharking around looking for damage. Likewise, stats are poised for a counter attack here at the third. We'll see how this dynamic plays out. So far, Oracle's a dive into the natural. Spore finishes up just in time. We get one, we get two, we get three. Four drone kills here at the natural, but the, the queen comes in from behind. We get a kill on the Oracle. Not so worth it for stats. Trading one Oracle for five drones. It's an okay amount of damage, but Oracles, they have so much utility here in PvZ. Losing one early on is huge. Meanwhile, Lings, they try to go for a run by. The Adepts, they do hold strong. Two Adepts get surrounded, but we will defend the third. We will hold on to that third base. Stats down to two Oracles, not replacing the one he just lost. And it is going to be a Lair first here from Dark. Lair into Evo Chambers. Interesting. Into double Evo Chamber. Uh, I'm curious. Stays the trap into the main base. Dark, he does react in time. Dravid Epps threatening a shade towards the natural. We don't commit. Again, so far, Dark defending well for himself. But going double Evo Chamber, I'm curious if this is going to be for 1-1. One, one. I'm curious if this is intentional. Uh, we can <laughs> I, was, I was very perplexed. We cancel the Evo Chamber. I think that was supposed to be the Roach Warren. Because the Roach Warren should be on the way right now. Lined up with the Lair. Oh, boy. The gases are being taken. Lair is going to finish. We're not going Roaches. This could be Ling Hydra. I guess we could go for a Spire as well. But I'm leaning towards Hydras here in game number three. Behind this, Stats taking it in an interesting direction as well. As we wait for Dark to throw down his tech of choice. And there it is. It is going to be Ling Hydra, as we did mention, with all those gases. We do see Stats skipping his tech. Or sk skipping his upgrade. Twilight Council has been done for a while now. No blink, no charge. Instead, we're going into faster Temple Archives and a faster Robo. This should be for a faster Robotics Bay. Like, if we're if we're skipping our upgrade in such a fashion, we're, we're most likely using it to invest elsewhere. Oh, we forgot it. Blink is now on the way. <laughs> Blink is now on the way. A very late Blink here from Stats, but I'm curious if we're going to make use of this Robo and if we're going to throw down a Bay a little bit faster instead. I am curious. Otherwise, he may have just forgotten that Blink. I'm curious and I'm concerned. Oracle's going to be zoned away. Dark joining up to 80. Joining up very nicely here. And we're not going for Colossi, we're going for Storm. Now, based on the resources that, that have been banking up here, um, I don't think it was intentional here that we forgot Blink. Um, I think that was a bit of a slip up there by Stats, and because of that, he can't be active. Because of this, Stats is stuck at home. He's stuck defending back at home here with the minimal amount of units. Dark knocking down these rocks, droning up happily here up to 80, getting into Lurker production as well. Rushing into Hydra Lurker. We catch a couple units here in the center. Adepts and Stalkers go down. And can we cancel the fourth? We get a surround and we should force a cancel. That's a kill! No! That's a kill, not a cancel. Big loss there for stats. 400 minerals down the drain. And stats, he doesn't even have blink. He can't counterattack. He doesn't have blink. He's just stuck at home. Yeah, he's stuck defending. And uh, Dark, he's free to just take on up. I do like this. Stats, I, I think this could have been a little bit earlier, but recognizing that he's stuck at home, recognizing that he's defending, we have a Stargate and a Fleet Beacon. We're trying to get into Skytos. Carriers are on the horizon, but this tech is late. The production is late. It's going to take a while to really get into Carriers. Until then, Dark has already been free to do whatever he wants, and Dark is about to max out. He's about to max out here with a Lurker tech, with Hydra Lurker Viper. The Hive is about to finish. Then we can get into Lurker Upgrades. Blink is finally done, by the way. He is finally done. Uh, but Dark, he can have his way with this. Should be forcing out a Storm. Okay, one, two Storms are going to be thrown down. We have a couple left. But we're getting on top of those Stalkers. Being forced back. Again, respecting the High Templar. Carriers are now on the way. And Dark, he's remaxing with Pure Ling. Again, baiting our storms. Bearing in mind that we haven't seen a single storm on the Hydras. It's only been on Lings, and we're running out of energy here. I mean, we still have like two, maybe soon to be three storms left. 
But Doc preserving his Hydras. Getting into his Lurker tech. Getting into his Lurker tech. We have a Nidus Storm on the way. I believe Doc has not seen the transition. Yeah, he hasn't seen the, the carrier production whatsoever. Doesn't know what's going on. But I'm not sure if he really cares here as he's busting on through. Laying siege upon that center base, and he is within range of the mineral line. Probes are going down. And we're breaking this base. And two carriers is not going to be enough. We got some decent storms here on the lurkers, but lurkers are a little bit tanky. They can take the storms to the face. Now we're out of storm. Oh, we're out of storm, and just when we needed it the most. There we go. The one storm here on the lings. The carriers have arrived, but the base goes down. That's his fourth has been denied. Zeller run by coming in towards the center. Is going to get some damage done. True. But Dark, he can afford these losses. And he will defend. He will clean up these Zealots. Saving the base. Only losing five drones. Stats desperately trying to retake another base. Trying to reclaim that fourth. But ah, alas... It's going to be a tough ask here. As Stats, sure, he's getting into carriers, but he needs he needs a, a fourth. He needs a, an economy to sustain himself. As Stats, he can't max out. He cannot max out. Not anytime soon. And the Lurkers are slowly encroaching here upon the bases. Spire is now on the way for Corruptors. Queens are pushing forward to support. Hydras are on the way as well. We have 24 Hydras. And Stats, he's in a world of hurt right now. He's going to try to hold on. Does throw down the slow zone. Uh, but the Yoink comes in. We focus down the mothership. Minus 300, minus 300. We get a carrier as well. Now we are still on four carriers. The Hydras are thinning out. Got transfused. And the Lurkers are trying to force the issue. Diving on the army. The Queens are transfused were quite clutch as well, keeping those Hydras alive a little bit longer. Maintaining themselves. More Hydras on the way. You can see the Dark, he isn't maxing out. He's, I think, waiting for the Spire. Squeezing out a couple of Hydras. Lurkers are being focused down. We're getting on top of the Queens, but here come the reinforcements. The Hydras, they made it. Yeah, they're getting the Interceptors. We're running out of Interceptors, running out of DPS here. Yes, yeah, stats. We just cannot contest against this. Hydra Lurker Viper isn't ideal against Sky Toss, but again, we barely had any Sky Toss. Barely had anything left. We yoink in and two more, three more. Every single carrier gets yoinked. Everything gets focused down. And with that Dark, he will be taking this. Was forced to the A smash. Stats he showed that hey, you can't two base all in him. But in these longer games, Dark comes out on top. GG gets called, and Dark takes the series two to one. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Dark. My condolences to Stats. But again, Stats did force an A smash, and he didn't look too bad at all in that first game. Here in game three. It did feel like Stats was making a couple of mistakes there that were capitalized, capitalized on, whether it's losing the first Oracle, whether it's the late Blink. Again, because Blink was late, he was stuck at home. Like Stats, he was barely active on the map. He was stuck at home the entire game. And it did feel like once he realized that Blink was late and that he had no map control, he was forced to try to turtle up and go into Sky Toss after losing the fourth. Like that was brutal. So, uh,. Yeah, it did feel like Skytoss was the only answer for stats in that situation, but it was never the initial plan. It was never the initial goal, goal at least. Just something that stats was forced into because of the game state and because of how things were unfolding. And with that, GG. GG, well played. Dark does take it. And now we're getting ready here for our next series. We're getting ready for our next match. Oh, should. Uh, let's. Our lovely admin know the score. And now we're getting ready for our next series here. 
We spoke about it. Bunny and Hero was ongoing, but Hero, he advances on over Bunny. Takes down Bunny, two to zero, and up next is going to be Dark versus Hero in the best of three quarterfinals match. Let's go. Let us go. As we can just quickly catch up on any other results. Okay, from the top. Uh, Dark vs. Hero here in the quarterfinals. Scrolling down a little bit further. Beyond versus Firefly. Let's go. It went to the ace match. Oh my god, Bappy. Uh, I spoke about it before, but uh, we have seen Firefly take Beyond down before. And this time wasn't able to do so, but did force the ace match. So big shout out to Firefly. Very well done there by Beyond. Able to take the series in the end. And avoid the upset. Speaking of upsets though, Nightmare, he does it again. And this is what I was talking about. We've seen Nightmare take down Solar. He took down Solar in the GSL qualifiers not too long ago. Uh, actually, that was during the GSL that Solar had won. That was last year in November. But uh, yeah, we have seen Nightmare pop up from time to time. Uh, still lacks the, consist the consistency um, or isn't able to consist consistently uh, take Solar down. But this week he pops off, and that is a big result, a big win for Nightmare, eliminating Solar from the tournament, advancing on the face-off against Bion, and this is crazy. Okay, so I try not to harp on this too much, but um, we do we do refer to this from time to time about how Nightmare, his best matchup is PvP, followed very closely by his PvT. Nightmare's worst matchup is Protoss versus Zerg. He struggles the most against Zerg. Nightmare struggles the most against players like Solar, Dark, Shin, all the top Zerg players in Korea. That is usually where Nightmare struggles. But against Terran and Protoss, he can thrive. And uh, Nightmare, I can see him taking... I mean, hey, Bion, he already stumbled against Firefly. Bion is still the favored player here, but Nightmare, he has a good chance. He has a good shot against Bion. Best of luck to both of those players. Scrolling down a little bit further, we have DRG taking down Goo. Bappy, DRG popping off again. DRG, like, he, I feel like he's such a he's such an underrated player. Maybe because, maybe we're a little bit biased because we cast a lot of DRG on this channel. But um, DRG's been looking really impressive as of late. Ever since last year, around October, um, DRG has been getting some really, really good results. We've seen him bring Beyond down. We've seen him here, for example, take down Gumiho. DRG, he's he's been looking really, really on point. Um, it's it's why, like for me at least, it's such a shame that DRG is teamless. Like, there's a good amount of Korean players that are teamless, and I feel like DRG is the one that maybe deserves to be on a team most of all out of all of them. Like, he's been teamless for quite some time now, and he's such a good player. Takes down Gumiho, and now he's up against Creator in the next round. Another big result coming in, Creator, he 2 0s Classic. Um, this, in my mind, was hard to call just because PvP is very chaotic in Korea. Um, so I was expecting an ace match. I was not expecting a 2-0 creator popping off here, bringing Classic down. Now he's up against DRG. This is a hard one to call as well. I do think that DRG and creator are pretty comparable in skill, but creator is very stylistic in PvZ. He's very stylistic. He's very defensive. Um, not the most aggressive player out there. He's very mid-game oriented. Um, or mid to late game oriented, actually, I would say. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting Zerg versus Protoss matchup in the quarterfinals. I wish them both the best of luck as well. Wish them the best. My condolences to Gumiho gets knocked out early on here by DRG. Um, I can only imagine the chaos that ensued here, whether Gumiho was going for, like, Mech, for example, or some kind of weird proxy play. Gumiho is always a lot of fun to watch. Always a lot of good fun. Scoring down. Yo, we went to the ace match. Oliveira and Shin. Oh, my God. I'll be honest. I was kind of favoring Shin here. Shin Zerg versus Terran has been looking insane. If you watch his games at IM Katowice, and even leading up to IM Katowice, Shin has been a beast in the Zerg versus Terran matchup. Like, he took down Clem. He took down Cure. He took down every Terran in his group, except for Bunny, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, Shin, he was popping up at IM. Um, so for so for Oliveira to take the win here is pretty huge. So big win there by Oliveira. Now he's in a TBT against Cure. Very hard to call, I would say. I do think that Cure Cure is uh, I think overall a stronger player, but specifically in the TBT matchup, they're quite close, and that could go either way. So I wish Oliveira and Cure the best of luck there in the quarterfinals. As I think we have purely quarterfinals matches. Yep, there we go. <laughs> Round of sixteen is done. 
And we have purely quarterfinals matches left. Here we go. We're getting into our next one, into the quarterfinals and the semis thereafter. Vamanos. Catching up in the chat. Catching up in the chat. Statue of the Chosen One. Ah. Don't like this. You should be able to chrono boost interceptors. <laughs> that would be broken. Oh, Este Frost, you're an animal, Pop. You're an animal. <laughs> Just catching up. I want a 100 100 upgrade that gives each carrier an extra three to four interceptors. Feels good, man. Oh my god, that would be insane. Especially if they start with that many interceptors. I think, um,. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting proposition <laughs> that I see in the chat. Aye, aye, aye. Interesting. Uh, but here we go. We're getting into our next series. We're getting into the quarterfinals. And sporting in the top right-hand corner of Alkyone, we have our South Korean Protoss player. The best Protoss in South Korea. Arguably the best Protoss in the world right now. Representing Dragon Kaizy Gaming. It is Hero. And spawning. In the bottom left hand, in the bottom left hand corner, we have as opponent we have the South Korean Zerg player representing Talon Esports. Ooh, he just survived stats. Can he take it to Hero? It is dark. Here we go. As we can see here, immediately checking the goal base. Again, on Alkyona, we've seen Dark rush into this gold many, many times, so it makes sense against him to check that gold initially here, as here is going across the map, and it is going to be a hatch gas pool opener out of Dark. Standard opener so far from our Zerg player. Hero back at home, going for his own gate expand setup. So nothing wild so far, but it's important to point out that there's nothing wild going on. As we saw, or as we noted, it is not uncommon for Dark to rush into the gold, so at least Hero does cross that off. The list of possibilities. Now, when it comes to Hero versus Dark, um, they do go back and forth in series. Um, as of late, I believe Hero has the advantage over Dark, but only a slight advantage. Like when I say advantage, I mean like maybe a 60% win rate, um, like around there, around there. But regardless, they do kind of go back and forth, and I'm hoping for an ace match. I'm hoping we get the most out of these two. Another game three would be amazing. Regardless of how it goes. I also just realized that I think Dark, he's the only Zerg player left, right? Like, <laughs> I just realized uh, Solar went down to Nightmare and Shin went down to Oliveira. Um, my apologies. Uh, DRG is still there as well. Don't get me wrong. Sorry, my apologies. So there's Dark and Dong Regu. They are the two remaining Zerg players here. We'll see if they can go further. I just read a comment about DRG and I just, <laughs> my brain glossed over it. I forgot, Papi, I forgot. Behind this is going to be a Stargate opener out of Hero. So far, everything looking as it should. Going to be a Stargate, I imagine, into an Oracle. I mentioned before that um, Phoenix or Void Ray openers aren't unheard of, but they're very out of meta right now. Um, it was a couple of months ago where Classic was very fond of Void Ray openers. Every single game, we open up Void Ray, uh, but even Classic has kind of deviated away from that, especially post IEM. As I say that, though, it is going to be the Void Ray first. Okay, let's go! <laughs> so the way this works, with a Void Ray opener, the goal here is to deny vision. It's to hunt down these overlords and to keep the Zerg player in the dark. And this doesn't mean mass Void Ray. This just means it could be anything. We could throw down a second Stargate, a Fleet Beacon, and rush into Sky Toss. We could throw down a Twilight Council, go into Glaives, and throw down additional gateways and go into Glaive Adepts. We could go for a standard opener, Twilight Council and Forge into Blink Stalkers. Whether it's standard, whether it's chaotic, whatever it is, Dark won't know. That's the power here of the Void Ray opener. 
again, it's only a single void rate. The downside is that without your first oracle, your scouting across the map is going to be delayed. Um, your potential to harass and kill kill workers is going to be much lower as well. But against dark, I don't think that's the worst thing. In the sense that dark is queen control and his queen defense is renowned. So really trying to kill workers or kill dark drones early on is a difficult thing to do anyway. So hero avoids that. Meanwhile, there it is. Twilight Council is thrown down, but there is a forge thereafter. So it is not Glaive at Epps. This should be plus one in blink or plus one in charge. Regardless of what it is, and even if it's a standard plus one blink follow-up, Dark still has to piece it together. Again, scouting and... I mean, scouting is such a big part of this matchup, of StarCraft in general. Knowledge is key, and that's knowledge that Dark doesn't have. Behind this, we see an earlier Roach Warren as... Oh, we spoke about the Queen defense. The Oracle goes down. And Dark shuts down the first Oracle without losing, or with maybe losing one drone. That's it? Aye, aye, aye. But yeah, I mean, Dark has got really good Queen defense. <laughs> it's what he's known for. Shuts down the first Oracle. Again, it's going to be a slightly earlier Roach Warren. It's a 4 minute 30 Roach Warren, but very necessary because it could be Glaive Adept. So we have to be ready for the worst. So Hero, he's forcing some inefficiencies out of Dark. Behind this, it is plus one and blink. Throwing down additional gateways, getting our third base up and running, getting it saturated. Is it going to be getting it saturated here? And likewise, Dark working towards his own lair. And working towards Ling Roach. Now, what's interesting is that we are investing into plus one range. So this could go into Roach Hydra. As, of course, the upgrade does benefit both tech units. So we'll keep an eye on Dark as the Lings are trying to be active on the map. We do try to strip away control of Zelnaga. We get the adept. We do not get the Stalker. Good control there at Ahira, avoiding the surround. Void Ray adding DPS as well. And Hira, he maintains control of that Zelnaga tower. And what do we see behind this? A bit of a gateway explosion. Now we have how many gateways in total? Four gateways done, four more on the way. That's going to be an AIDS gate, by the way, from Hero. No gases at the third base. This looks like an 8k3 base all in. This is very out of fashion. Uh, I haven't seen Hero do this in months. <laughs> okay. Basically, we're going to be warping in Stalkers and nothing but Stalkers. And this is a very committed or very borderline all in build from Hero. Typically, all in build from Hero. Now, thankfully, Dark, he cuts workers early on. He's cutting workers at 58, so sub 3 base saturation. Maybe cutting workers a little bit too early on, but he's amassing Lings and Roaches behind this as he pushes. Hero, he's transitioning into Sky Toss. Oh my god. Okay. Hero, he pokes in, doesn't really believe that he can kill his opponent, so he throws down a second Stargate, throws in a Fleet Beacon, starts up plus one air attack. Hero, despite having eight gateways, he's not going to be committed. He's just puffing up his chest, feigning aggression. Rotating between the bases. Now, what's scary here is that as Hero is faking aggression and faking a push, Dark isn't. Dark, he, remember, he caught workers at 59. He hasn't made a drone in quite some time. He's massing an army. He's maxing out. Dark is maxing out, and he's going to hit first. And Hero might be caught with his pants down. Remember, Hero, he's investing into plus one air attack, into a fleet beacon, into stargates. All things that will not help in the, in the defense. Wasted resources there by Hero, and here comes the, the counter-attack, the all-in of Dark. There we go again, sub-3 base saturation from Dark. He is pushing up the ramp. There is a shield by me, there's an overcharge. We throw down a couple more stack defense here in a panic, and it's not done. Overcharge is popped. A shield by is exposed, it's going to be focused down. Yeah, the overcharge, it barely helps. And Dark, can he break through? He's bleeding out a lot of roaches. Bleeding out a lot of lings. Good blinks here out of Hero, but he's being broken. He's being forced back. The third base is exposed. And yeah, we collapse on the third. It's going to be brought down. We're trying to go for another warp in here. The cannon doing what it can as well. We are running out of roaches. And we haven't dealt any economic damage. Hero's holding. No shot. Hero, he is holding. He may have lost his cannons and his shield batteries, but he's only lost four probes. Barely lost any workers whatsoever. Wings are coming in to reinforce. We're barely cleaning up the store because the carriers have arrived. They've barely arrived. Hero blinking back behind the mineral line, saving his units. 
gets the warping of Zealots and Hero, he barely loses anything here. Some good piles. But Hero, he cleans up the army. He holds onto his throat. He only loses six probes. Look at the saturation on this base. Oh my god. Every worker was most workers were saved. And now we've gotten away with carriers. We have weathered the storm. Weathered the swarm even. As uh, Dark was all in. And, like now Dark is joining heavily. He's joining up quite heavily behind this. Did throw down the infestation pit. He's going into Roach Infester. But uh, there's no Hydrogen. There's no Spire. There's no. There's not much anti-air. Dark, he's in trouble. He's in a lot of trouble right now. Like, you can see that his drone count isn't looking too bad. He just droned. He literally just droned. Saturation not looking too hot. Hero taking his own fourth. And Hero, he's safe and sound. He should not die anytime soon as he's massing more carriers. Good fungal here on the prism. Oh, we focus down the prism as well. Good defense here by Dark. And the game is going to settle down. We're going to be calming things down. Hero, he's settling into his fourth. Dark is settling into his own fourth as well. I mean, full base versus full base. I have to favor Hero. I have to favor Hero right now. He's up in economy. He's up in tech. Has a higher quality army. And Dark, he's just now getting into Hydro production. Hive just started. Right now, the pressure is on Dark to make something happen here. The pressure is on Dark. And he may try to commit here to just a Hydra-based push, but on a map like Alkyone, we may as well go for the late game. Uh, this map has a lot of bases. It's very spread out. It might be wise for even Dark to just double expand. There we go. He's taking a fifth base. Maybe even take the gold. Throw down a Spire and head towards something longer. Unfortunately, I mean, Dark didn't want that. He was trying to avoid that. That's where he may be forced. How many carriers do we have? Four. We have four carriers, soon to be six. We have High Templar. We have Storm. Archons are amassing. Dark does have map control. He's shutting down all these rocks. He is maxing out. But pushing up a ramp into High Templar into Storms into Sky Toss, it's not going to happen. Here come the Fungals. Good Storm on the Hydras. A Hydra speed isn't done. We throw down the Microbial Shroud. Oh my god. <laughs> when was the last time you saw that? But uh, alas, it's not going to be enough here to really hold on. We have High Temple. We do focus down one of them. Very nice control out of Dark. He moves forward with his Roach as he sniped a High Templar. There's one left. One left underneath the army. And Dark has to back off. He does back off. He lost his Roaches. He didn't. He barely lost any Hydras. He lost three Hydras in that fight. So he retains his expensive High Tech army. Massing more Hydras. Lurker Den is on the way, plus three. We're taking the gold base. And again, we're getting into a longer game. Like, there's there's no breaking this position. Dark, he cannot end the game. He can try to catch out these Stalkers, though. Oh, gets one. Doesn't quite collapse on it. Hero has to be very careful to avoid those fungals. At the same time, he's going to be expanding, taking his fifth base. As Dark's own fifth is slowly getting up and running as well. Both players on comparable worker counts. But again, the carrier count from Hero is getting out of this world. It's How many do we have? Six, now soon to be eight. And Hero, he has a pretty well-refined army. He's built up that High Templar count, warping in four of them. Plenty of energy. From here, we can head into Tempest, a mothership, into more Archons. Archons are usually the way to go here. You see Dark trying to collapse on this. His goal here is to try to snipe some of those carriers with the Vipers. Can we yoink them in? The feedbacks! Oh my god, massive feedbacks on the Vipers. Both Vipers go down. And without Vipers, we cannot engage. We have to back off. Dark in a lot of trouble. Again, very proactive there out of Hero. We can throw down Microbial Shroud, I guess, but Storms, they just, they trump the Microbial Shroud. 
massive storms on the army. Dark he melts. GG gets called, and Hero takes game number one. GG. No, I usually re like reserve the fanfare for the end of the series, but <laughs> GG, well played. Hero takes game one. Again, a very clutch defense there from Hero at the third base. It was very close. Dark, it felt like he was on the on the brink, on the cusp of breaking that mineral line and wreaking havoc at the third base, but he barely did not break Hero. With that, Hero ran away with it, rushed into carriers. And yeah, with that, he just nobled out of control. Uh, Dark, unfortunately, despite getting into Hydra Lurker Viper, I misspoke. He didn't get into any Lurkers, only Hydra Viper. And you can see how important Lurkers are. Lurkers, they don't help against carriers. Of course, they don't shoot up. But what they do do, especially with Lurker range, is they zone away the High Templar. That's the purpose, really, is to zone away the ground army, which includes High Templar from the Protoss. And if the High Templar cannot get close, they can't feedback you, and they can't storm you. Like that That's the purpose there of the Lurkers or the Broodlords thereafter, is to zone away the army, is to just keep those spell caches pinned back so you can have more of a dynamic back and forth. Without either Lurker or Ultra or, or Broodlord or anything there, then you can see that the High Templar, they can have their way with you. They can just step on forward with confidence and feedback and storm whatever they want. So, um, again, what I'm saying is that Dark needed more time. Like, he had the Lurker Den. He just needed more time to refine his army. Time was working against him there. And uh, with that, GG, well played. Hero takes the first game. And again, Dark, Dark didn't have Lurkers, and he wasn't set up for that because of the failed all-in, because he stumbled into the mid-game and stumbled into the late game. His economy was subpar. It was building up. He was getting there, but... And Dark just needed more time to stabilize. And with that, Hero takes the lead. And now we're getting into game number two. And spawning in the top left-hand corner of Hardland, we have the South Korean Protoss player. The Red Protoss representing Dragon Kai Z Gaming, leading the series 1-0, one, one game away from advancing onto the semifinals. It is Hero. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have as a player, we have the South Korean Zerg player representing Talon Esports. Down in the series, yes, if I back here and now, it is Dark. My eyes, the microbial shroud does nothing. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. I mean, microbial shroud, it has a very niche use. As I'm sure you're aware, as I'm sure everyone's aware, Microbial Shroud can actually work quite well. The problem is, if you have Microbial Shroud, but you're also up against Storm. Because if you throw down Microbial Shroud, the problem with that is that you have to keep your army in the Shroud for it to make for it to take effect. And that means that your army is stationary, and that is a prime location for a Storm. Which is what we saw, right? Like, it's just, it's basically like a big sign that says Storm here. And here was like, oh, thank you. Like, <laughs> now I know where to storm. I'll just storm on the shroud. Um, that's where I I remember some people like posing a change to microbial shroud. Um, a little bit more like, God, what was a little bit more like? Um, is it eradicated broodlord? Broodlord? What? In brood war, where um, it's a spell that latches onto a unit, or I guess like parasitic bomb, right? Like, imagine like if you were able to microbial shroud a unit and it follows the units um would that be too imbalanced that that becomes the question but that would be better and yeah I don't know, like just posing a potential change i don't know but like something like that would be more useful because then basically you would have it so the shroud follows the hydras instead of being stationary like that would be a such a huge change but would it be too much maybe maybe i don't know i think something that we can all agree on though is that uh Microbial Shroud is rarely used because of its ineffectiveness, and if we wanted it to be useful, it, it does need a change in some way. Ay ay ay. <laughs> Regardless, with that, GG, we're getting into game number two. And so far, we have some standard openers. It is a hash gas pull out of dark. Likewise, we do have Hero getting into his own gate expand into Cybercore. Tech of choice is going to be a Stargate. Now, I have to go back to how I used to 
open up with PvZ a couple of months ago. Stargate openers usually should be Oracle openers for some Oracle harass into a third base, but as we saw in the last game, Hero is willing to open up Void Ray if he so chooses. Based on the positioning, I feel like it should be an Oracle. Yeah, it's going to be routed across the map. It's going to be an Oracle opener. As we saw in the last game, the power of a Void Ray opener is mainly to deter scouting. That's, that's all it really does. Is it shuts down these overlords and it does deter the Zerg player from getting a read of what's going on. This time though, Hero going for the Oracle opener instead. Something a lot more by the book. be diving on this the overlord is going to be forced back oh, is going to be shut down third base is being taken hero just opening up a little bit more passively here keeping the first oracle back at home lings they do try to come in for a harassment but the oracle is here to defend with a new pick off an adept but so far good stutter stepping out of hero he does shave off a lot of those lings and hero is going to be stuck at home to defend at least a little bit longer second oracle does arrive third oracle is on the way again triple oracle opener into a third The oracles they are forced back once again dark gonna be able to keep up with his queens we spoke about it in game one but dark he does have uh, some world-class queen defense here early on so we'll see if hero can break through that which we have seen happen in the past so far though just keeping dark pinned back at home keeping him busy and we have our follow-up once again twilight council and forge is on the way for plus one and blink or should be plus one and blink could be plus one in charge we'll keep an eye on hero to see which way he does kind of rotate over in as he catches the queen oh not enough energy here for transfuse one queen goes down he's gonna get a second barely doesn't he gets one queen but loses an oracle does get a good amount of drones five drones do, do go down not bad five drones and one queen for an oracle not a bad trade here but dark he throws down a bailey nest okay not a roach warren and he's massing links he is massing lings. We have 16 more lings on the way. Dark, he does want to be aggressive early on. He's not going all in by any means, but he is moving out with Ling Bane. He's going to try to break that third. We'll see if he can. Lings, they rock up. They're going to be able to get on top of these pylons. First pylon is cancelled. As a lot of lings do get shaved off, going to be forced back. Again, Dark still back at home, happily joining, saturating his third, getting his fourth. Baneling Nest is now done. Do we have enough links here to really go for a Baneling run by? It's going to be difficult with a wall, <laughs> as the wall is up and running. No Baneling run by potential on the right-hand side. Yeah, Dark just fanning out his links. Now, because we didn't throw down the Roach Warren, this could be Ling Bane into Hydra. That could be the tech of choice here for Dark. It could be a Ling Bane into Spire tech as well, into Mutas. But there it is. Hydrogen was thrown down, not the Spire. Ling Bane into Hydra. Okay. Now, the way this dynamic works is Ling Bane Hydra can do very well against Blink Stalkers. Especially if Hero does decide to be aggressive with his own Stalker army. Looking at the production here, we're once again going for the same build. Eight gates. Eight gates on three bases. Hero is pushing, he can reinforce. He's gonna have a lot of stalkers to work with. Now we saw in game one that Hero, he postured with this army, but then he threw down the Stargate and he started working towards Sky Toss. We'll see what he does this time. As he does push forward, does get surrounded for a moment there. Dark threatens the surround. But Hero is gonna be able to hold on, reinforces with more stalkers. Again, this is the power of hard lead, is the rush distance by ground is very short. So it doesn't take long at all to reinforce. Even without a war prism, even without a gateway. And here he's out trading these lings. He's gotten 41 lings, by the way, for zero stalkers. Good blink so far. Denies the base, denies the hatchery. And does kill an overlord. And he's gonna keep the pressure up. And again, he can because he's reinforcing from the center of the map with this forward base. A very aggressive base to take. And here he's not slowing down. Just mass Blink Stalker aggression. Lings are trying to engage, but again, we can Blink back. We have Oracles to support. 
Okay, the Lings are being shaved off. And without Lings, these Hydras are so exposed. We need the Lings! We need them! The Hydra count is getting quite high. It is massing. Still running out of Lings, though. The Lings have been solid. We still haven't lost a Stalker, by the way. Oh, finally, one goes down. Oh my god. Two goes down. He's slipping up. He gets two stalkers. Three stalkers. But again, the trades have been so good here for Hero. How dare he lose three stalkers in this fight. A fourth stalker falls. And a fifth. The Hydras, they're getting damage done. They're breaking through. They're trying to at least. Yeah, the Oracles, they engage. And Dark is being broken himself. The boys are being pulled. Stalk, uh, the stalk additional stalkers have gone down. <laughs> Additional Stalkers have gone down here as we get into it here. A bit of a more messy fight, but boys are being pulled and Dark, he's bleeding out a bit too much. Six drones fall. You can see how vulnerable these Hydras are without Lings. And Hero, he's forcing the issue and he is overwhelming. He is overwhelming Dark. Again, just really efficient trades here from Hero. Reinforcements have arrived. Darky's holding, but you can see him plummet in supply. You can see here a take a supply lead. We have a good concave. We do have a good concave coming in, but again, barely any hydras left. We're down to how many? 10 hydras. 11 hydras against 32 stalkers. It's not gonna happen. Not like this. Not like this, as Dark is trying to hold on desperately uh, by the skin of his teeth. The aggression is too much. We die on top of the Hydras. The writing was on the wall. GG gets called as Dark is broken. And Hero takes game number two, takes the series two to zero. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Hero as he does take the series two to zero. Does snowball out of control. You can see. Again, he was trading so efficiently with his army, but it was a couple of things coming together. It wasn't just the insane control. It was it was very good control out of Hero, minimizing his losses, blinking his heart out, trading as efficiently as possible. But it was also, again, eight gate blink, right? Eight gateways supporting that army. It was also the fourth base right behind his army to reinforce on the front lines, and the fact that this was hard led. Very short rush distance by ground. It doesn't take long at all to reinforce. Again, Hero, he pulled this off without a rover, without a warp prism, without a reinforcing gateway. He's just warping in at his fourth base, and it, he takes it takes seconds for those stalkers to just join the front lines and to break through, and Dark just could not survive that, could not hold on. The aggression, the pressure was too much. GG, well played. Congratulations. Congratulations here to Hero. My condolences to Dark as he has been eliminated from the tournament. My condolences is now... We're getting into our next game. We do have some updates. We have some updates on the bracket, and let's catch up. Here we go. Bjorn, I was hyping up Nightmare, and I'm sure it was a great series, but Bjorn, he was the favorite player coming into it, and Bjorn, he takes down Nightmare 2-0. Bjorn advancing on into the semis, and it is going to be Hero versus Bjorn in the upper semifinals. That is what is coming up next here on the channel. Scrolling down, we still have DRG and Creator. They're still mid-series. They're still ongoing. Oliveira and Cure, still mid-series as well. So no other updates towards the bottom half of the bracket. But we have our first semifinals. We have our first semifinals. Also, I'm going to try to catch up in the chat because I can, I can see some... Some stuff happening. <laughs> Hold on. From the top. From the top. Back. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, if you see Olds Protoss in the chat complaining about balance, um, he's a troll. Like, don't, <laughs> don't pay him much mind. Let's 
it called? Oh, they're referring to game one. No way. <laughs> See the chat catching up. Yeah, it looks like some people talking about, I guess, all ins. I'm just shaking my head. How do roaches eat a lot of supply when they just take two supply like other like white units? Uh, roaches are supply inefficient. Uh, they do they do take additional supply compared to other Zerg units. And on top of that, they themselves aren't amazing either. That's why uh, we always say, um, depending on the game state and roach heavy composition, the soup does lie. The soup does lie. The supply does lie uh, when it comes to those kind of armies. Lurker and Marauder should kind of carry us. True, they. Why don't they shoot up, Bappy? Ah, oh, smooch. We just, we need we need the upgrade. We need like the we need the fall back upgrade for Marauders to just like fall back on their on their backs and just shoot up, but they're stationary <laughs> to just lie down. Oh, we got an update. Oh, we got an update. Sorry, I'm just still reading the chat. Uh, <laughs> we got an update. In the, we got an update here with the scoreline. And DRG Dong Regu takes down Creator 2 to 1. We still have a Zerg player in the tournament. Let's go. DRG, he does advance on to the lower semifinals. He's still waiting, though, for a Terran. Either Cure or Lavera. It is going to be one of them. Which one? Yet to be determined. Yet to be determined. Have I made fun of that T1 list and chat TL list already? If we've, if we've already done it, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about the tier list. Don't worry about it. It's just some guy's opinion. Don't have to. It's fine. <laughs> there we go. All right, here we go. We're getting into our next game. We're getting into our semifinals, by the way. Okay, now we can focus. We can focus on the game at hand. And not just that. We can also focus on... Predictions. If you're in the chat, you can get your gamba going, Bobby. You can get your gamba going in the chat. Place your bets on how you think this semifinals is going to go. As first, we'll get into our introductions. Let's go. Spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Hard Lead, we have our South Korean Protoss player. The red Protoss representing Dragon Kai Z Gaming. It is Hero. The best Protoss in the world. And spawning in the top left hand corner, we have as opponent, we have the South Korean Terran player, the Blue Terran, representing Shopify Rebellion. It is Bion. And one moment here as we just settle into things. Huh. And I get the predictions going. Here we go. Okay, if you're in the chat, predictions are open. Place your bets on who you think is going to take this. You have a couple of minutes. You have a couple of minutes upon hearing this message. And as a reminder, it is a best of three. Best of three, not a best of five. Uh, predictions open. There we go. Just letting you guys know. Predictions are open. And now we are settling into our first semi-final. It's a very different matchup. Um, we did cast Beyond versus Hero recently. I think it was last week. And Beyond had his way with Hero. 
uh, I'll be honest, like, Vian, he was popping off and he was going for these, he was getting some mind shots in the face of here in his mineral line, he was able to pull him apart, a very aggressive style out of Vian, we'll see what he goes for this time, it is a single gas opener, single gas opener out of Vian, it is going to be a Rax expand into his factory, so economic opener in general, but a very safe opener as he has opted to throw down the CC on the high ground, so he won't be disrupted and delayed on the low ground. So economic and safe opener here out of Bion. Meanwhile, across the map, we do see Hero getting into his own build of choice. Is going to be opening up Gate Expand or Gate Cyber Expand. Stalker has arrived, getting to our Sentry follow up. Again, this has become a little bit more of a popular opener here from the side of Protoss. Getting to a faster Sentry does give you a lot of scouting information early on. And against Bion, I feel like this is paramount. Like, you need to get a read on what exactly he's up to because Bion can be very chaotic here in this matchup. And we have our tech of choice, Twilight Council. It's going to be a Twilight Council opener here at a hero. Reaper is going to be dipping in. Tries to at least, but does dip away. So far, hero, he does catch the Reaper, getting some extra hits in. Autobus does shut it down. Big pick up there. Bion, a bit of miscontrol, did fly too close to the sun, and he got burned. He got shut down, and with that, Bion has no idea whether it's a Robo, a Stargate, or a Twilight Council opener. Bion is in the dark. Doesn't know what's going on. And behind this, we do see Bion getting into his 1-1-1 follow-up. Interesting. He's going for a Hellion drop. Or, I should say, he's heading up for some drop play here with Marine Hellion. We can see Marines in the medevac to head towards the main. And we can see Hellions try to bust in towards the natural. Regardless, the goal here is to get economic damage done. Hallucination Scout comes in. And we do get eyes on the Hellions. Additional Hellions. That's a big tell. We also saw the reactor on the racks. So, Hero's seen everything. He's seen everything, he knows everything. He's getting ready back at home. Yeah, he's walling off. So, in the early game in PvT, as a Protoss player, you have very few units. You have very few units. So upon seeing all the Hellions, we have a full wall off, knowing we can leave the bare minimum at the natural to defend, and we have our army here in the main. And yeah, the drop is deflected. So again, if Hero hadn't scouted, then the wall doesn't get up and running. Hellions, they break in, they wreak havoc, they force the Stalkers down to the low ground, and then the drop busts into the main. So, so far, a good defense out of Hero. Behind this, the drop is going to be slipping into the main base as well, but we do get eyes on it. There is a shield battery in position, and Hero does defend, but the drop just scouted. And for the first time, we saw the tank, Twilight Council. Twilight Council, blink-based opener here from Hero. Bion is now aware. Behind this, he is settling into his own 2-1-1 setup, soon to be a 3-1-1 setup. Early tank production as well makes sense. Just because he's unaware of the gateway count, there could be, it could be four gate blink for all he knows. We can see there's a third. So just two gate blink here from Hero. Two gate blink into a third, a very safe, very economic opener. Basically, Hero is going to be lacking a lot of map control. He has a couple of units that he can fan out, possibly, but outside of that, Hero is looking towards the mid game. Likewise, so is Bion, as Bion throws down a third CC. Hallucination Scout comes in, and Hero, he will get eyes on the third base. It is hidden here in between the bases, but Hero does see, he does know. Upon seeing this third base, Hero should be feeling pretty confident and pretty safe. As I say that, Bion is pushing. He did retain his Marines. Remember, he built up a heavy Marine count early on, and he did not throw them away. Oh, the Medivac! Ooh, Medivac goes down. Big pick off. Medivac does for Bion. He's rocking up at the third base. His goal here is to force a cancel. And the tanks, they're getting within range. Shield battery is done. Tanks, though, they do siege. Yeah, they force a cancel on the shield battery. Overcharge is pop. We pull the boys. And with the help of the Immortal, we should clean this up. We should defend. Yeah, Hero, he's going to shut this down. Does lose workers in the process. But he can focus on every single tank. At the same time, though, the Hellions. Oh, sorry. Hellions? Liberator. Liberator gets into the main. Gets five probe kills. So four boys died here as they were being pulled. And five go down to the site To the... Cyclone? <laughs> to the Liberator. Good damage dealt by Bjorn. So he may not have broken the third, and he may have lost all of his tanks, but he does get nine probes. So it was not all for, it, was, it wasn't all for naught. With that, the game is going to be selling. Remember, beyond he was going for a third CC, and it's getting up and running. Well, soon to be on location. Building up on two bases, getting into his Raxes. Going 
be able to get a couple of probe kills here at the natural. This is what, eight probe kills? Jesus, that's a lot of damage for the lib. Can he get another? He cannot. Pian, he does get shut down. Scans the base, does get eyes on the army, on the composition. The immortals, the sentries. We do have Colossal Production underway here for a hero. Just settling on three bases and an interesting fourth base location. Okay, so typically you would take the triangular third just because it also protects your main base from drop play or it deters drop play. Or you would take the forward, you would take the forward fourth base uh, if you want to be aggressive, but no, we expand over towards left-hand side. On the one hand, it's very out of the way, so maybe it goes by unscouted, but it is very vulnerable. It's very isolated. I am worried for Hero and whether or not he can save this base, as he's going to be spreading himself very thin here between his main base and his fourth. The other added advantage if he took the center base is that you can kind of blink back and forth between your fourth and, and your main. So, a risky move here from Hero. But if it works out, then his fifth base is going to be more secure. Like, if we're thinking further ahead, your fifth base is going to be so, so, so much safer than it otherwise would be. And so far, the base has gone unscouted. Back at home, we do see Bion continuing tank production. Not something you see too often. But he's going for a very tank-heavy style. Getting into Vikings for the Colossi, of course. Continuing his bio. Has he thrown down a Ghost Academy? Not yet. No Ghost Academy yet. We're getting there. As Hero is just settling in. Here we go. We do see Beyond Pushing. Sorry, I was a little bit distracted by the chat, but the tanks. Oh my god, we have so many of them. Uh, I was just, <laughs> I was just distracted trying to catch up with the chat. We do have five tanks here for Beyond. A pretty committed push. He's gonna be pulling the boys as well. Oh my god, he pulls the boys at his third base. He is just going for a big three base all in. I was caught off guard. I was not quite expecting this, but he's gonna be committed. We have six Vikings pushing on four. The base is gonna be denied. Upon seeing the boys, hero. Time is on his side. He just has to cancel the fifth base, backs off. Remember, Hero already has a fourth. It's already up and running. Gets so unsteady here for Hero. Picks away at the Vikings. Collapses on the tanks. Big tank while he's going off. Did you get two of them? We do shut down two of those tanks. The overcharge putting in a lot of work, keeping the Colossi alive. So far, good defense here by Hero. And again, it's all or nothing here by Bjorn. He has to keep going. He has to keep pushing. Vikings, they take down another Colossi. There's only one left. It's being targeted down. But the ground army is too much. Hero, he swallows up the tanks. He will defend. He will clean this up. GG gets called. And Hero takes game number one. Whew, GG. An interesting three base all in out of beyond there. Again, the center base didn't really matter too much. Because Hero had expanded on the left hand side, it was a base that was safe and sound. So he had the economy on his side in the end. And he was able to slow down that army. Again, three base all ins aren't really seen too often in this matchup. I'll be honest. I was I was caught off guard by that and beyond just unable to pull it off. I do apologize for being a little bit distracted as the all in was starting. Sorry, just catching up with the chat. I think some people are asking about me being frozen. Um, again, I'm I'm not frozen, Papi. I'm not frozen. <laughs> but hopefully, there's no lag. Hopefully, there is no lag. Um, I don't have a webcam. I'm here traveling abroad in the land of Poland, but I'm actually returning to Australia in a couple of days. Fun fact. I'm coming back to Australia in a couple of days. Uh, in two days, actually. Tomorrow is going to be my last day here in Poland. And then I'll be back. And when I do get back to Australia, then I will have a webcam. Then I'm going to have to put on some clothes. I'm going <laughs> I'm to be on cam again after like two months or a month and a half. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Um, but I do miss my setup. And uh, I do look forward to casting from back home again. And uh, yeah, that is going to mean that I'm going to be using my, my regular microphone. So my voice is going to go back to what it was um, as I'm using a different mic right now. I'm going to have my webcam. I'm going to have my green screen back. Oh, it's, oh, it's going to be beautiful. 
And um, just for the people that like it and for the people that are going to miss it, I'll try and make that face as often as, as I can uh, on cams. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and pull it off back. Regardless, here we go. We're getting into game number two and spawning in the bottom left-hand corner, surviving the three base all in as Bjorn pulled the boys and was unable to break him. We have the best Protoss in the world. We have the red Protoss player representing Dragon Kaiser Gaming. It is Hero. Unamas won it. Game away from advancing on and spawning in the top right-hand corner. We have his opponent. We have the South Korean Terran player, the blue Terran representing Shopify Rebellion. It is Bjorn. We go. So we are settling in. But I'll, I'll focus on the game, Papi. I'll focus on the game. We won't get distracted. I, j I just saw some people uh, like talking about it. So I was like, <laughs> so I felt like I had to respond. <laughs> to, uh, to, as to why, um, to as to why I'm using a screenshot instead of a uh, proper camera there. I mean, technically, I do have a camera on my... I'm casting from a laptop. I do have a camera inbuilt on the laptop. And fun fact, day one that I was here, I was trying to set up with it, but it's, it's not good. It's not... <laughs> I do have a cam on the laptop, it, the inbuilt one. It's not very good. It's... um, Especially because, obviously, the downside of that kind of camera is that it's... Because it's built into the monitor of the laptop, like, I can't adjust it. I can't lift it up and down. I have to, like, move the... The laptop like lid and it's it's not yeah it's not good <laughs> so uh not ideal for like production or for casting sort of thing I guess it's fine for like a call like a like a Skype call or like a Zoom call but yeah that's a, that's as to why I'm not using a webcam. But yeah, tomorrow's going to be my last day here. Tomorrow's going to be my last day casting in Poland. Um, so exciting times. I say exciting. It's going to be. A long trip. It's going to be a 30-hour trip, so I do look forward to it. As once again, economic opener. Beyond going for a Rax expand, single gas opener here out of Beyond with this opener. If you remember, it's the same opener as game one, except oh my, he's going for a third CC. Let's go! I was going to say it's the same opener, except this time it's the CC on location, and he's going for a third CC before Rax. This is a build that Beyond has been flexing. On a couple of maps, I was about to say specifically on Alki on it. For the reason, the reason for this is Zell gets across the map and is going to be shut down. Uh, but the reason for this is because this map is large. It's a very large map, a lot of bases to be taken, a longer rush distance by ground, very defendable on three and four bases. So you can be greedy on Alki on it. And Bjorn has been doing this against Zerg players. He beat Raynor with his build. Uh, Maru did an adaptation of this against Raynor as well at IEM. And Bjorn recently did this, I think it was on site Delta, if I remember correctly. And I remember freaking out because I was like, mate, like it is not safe to do this uh, on some of these other maps. On Alkyone, it is. A, a little bit safer is maybe a better way of putting it. So a very greedy build here to Bjorn. Hero, going to be picking away at those Marines, shaving off a couple of them. And our tech of choice is not a Twilight Council, it's not a Stargate, it is a Robo Opener. So... I think I like Beyond's position better. So a rover opener means fast colossus. As you can see, the bay is the bay has been thrown down, and this is a hard counter to three raxes. And it is going to be a three rax variation, true, but it's three rax three cc. Um, so even though we're going to get a high colossus count, actually we're going for we're going for a prism first to be a little bit more assertive and a little bit more aggressive. But even though we're going to have fast colossi, Beyond's going to be defending back at home, and we'll see if Hero can make use of that timing. You make use of the timing of the first and second Colossi. The downside as well is that Hero has very little map control because he has no Blink Stalkers and no Phoenixes. The reason why Phoenix openers and Blink Stalker openers are so commonplace is because they allow you to shut down drop play. There are different ways and different avenues of gaining map control, shutting down medevac drops, Raven Harass, Liberators of the sort, and even counterattacking and harassing across the map. Hero, he's going to shut- never mind! Okay, Disruptor first here out of Hero. The Observer comes in. He sees the third CC. And we're going for some Disruptor drops. Oh my god. This is more unorthodox. You rarely see this in this matchup. Um, Disruptor drop openers are mainly seen against Zerg players. Uh, against Zerg, that is a lot more commonplace. Against Terran, less so. So it's going to be one Disruptor into Colossi. Okay. War Prison Speed is being researched. Hero, he's moving out across the map. This is very high risk, high reward. Um, 
I like this adaptation. Basically, as soon as Hiro saw the opener, he's like, I have to harass. I have to do something about the economy of, of, of Bion. True, right? He does have to do something because Bion is being so greedy. But the Nova, it's all about your opponent missing it, messing up. And here we go, Nova goes off. Two SCVs. Two SCVs go down. That's an okay amount of damage. And what's important is that the Prism is still alive. We get a free scout of the main. But no game ending damage, no devastating damage done yet. As we're trying to go for another Nova, but we won't be able to get it. Yun diving in with those Marines. Gets another shot off in the main base. Four SCVs, six in total. Much better. Six worker kills and hero backs off. And again, this is a really good way to kind of deviate away from your standard robot opener and do some harassing damage when you realize how greedy your opponent is. So really nice fluid play here out of hero. I really do appreciate it. Oh god! Really do appreciate this. Hero has to back off. Stim is done. He's playing with fire right now. He cannot afford to lose this. There he goes off. Gets one more SCV. That's seven workers in total. And behind this hero is taking a third. His third base is getting up and running. Upon seeing the fast throat of his opponent, he knows he can expand. He knows that Vion is stuck at home. Hero is still sharking around. Again, building up the Immortals, building up the Colossi. Never up. Gets two more Marines, but the Vikings have arrived and we should be recalling back home. I think with War Prison Speed, yeah, we can out we can outrange them. We can out we can outpace the Vikings. Hero will get the hell out of there. Racing back home. His third base fully saturated, mineral-wise at least. Now he's coming together with his entire army. He's got a Colossi, he's got an Immortal. A lot of force fields are available as well. And Hero, he just saw the third base landing. Can he deny it? Can he punish this third? I'm loving the hallucinated Colossi. Ah, uh, the scan reveals it though. He knows. Yeah, boys are being pulled. There's one tank in position. Nova goes off, takes down the tank. Big pick up. Good force fields as well. SCVs are falling one after the other. Seven SCVs go down. And what did Hero really lose there? Gateway units. He lost a Zealot, three sentries, and four stalkers. Good attack here from Hero. Good trade. Dealing a blow to the economy and the army of Bion. Behind this, he takes a fourth. Taking another base. Hero doing a great job at punishing the greedy build here of Bion. And Bion, meanwhile, he's settling in. Still has a good worker count because of his opener. May have lost a lot of SCVs, but he still has plenty to work with. As Bion is going to be building up his tank count. He's going to be stuck here, at least until he builds up that tank count a little bit higher. Getting up towards two, soon to be three tanks. Hero repositioning. Once again, going for the drop into the natural, but he does get zoned away. He does get zoned away here. And Hero, he will retreat. He will back off behind this, setting up for a fifth, or at least a spotted pylon. Just to make sure we're safe and sound. Yeah, pylon's being thrown down outside the fourth. Disruptor production continuing here for Hero. And this army, it's becoming quite impressive. Hero, he's building up quite heavily. Beyond behind this, fourth CC. With the with the revelation of this fourth, it looks like Beyond is taking more defensive stance. He's just turtling up here on three bases, getting a fourth, taking up into an armory in 2 2, taking up towards a ghost academy. Bion gonna stim on forward, but he can't quite push out. Again, Bion is contained. And pushing into disruptors is not gonna be easy. As Hero ooh, gets baited into the blink. A good chunk of stalkers go down. That was not it. Not what Hero was hoping for. Not ready for those tanks. There it goes off. Presenting back the army. Again, Hero, we're fighting on a knife's edge right now. I don't think we need to be here, but he wants to deny the fourth. He wants the fourth base. Nova goes off. We get the tank. But the bio army sims on board. There's only one Colossi. Force feels a by some time, but we can chase this army down. Hero, he's caught with his pants down. Not where he wants to be. Not the fight that he's really looking for. The Zelts are going to be going down. He does save his, his disruptors at least. But we got to get out of here. We need to leave. <laughs> like, again, this was a very, very 
shaky fight here for Hero. He got a tank, but did bleed out a lot of units. He will back off. Again, I'm pretty sure he wanted to deny the 4th, because the 4th was still building. He was trying to deny the CC. Didn't get it, though. A little bit greedy there at a Hero. It walks within tank range. Behind this second Robo. Third Robo's on the way. Now, because he lost his Colossi, he's in a bit of trouble here. And he's those Robo's sitting up and running. Collapsing on the army. We dive on top of the Disruptors. We focus one down. There's only one left. And yeah, we sim on forward. We dive on this army. And it's going to be completely cleaned up. Zealots are wreaking havoc, though. Zealots are doing well for themselves. They clean up the tanks. We have more of a back and forth. But these were expensive losses for Hero. Yeah, looking at the battle report here, Hero, he lost three Disruptors and two Immortals. Hefty losses for the Protoss. Now, thankfully, Hero has a good economy. He's got the gold. He has the fifth base, the gold base up and running, and he's getting into triple Robo production to make three Colossi at a time and Disruptors. So Hero, he can stabilize, but a lot of the momentum that Hero once had, a lot of the map control that Hero had, isn't really there anymore. It's not really there anymore. Biani's making a game out of this. He's breaking free. He's pushing out. This is still very neck and neck. Well, it's still up in the air. Maybe a better way, a better way to put it. As Bion, he establishes his fourth. As Hero is trying to get his sick. Again, the Protoss needs to be up a base. At least. I'm getting up to two. I'm getting up two bases. Behind this hero working on plus three, committed to his robot production. He's not going into Storm, he's not going into Sky Toss. But he is still needing to rebuild those disruptors. As he is down to zero disruptors. There we go, the first one is now being rebuilt. He is on the way there. Hero also throwing down some sort of pylons just to get eyes on any would-be fifth. And we're about to max out. Both players are about to max out. Beyond does have a 3-3 timing on the horizon. Hero thinking about Sky Toss. You can see here Stargate is on the way. Plus one air attack as well. I mean, the game, it's getting there. It's going that long. We're getting ready for the, for the carriers, for the Sky Toss. We're not there yet, though. We are not there yet. You see Hero rotating around. Does come across the Sensor Tower. Big EMPs on the army. Nova goes off. But again, we dive on top of the Disruptor. We shut it down. A second Nova does pop off as well. Decent connection on the Marauders. Decent connection there as Hero is forced all the way back home. Bleeding under the Colossi. He's down to zero Disruptors. Again, without a high Disruptor count, we can't stop Beyond from pushing in. Yeah, and he will take down this, this core base. Does dive on it. Hero going to try to engage. Good positioning here by Bion. Using the train to his advantage. Reducing the surface area on those zealots. The Colossi go down. And Bion, can he clean this up? Do we have too much? Hero. EMPs are okay. Here come the disruptors. The frames are dropping. <laughs> I do apologize. Frames are dropping. We focus on one of those Metamax. Hero, he does hold. Oh my god, Hero setting up a proxy pylon. Taking another base, by the way. But again, I do apologize for the... For the frames dropping there. I'll, hold on, I'll try to fix that. We'll try to fix that. As Hero, he is remaxing again. What Hero is really relying on right now is his economy. He's remaxing with almost pu almost purely zealots. He's spending his minerals. Nervous are going off. Big connections. Yeah, big connections with the Novas. Sometimes one is all you need, and Hero he gets that he's gonna deny this northern base. We're back into a high disruptor count, and again the economy of Hero is booming. He can afford these losses. Nervous go off. Good target firing, but a Nova connects. Big connection on Bion and Hero. He's snowballing out of control. He breaks through the main army, gets on top of the ghost. 
and this planetary also crumbles. GG gets caught, Hero Snowball's out of control, and he does take the series 2-0. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Hero, as he does take the series, does advance on to the Grand Finals. My condolences to Bion. This was a much closer game, and I do think that Hero at times was a little bit too adventurous, was a little bit too cavalier with his army movement. Um, but the reality is that Hero, because of his map control, he had so many bases. I spec remember I mentioned briefly how Protoss, they typically want to be upper base, upper base against the Terran. He was up two bases. He was working on a sixth as Bion was taking a fourth. And he was getting a seventh, but at the time that Bion was getting a fifth, like he had so much money to work with, even though some fights were going a bit awry for Hero, which is true, like he was bleeding out quite a bit at times. He was able to remax, he was able to reproduce just with a quick warping of Zealots, quick reinforcements of disruptors, and he was able to keep the pressure up. Bion needed more time. He needed more time to rebuild, a time that Hero refused to give him. GG. GG will play. Congratulations here to Hero. He advances onto the Grand Finals, and who will he face off against? We still have to find out. We still do have to find out. Let's head on over to the bracket. Exclamation mark B. Exclamation mark B in the chat. Also, hold on, I'm just making sure that I didn't have any anything on in the background. Making sure that we're okay. As we are setting things up. Okay, scrolling things down and refreshing the brackets. If you remember, DRG had taken down Creator, and we were waiting on Cure and Oliveira. We were waiting on Cure and Oliveira, and it looks like we have our result coming in. Oliveira. Oh, we have a, we have a lobby. Oliveira, he takes down Cure 2-1, to one, advancing onto the semifinals. My condolences to Cure, but that's another big win for Oliveira. He takes down Shin, he takes down Cure, and now Oliveira is up against DRG in the semifinals. Oh, yeah. oh, God. I don't have time. Oliveira. Hold on. I'll put him over here. DRG. Okay. So, uh, the scoreline... Oh, sorry, the intro may be a little bit scuffed. But we're jumping into the lower semifinals. Oliveira versus DRG. ZVT. We still have one player of each race. We have a Protoss in the finals. We have a Terran and Zerg. Fighting for a chance to face off in those finals against Hero. And up next, we're getting into game number two. And DRG is leading the series 1-0. to zero. Here we go. Uh, I will pay out the predictions in the chat. And we won't have predictions for this series just because we're jumping in mid-series and we have very little time to <laughs> to set that up um but we're jumping into game two and spawning in the bottom right hand corner of golden aura we have our chinese terran player the reigning world champion representing dragon kai z gaming he just took down cure and shin but now he's struggling here against drg can he bounce back it is Oliveira. And spawning in the top left hand corner, we have his opponent, we have the South Korean Zerg player representing himself, currently teamless, but leading the series 1-0, to deserving to be on a team, he's been popping off tonight, it is DRG. As a reminder, DRG, he took down Gumiho alongside Creator to make it this far, a big name Terran and Protoss, now he's up against the reigning world champ, can he bring him down? As we're settling into game 2. Oh boy. And again, I do apologize for the frame drops that were happening in the last game. Um, sometimes it does happen. As a reminder, I am casting from a laptop right now. So, you know, the laptop is not the most powerful of machines. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been pretty good. You know, for the most part, it's been holding its own for the month that I've been here, for the month and a half. It has been holding its own, but, um, you know, it, it has its limitations. So, uh, I have to have to be easy on it. Uh, I'm, I'm petting the laptop right now. I'm... <laughs> It's, it's okay, Bobby. It's okay. You're doing well. Just consoling the laptop. <laughs> uh. But here we go. We're settling on in, and it is going to be a Rax expand here from Oliveira. Again, winding it back to that last series as well, quickly, briefly going over it. Like, I did love how adaptive Hero was when it came to his opener, how fluid he was to be able to punish the greed of his opponent. Not just that, but. 
very quickly take advantage of how defensive Beyond was being and just mass expand behind it and do such a great job at containing Beyond. Again, there were moments where I felt like maybe Hero was a little bit overly aggressive, but for the most part, did very well for himself. Could afford those trades. GG. Does earn his, does earn his spot in the finals. And now we're here to determine who faces off against Hero in those finals. Again, DRG, he needs one mass, One more to take it all. But now Reaper gets across the map. Going to be dancing with the links. The dance has begun. Third base has already been thrown down. DRG, he, DRG, he did make an extra pair of links. He made six instead of four. So not the most efficient of starts here, but it's the only big deviation. Meanwhile, Oliveira throws down his third CC before Starport. Very economic build here from our Terran player. Is going for that third CC. With that, is going for a bit of a longer game here. Getting into his add on swap. And no, it's going to be back. No, <laughs> not like this. Oh my god, we've seen Bjorn embrace Mech recently. If you were here last week in ESL Open Cup Asia, then you would have seen Bjorn do nothing but Mech against Solar in the finals of last week's ESL Open Cup Asia. Bjorn has been embracing Mech. Clem has been embracing Mech. And what I will say is that Mech is going to change in the new patch, right? I feel like maybe these Terran players, they're embracing the new Cyclone while they can because that Cyclone is about to change. For those that are unfamiliar, um, there is a patch that was announced and details have been released. And the patch is still in the PTR. There's still changes that can be made to the patch, but it is going to be addressing certain things. One of those things is the new Cyclone. And it is going to be a big change to the Cyclone as well. And if, we spoke about this during our podcast. Um, we had a podcast last week talking and go, going over the patch. The podcast, aka the podcast, if you will. Uh, myself and Yaku. And uh, we did discuss the changes to the Cyclone. And it's really weird because uh, we read the developer notes on the change. And it, it was specifically talking about um, TVP and TVT, the Cyclone. But we were talking about it and it's like the change to the Cyclone, it is going to impact... TVZ quite a bit actually which wasn't mentioned in the dev notes which was weird but um this battle mech and this mass cyclone style that's been popping up is going to be negatively affected by the patch the biggest reason or the biggest thing that's going to be impacting this in the new patch is that they're reducing they're changing the cooldown right now there is zero cooldown to the lock-on a cyclone can lock on to a unit the lock-on can be broken, and then the Cyclone can instantly re-lock on currently in the in the current patch, which is why kiting with the Cyclone is brutal. And, like, you can easily kite against Lings, Hydras, Roaches. Like, the, these Cyclones are so efficient. With the new patch, if it goes through, they're changing that from a zero-second cooldown to a three-second cooldown, which doesn't sound like a lot. It's, like, three seconds. But, again, that change from what it is now is huge because now... Breaking a lock-on actually means something. Now you can break the lock-on and it actually does actually impact the flow of the game state, the flow of the fight. It does give the Zerg player or any kind of opposing player um, a little bit more breathing room and it allows them to micro against the Cyclone and have more counterplay, which is what is how things used to be, really. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty big. Meanwhile, Oliveira, again, he's throwing down three more factories, is committing to mech. Coming to the mass side, clown, Bobby. Let's go. As we pick up a queen already, first queen goes down. It looks like we get a second queen, and we might just snowball from here. We get two now. Three queens fall. The queens are falling one after the other, and we are holding. The, the roaches have arrived just in time, but the loss, the loss of those queens that does impact the production here. The macro of DRG. As he's down to four, it is going to slow down his creep. It is going to impact his injections. So they do have to be replaced. As Oliveira, he keeps the pressure up, keeps the pressure on. Additional Cyclones being produced. Now, this mass Cyclone style will eventually transition into tanks, but it takes a while for that to happen. For now, we're okay just massing Hellion Cyclone. Again, it can trade very efficiently here, and so far it has done a great job. Now, the scary thing they have to be careful of is surrounds. Like, if Oliveira goes too far into creep, then DRG can bait us around and collapse on this army. That's the downside. But there's barely any creep. That's the problem right now. Because the queens just died, there's barely any creep to work with. And kiting off of creep. Oh, God, not like this. We do pick up a cyclone. 
At the same time, a big lane counter attack where you get 5 SCVs, good damage dealt. DRG does deal a blow to the economy of Oliveira. And he does force Oliveira to back off. So DRG buys a bit of breathing room. Do we have any active tumor? We have one. We have one active tumor. The spire was thrown down. We're going into Muta's. Interesting. Um, I've yet to really see Muta's work in this game state. I'm curious if it will here. The reason why, uh, the new Cyclone, fun fact, uh, does actually trade quite well against Muta's. Does trade quite well because of the higher attack rate that it has. It can pop off. So Muta's have to try to avoid these Cyclones as best they can. Here we go. Muta's going to be harassing towards the left-hand side. Roach just towards the right. Oliveira came being kept busy. Does spot the Roach army. Back at home, we only have a handful of Cyclones. We're getting into tank production. So Muta's, they can pop off. They can get damage done. No turrets. No scouting. Oliveira, he doesn't know. Doesn't know that Muta's are about to lay siege upon his third. At the same time, Roach is pushing towards that forward base. Yeah, they're, they're distracting Oliveira. And as Oliveira is distracted, here we go, the Muta's, they dive in. They dive into the third base. Oliveira out of position. Eight SCVs go down. Did I say eight? I meant to say ten. <laughs> ten, eleven, twelve workers going to be falling here. The Cyclone's having a hard time keeping up. Again, Muta's, they cannot fight this head on, but they do a great job just kiting back. Falling back here into the main base. 14 SCVs. That's an entire mineral line. We do catch the Muta's. Ooh. Yeah, you can see how quickly these Muta's fall. But they dealt the damage they were looking for. 14 kills. And we're not making any more Muta's. Again, as I mentioned, going mass Muta against mech nowadays isn't really viable anymore. You only make Muta's to harass at least a little bit. We've dealt the damage, and now we're going into Roach Hydra. Roach Hydra is going to be the composition instead for DRG. He's done with the Muta's. Meanwhile, Oliveira, moving out, is spotted by the Zelnaga. DRG does rotate over in time. Likewise, we do see Oliveira taking control of the northern Zelnaga as well, before pulling back. And Oliveira, he's consolidating his army. How many tanks do we have? Six tanks. And that's a good amount of Cyclones. 32. Is this enough? Can we break this fifth base? The Muta's, they come back in once again. We do have a target in position. Muta goes down. The tanks are sieging. Vipers are not ready. We have four Vipers on the way. We break through the line of Roaches. The Roaches do crumble. DRG caught off guard. Ooh, and the tank shots are going to be brutal. The base is going to go down. DRG cannot save it. The Hydras are exposed as well. No, we get on top of the Hydras. Every single Hydra goes down. Big losses for DRG. Again, he was caught with, the, with his pants down. He was not ready for this. GG gets called, and Oliveira takes game number two. We're going to the ace match. GG. Again, DRG, he did not see the army moving out. Remember, Oliveira, before he moved out, he took both Zelnagas. He took control of both Zelnaga towers. Because of that, DRG did not know if the army was coming from the left or from the right. Did not know where the army was coming from. As a result, his army was split. He had half his army on the left, half his army on the right, which meant that Oliveira could sneak up on one half, shut it down, and then easily deal with the other. So just, again, outmaneuvering DRG, outpositioning him. And Oliveira did snowball out of control. Even though he lost a lot of SCVs, did not matter in the end because he was able to maintain his army and gain so much value over the course of that game. Even though he was losing workers, he wasn't losing Cyclones. The Cyclone count was getting higher and higher over the course of the game itself. So he had a death pool of an army, as we saw. And with that, we're getting into game three. Oh, I see Colossi in the chat. Did someone say Cyclone? Oh, let's go. Catching up in the chat. Three seconds is a long ass time in us in the SC2 fight. It is, it is. Like that three second cooldown is gonna be huge. Um, so again, if you if you and there aren't many of them out there, but if you're in the chat and if you are a cyclone enjoyer, <laughs> if you're a mech enjoyer, enjoy your cyclone while you can, because games like what we just saw aren't gonna be as it's gonna be more difficult to pull off if the changes go through if the Cyclone is going to be patched. But we'll see. 
as we're getting into game number three, as we continue our series and spawning in the top left-hand corner of Side Delta, we have our Chinese Terran player, the Red Terran representing Dragon Kai Z Gaming. It is Oliveira. And spawning in the bottom right-hand corner, we have his opponent, we have the South Korean Zerg player, the Blue Zerg, representing himself being forced into the A-Smash. Oh boy, and can he avoid the mech here in game three? Can he bounce back? It is DRG. Brute force and numbers, exactly, exactly. So I'm just catching up with the chats. Oh yes, um, I do know that the EU and NA uh, last chance qualifier is currently ongoing. Um, if there's a clean feed, we will cast it after this. I am more than willing to to catch up on some Stars War 11 qualifiers after ESL Asia, but we're focusing on ESL Asia because we're the only English stream for this and uh, you know, I, I would not want to hop on over into another tournament. We're focusing on ESL Asia, and then maybe we'll be able to cast uh, some Star Wars 11 after. But now that we're settling in, I saw someone in the chat like, like Clem playing mech? Question mark. Yep, he, he has been playing mech. This is true. <laughs> um, now, what I should say, when I say that, you know, Bjorn, Maru, Clem, uh, all these Oliveira, they've all been embracing mech. I'm not saying that they only play mech, but I'm saying that they whip it out like once in a series. You know, once in a best of, they will whip out mech against Zerg and they use it to great effect. Um, I say once in a series, last week, Bjorn did it every single game against Oliveira in the best of five finals. So he, he really embraced it. Um, and I don't know what happened in game one between Oliveira and DRG. So I don't know if Oliveira has also been playing nothing but mech or if he's still sprinkling in some bio as well. We'll see. We'll find out. We will find out. As Battle Mech or Mass Cyclone can be very devastating on Golden Ore because of the short rush distance. Rush distance by ground is much longer on Psy Delta, so not so certain it's as effective as we are going for a third CC before Starport. Once again, an economic opener. The same economic opener that Oliveira went for in game number two. So, so far, same build. Um, yeah, as we did go for the Reaper first. I was just double checking. <laughs> was just double checking. Yeah, we're going for the Adult Swap. Starport is on the way. Reaper going to be dancing across the map. Third base has been taken, though, and DRG is going to be able to sta stabilize and settle on this three base setup. Here we go. go as uh, for now we're getting into a 111 follow-up already this is looking more biocentric um if you remember we threw down the factory before the starboard in the last game so a very different build here out of Oliveira. thankfully getting into what looks to be an add swap into banshee play 3cc banshee standard play here out of Oliveira. now this can still go into another factory and into mech but this can also lead into bio so my hopes are still up my hopes are still up they're still high here for some man with gun. Gibbs, Bobby Gibbs. As we do see DRG just happily joining up, making his queen, stabilizing here on three bases, and ready to receive what comes next. Does have an overlord across the map to scout. He does spot the Hellion, so he's aware of the 111, or a 111 variation. As the Hellion's gonna be testing the waters, and it is gonna be mech. No! <laughs> Second factory's on the way. We're going for the Cyclones once again. Let's go, Bobby. Let's go. Uh, we have a second factory. It is gonna be Mass Cyclone once again. Now, I still stand by that this opener could have led into bio, and it is a deviation from game number one, no, game number two. We're going for a Raven, not Banshee. Oh, sorry. It was a Banshee first, but into a Raven. We reveal the Banshee as well. So DRG, he's being fed a bit of false information right now. Does look like a standard build. And DRG, he doesn't know what is coming next. He's in the dark. And DRG is getting to 1-1. This is dangerous. 1-1 upgrades. Carapace is almost useless. It's basically useless against Mech. We do need a Roach Horn. We do need melee up... Sorry, range upgrades instead. But again, DRG doesn't know yet. 
He still has yet to piece it together. As we're moving out with Hellions, and again, this Hellion number, this Hellion count, isn't a tell either. Neither is the Raven. As we're moving out with eight Hellions, with the Raven as well, taking down some of those tumors. DRG, does he realize that something is a little bit off? Third base is being taken. I mean, again, as I mentioned, though, like, this this could still be Bayer. This is still, a, like, still could be a standard build. We have seen Gumiho open up in such a way before. As DRG going for a big Ling counterattack. The Hellions are out of position, by the way. Lings, they go straight for the third base. It is exposed, and the Cyclones are revealed. Now we know. Now we know what's going on. We get a mule. We're being forced back. Lair was already on the way. Baleoness was already on the way as well. Gases are being taken, and do we throw down a Roach Warren, or do we commit to Ling Bane? If so, I'm going to be concerned here for DRG. But again, those Cyclones should not have been there. In saying that DRG, upon seeing them, should realize what's been happening. Fast Infestation Pits. Okay. Interesting. Now, right now we're working with pure Ling Bane. And um, we have seen Ling Bane Hydra crumble against this army. The reason why is because of the high attack rate of Cyclones. Fun fact. In the past, in the previous rendition of the Cyclone, Mass Ling used to work quite well um, surrounding and engaging with the Cyclones. Now, because of the attack rate and because of the speed, Mass Ling actually doesn't shut them down anywhere near as well. But we do get a surround the Hellions. Big catch. Big surround here. As DRG catches every single Hellion, they all go down. And suddenly, these Cyclones are much more exposed. They are much more exposed here to the Lings. Big catch there from DRG. Behind this, with the fast infestation bit, we're going to Infestors for Fungal Growths. A good way to lock down the Cyclones. Scan into the natural base. Doesn't see much. Does see the upgrades, and do we get eyes on the Infestors? We don't. The Infestors, they're, yeah, they're going to finish up after the scan runs out. And Fungal Growths are a good way to support this kind of army from DRG. I spoke about how Cyclones, they do really well kiting against Lings. Infestors, they can lock them down, and suddenly we can have a much easier time here. Scan reveals the Infestors! Big moment there. Big scan. Now Olivera knows. Now he knows to be wary and to be careful. And he's going to have to tentatively approach the creep and tentatively pu uh, push on forward. Ling is going to be shut down. So Ling Bane Infestor versus Battle Mech or versus Mass Cyclone. I'm not convinced. I'll be honest. I'm not convinced here by DRG. But you know what? I'm going to let him convince me. Let's go. I want to believe. I have faith that DRG can show us the way. As we're burning through some of this creep here, DRG knocking down those rocks, getting ready for a surround, comes in with a fungal! And he does catch five of those Cyclones. Good catch here, but uh, the rest of the army was out of position, and more Cyclones have arrived. The Lings, they're melting! DRG has to pull back. Now, thankfully, DRG did not lose any Infestors. Yeah, he only lost Lings. 57 Lings so far. Fourth base is being taken as we speak. Additional Cyclones are amassing. Blue Flame is on the way. And DRG, he's going Ling Bane into Ultra. Okay. I see you. Ling Bane into Ultras. They, of course, do such a better job here at collapsing on top of Cyclones. They are that much beefier as well. But this playstyle from DRG is heavily reliant on his creep. And unlike the previous game, DRG didn't lose his Queens. Remember, we spoke about game number two. We spoke about how... Because of the dead queens, that impacted the creep spread, that impacted the production, that meant that DRG had no map control. We can see DRG, he has all the map control right now. The creep is halfway across the map, much better than on Goldenora. And as a result, he has a little more freedom to engage. Here we go. We are amassing outside the base. Oh, trying to break this entrenched position that we have tanks. We have tanks. We have a wall of cyclones as well. Bailings are crashing in. Bailing some decent connections on the Cyclones, but reinforcements have arrived, and we're cleaning up the Ling Bane. Yeah, we're going to be forcing this back. Not the worst trade from DRG, because he only bled out Ling Bane for a couple of tanks and Cyclones. He's keeping the army supply low, shuts down the sensor tower. And more Ultras are on the way. Yeah, 
here we go. We are getting into the Ultras. We need a little bit of time to actually get these upgrades to finish up. Without these upgrades, I do think that the Ultras are vulnerable. So we need 3-3. We need Kindness Plating. Ultra Speed. I think I said Overlord, but Ultras are vulnerable. Uh, we do need Ultra Speed. Meanwhile, Olivera, he's turtling up. We can see him. Sensor Towers, Missile Turrets, a Wall of Tanks, SimCity. This is deviating into less mass cyclone and more turtle mech. We are transitioning to more turtle mech style. We're turtling up, we're hunkering down. Neo still frames, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's the upgrade right there. Neo still frames on the way. That's gonna make just everything a little bit beefier when it comes to the planetaries, the stack defense. Reef getting halfway across the map, or even further encroaching upon the bases. Decent fungal there on the Hellions. And the tanks are exposed. We do shut down two of them. Ooh, only one. And yeah, we do punish this. Fungal once again raises the army. But there's not a lot here for the Zerg. There's not a lot of Ling Bang to support him. We're going to throw away these Ultras. This is a brutal trade for DRG. Every single Ultra goes down. That was an expensive trade there for the Zerg. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not convinced there. That was five Ultras going down. Did we lose all the Infestors? We have one. We have one Infestor left. No Fungals, by the way. Oliveira going for a counterattack, but DRG is rematching with Lings. He has 60 Lings on the way. Oliveira, he has to back up. We have to calm things down. Ling Rumbai comes in. We get a tank. Nice pick up. Tank tells go down. And Oliveira, he does retreat in time. I mean, look at all those Lings. Oliveira, he's getting... Sorry, DRG was getting ready for a surround. Ready to just engulf the army. Speaking of the Lings, they go for a big counterattack. What is there at home to defend? Very little. Oh, the tanks are exposed. Tanks are exposed. One tank is going to be going down. And Oliveira, he's forced back. Now, what's important here is that, yes, Oliveira, he was forced back home and he wasn't able to counterattack, but Oliveira, his worker count has been left untouched. He's on 81 SCVs. He's getting a fifth base. He's double expanding. Oh, man, he's crazy. He is double expanding. But DRG is here to punish these bases. Yeah, hitting both ends at once. That's a kill on the planetary. Big pick up. Main main ultra, the tanks are exposed. Yeah, we're getting on top of the tanks. But we're trying to, but the Sim City a little bit too good. We break through the CC, but the tanks live. Oh my god. A very good trade there for Oliveira. Ah, but I spoke too soon because here comes Ling run by and Oliveira. He's being pulled out of position. 17 SCVs go down. Finally, some economic damage. And did I say 17? 24 SCV kills and counting. Oh my god. DRG finally deals a blow to the economy, and you can see he doesn't stop. He's pulling Oliveira apart left and right, catches the tank, pushes in with the Ultras. Uh, does overextend, though. He's going to be bleeding out some of these Ultras in the, in the retreat. They're quite tanky. One Ultra goes down. The others do make it out. And Oliveira, he's trying to stabilize here. This northern base is still exposed. There's still just a planetary on its own. No sensor tower. We don't see the run by. No. Oliveira, he's a little bit distracted. He's being kept his attention here in the center. Bailings roll in. Big connections. SCVs and mules go down. DRG making sure that the economy stays crippled. But the base survives. Oh, impressive. Base still survive again with without any sensor towers here. You can see that Oliveira is having just a hard time keeping up. What I will say though is that Oliveira he might just opt to go for a super maxed army. He may keep his SV count low and just build up a higher cyclone and tank count. DRG is on 81 workers, taking the center base, taking the northern base as well. And you can see he's poised and ready for another run by towards the north and the south. Switching in. Yeah, the wall has been broken. This time we get on top of the tanks. Three tanks go down. Head for the mineral line as well. That is a lot of cyclones, though. Not the best kiting from Oliveira. Taking, oh, leading out a lot of cyclones. Mainly they're rolling in. 
take down the southern planetary. We take down the northern planetary as well. The fourth and the fifth base go down. Oliveira, he plummets in supply. And DRG, his economy has been left untouched. This entire time, because of the aggression, because of the map control, specifically because of the map control of DRG, he's been able to just knock down these bases time and time again. And now Oliver is all in. At this point, he is all in, pushing deep onto creep. We have Vipers. We have Blinding Clouds. The tanks are they bunched up. Oof. We force some friendly fire. Tanks are going down. We do snipe one of those Vipers. And Oliveira, he's being picked apart. GG gets called. It just becomes too much. And DRG takes the series 2-1, to one, advancing on to the Grand Finals. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to DRG as he takes down Oliveira here, having a much stronger early to mid game, able to maintain his queens, able to maintain his creep, and hold on to that map control. And you could see that Oliveira, he barely had any presence on the map. His sensor towers were knocked down time and time again. We should have seen them being rebuilt. We didn't, though. They weren't rebuilt because of that Oliveira. He was reacting to the, to the harassment instead of being proactive and, and being able to split up his army and be in position in time. He was just one step behind. When it came to the harassment, Oliveira was one step behind. He was always late to the party. And DRG was able to take full advantage of Oliveira there, pulling him apart. GG. Well played. Well played. We have our finals. It is going to be a Zerg versus Protoss with Hero versus DRG. Let's go. And I need a bit of time to set that up. Give me one momento, por favor. Uh, as it is going to be a best of five. Best of five grand finals. Huh. Party is being made. And Hero has been patiently waiting. This entire time he's been patiently waiting here for his next opponent. And Hero is coming in as the heavy favorite. Hero, he is, I would say, the best Protoss in the world right now. I do think that he has surpassed. At, at times, you would like argue between Max Pax and Hero, but currently, I would confidently say that Hero is the best Protoss in the world. And uh, he is poised to take another weekly. Can he be stopped? Can DRG do what Dark could not? It's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be an uphill battle. But again, DRG took down Creator, he took down Gumiho, he took down Oliveira. These are not easy opponents. DRG, he has earned his way here to the finals. Worked hard for it. But can he go all the way? Can he become this week's ESL Open Cup Asia champion? Quite a proto stands in his way. <laughs> we'll set up for it. We will set up. And predictions will soon be open. Give me a moment to get those predictions going here. Hero versus DRG. Okay. Uh, currently, vetoes are underway. Um, it looks like our vetoes are Equilibrium from Hero. Radis Station from DRG. Makes sense. Solaris, Golden Aura. The maps that we expect to be vetoes to be vetoed have fallen by the wayside. And we have our map order. Here we go. We have Hard Letters game number one. Oceanborn is game number two. Alkyone for game three. Uh, Sight Delta for game four. And Hecate for game five. Again, the players that were quick to, to conduct their vetoes, quick to dive into this, the Grand Finals. It all comes down to this one final series here for this broadcast. I mentioned before that um, the, the Stars War 11 qualifier is currently ongoing, and I might embrace that after this, uh, if there was a clean feed. So, after this cast, we might dive right into another. The StarCraft continues, Papi, it continues. Let's go.
as the lobby has been made and we are loading in to Hardland. Let's go. And uh, hopefully we're okay. Again, we're being joined by all of our lovely co-casters here from different languages. We have Inu and Korean. We have Glide, of course. We have Goka. We have Saber, casting in Chinese. I do love to see it. Is there a clean feed? Oh, I don't see one. But regardless, here we go. We're getting into the grand finals. It all comes down to this. It all comes down to these two amazing players. And if you're in the chat, predictions are open. Place your bets on how you think this series will unfold and who you think will be this week's champion. Predictions open. There you go. And spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Hardled, we have our South Korean Protoss player, the Red Protoss, representing Dragon Kaizy Gaming. It is Hero. And spawning in the top left-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the South Korean Zerg player, the Blue Zerg, representing himself. Currently teamless, but deserving to be on the team, making it all the way to the Grand Finals here. Going for a 15-15, it is DRG. As a DRG, he's been very fond of this opener. He's been embracing the 15-15 quite often here in the Zerg versus Protoss matchup. For those that are curious, it is a 15 hatchery into an extractor trick, or extractor trick first into a 15 hatchery, into another extractor trick, into a 15 spawning pool. This is just a way to get your natural base on location without being disturbed. If you've been watching ZVP over the past couple of years, you would know that it has become standard for Protoss players to move out with their first probe to get here before the expansion gets thrown down, and for the Zerg player to expand elsewhere at the third base location. It became very meta and very standard, but with the advent of the 1515 opener that is no longer the case, there are players like DRG that are willing to be a little bit less economic and just be safer in general. So with this, the hatchery is on location, and with this, the spawning pool does finish. The downside of this build is that your gases are late, so link speed is delayed. As uh, your real gas geyser is quite later than normal. With link speed being delayed, it means you are less aggressive, uh, and you can't really harass and punish the third base as much as you would like. That's the downside here. So much more of a defensive passive opener out of DRG. Meanwhile, behind this, Hero going for his Gate Expand into his tech of choice, and it is going to be a Stargate Opener. Okay. Now, with this Stargate Opener, this should be for Oracles. Should be for an Oracle-based Opener. But we casted Hero versus Dark earlier today, and we saw that Hero, he is willing to embrace a Void Ray Opener instead. So, could be either or, but should be Oracle. We'll see. We shall see. we go as Ling is going to be shut down in the main likewise Ling did scout and did confirm the Stargate opener not, not aware of the initial units but aware of the Stargate and there it is Oracle is on the way so it looks like a standard build here from Hero just going for an Oracle opener into a third base into triple Oracle into Twilight Council Forge so nothing too crazy here out of Hero meanwhile DRG just settling into his three base setup spreading his creep joining up as well Everything's looking as it should. Is DRG the real Dong Regu? Yes. I see some people asking in the chat. Uh, yes, it was a couple of years ago that uh, Dong Regu officially name changed to DRG. Fun fact. I, I remember um, ca casting him and calling him Dong Regu, and, and uh, eventually we were corrected. I think, even, uh, I think to be fair, I think uh, we asked Crank about it, and Crank said that. He's okay with either one. <laughs> but uh, I think officially is DRG now. Which, I mean, people would call him it back in the day anyway. Would call him that anyway. As we do get us around there on the first two adepts. Good catch from DRG. Meanwhile, behind this, third base is on the way for Hero. And he is going to be moving out with his oracles. DRG, he's droning. He's not making lings, so he will not punish the dead adepts. He won't be able to harass this third. As oracles, oh my god, they dive on top of the queen! And they do get a kill. Queen goes down. 
Oracle did take a lot of hits, did take a lot of damage. But a good pickup nonetheless by Hero. Slowing down that queen count, forcing another to be built. Across the map, everyone's being shut down. There's that transition that we spoke about. It's going to be a forge and a twilight council. Should be plus one and blink on the horizon here for Hero. Charge is also a viable follow-up, but I imagine it's going to be blink. We'll see. We shall see. As there it is, blink is on the way for Hero. Behind this, third base is getting up and running. We are getting it up, and Hero is still just being active with these oracles, picking off whatever he can. Gets a couple of drones in the main, gets three, gets four. Oh my god. Four workers in the main base, plus a queen. And I believe Hero, yeah, he has not lost a single oracle so far. Good damage dealt. And DRG, again, it's on him to minimize his losses. And has been having a hard time. Behind this, that's a Bane Nest, not a Roach Warren. Uh, this could be Ling Bane into, into Hydras, by the way. This could be a Hydra based composition from DRG as he has avoided the Roach Warren. Yeah, no Roach Warren out of DRG. Oracle, they do slip in. Looking for more damage. Lings are amassing. We're setting up for a big counter attack. Yeah, 20 more Lings on the way. And we're, what, we're going for the all-in. Okay, now we know it's going to be a Ling Queen. Oh, sorry, a Ling Bane Queen all-in out of DRG. He's cut workers. He's not making any more drones. Cutting workers at 52. It's a three-base all-in from our Zerg player. And Hero has yet to confirm. No shield batteries, by the way. No shield battery at the natural. One shield battery here at the third base. He doesn't know what's happening. Doesn't know what's going on. Drones are going down, but we don't care. We dive in the army. Bailey's are rolling in. They're going for the middle line. The stalkers, they get surrounded. They get shut down. Blink is not done. The oracles fall as well. The Bailey's, they don't quite bust in. But damage is being dealt. And Hero, he's caught with his pants down. He wasn't ready for this. The shield battery's depowered. Ay, 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 ay. And every stalker falls. Yeah, DRG just catching Hero off guard. The Queens are slowly pushing on forward here. Zoning back the army. We are throwing down additional shield batteries, but the Ling run by the Ling flood, it doesn't end. It does not stop. And we get into the main base. Hero, he did amazingly with his Oracle Harass. He was killing so many workers, he killed a queen, but it didn't even matter because we just went for the all-in anyway. Shield battery goes down. Wait, are we holding? We're, Bobby, we're holding! Hero! <laughs> Who needs shield batteries? Who needs an overcharge when every queen is going to be going down? The mineral line is left safe and sound. He may have lost stalkers, but Hero, he survives. Oh my god. Looking at the units lost tab, that was 85 lings. And we, again, we killed the shield batteries. We denied the overcharge. We were killing stalkers. But the blink control there and the positioning from Hero was just too good. And as soon as I saw the lings fall, I was like, hold up. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Something's not quite right. Hero, he survives. And he barely lost anything, and now he's miles ahead. Hero, he's miles ahead. DRG, he just starts up with his lair. He just starts up his Roach Warren. Plus one carapace is on the way. He's droning. This is all so late. Like, DRG, he has a lot of catching up to do. Ay, ay, ay. I thought I thought that was it. I was about to say that DRG, he's doing what Dark could not. If you remember, Dark also failed an all-in against Hero. But it looks like DRG does the same. As Hero now, he's just settling into plus two. Prism is on the way to go for a big counterattack. The wall is up and running. How many gateways do we have? We have eight gates. Oh, God. Oh, we have eight gateways. We have so much here to push out across the map. DRG trying to do whatever he can. He will get the Cybercore. Nice pick off. Cybercore goes down. That does mean that we can't reinforce with Stalkers, but we can warp in Zealots. And here comes the counterattack. Hero. He has so much to work with. There we go. Zelts are on the way. Lings are trying to engage. Stay strap goes off. We have an Oracle to support. It should be focused down. But Hero, he's cleaning this up. The Lings, we're running out of steam. We're running out of army. DRG in a lot of trouble. We dive on top of the Queens. GG gets called. And Hero will take game number one. GG. What's crazy about what just happened? Hero had no idea what was happening. Remember, he if he had seen this coming ahead of time, we would have seen more shield batteries. We would have seen a stronger response as we saw against Dark. 
but Hero had the one shield battery that got depowered instantly. The overcharge was wasted on the shield battery. We had two more on the way in a panic, right? We were warping in desperately here back at home. Hero should have been dead in the water, but no. He says no, not today. He lives, he survives, and he bounces back hard. GG, Hero takes a 1-0 lead. And I'll be honest, that's a bit of a de demoralizing loss there for, for DRG. Where, like, I mean, what more could you have hoped for, right? Like, th there was no scout. There was no preparation. There was one. There was no shield battery. Because the one shield battery that was, the one shield battery that was there was depowered instantly as well. Like, that was best case scenario for DRG. And it still failed. That's scary. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit concerning. Oh, boy. And here we go, we're getting into game two. It's gonna be on Ocean War. My heart goes out to DRG. Really does. And uh yeah, we'll see if he can hold on to his mentality here. Can bring it back. <laughs> and here we go. We're getting into our next game. We're getting into... Sorry, just catching up with the chat. We're getting into game number two. And spawning in the top left-hand corner, we have the South Korean Protoss. The red Protoss player representing Dragon Kai Z. Gaming, leading the series 1-0, surviving the all-in in game one. And looking damn impressive in the aftermath. We have Hero. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have as opponent, we have the South Korean Zerg player. Once again, going for a 15-15 opener. We have the blue Zerg DRG. And again, hopefully he can just shake off game one, reset his mindset, come into this with a cool, calm, and collected head, and bounce back in game number two. As a reminder, it's a best of five. It is a best of five grand finals. Plenty of games ahead of us. Plenty of opportunity for DRG to bounce back. I want to believe. So once again, it is a 15-15. Hatchery into our spawning pool. Into delayed gases here for our Zerg player. Hero scouts and Hero confirms. So Hero should be feeling pretty safe. And with that, we are going to be settling in. As Hero, he's going for a gate expand into his Cybercore here on the low ground. Getting into his standard opener. Meanwhile, DRG settling in as well. Which is going to be calming things down. And easing into game number two for now. I don't expect Hero to deviate too much based on the pylon placement. Uh, we could go for something like Twilight Council, but I'm feeling a Stargate opener once again out of Hero into Oracle. There's no reason for him to really switch things up. Can just play out his game. Really, my eyes are on DRG. I almost said dark. My eyes are on DRG here. How do we adjust and what do we whip out on Oceanborn? Now, we spoke about Oceanborn in the Dark series about how all ins are a lot more commonplace here on this map. And um, Dark even attempted this, attempted an all in on Hero on Oceanborn, which did fail. Um, and a big reason as to why it can work a little bit better is because there is no point of elevation there's no high ground advantage at the third base likewise not really at the natural either the ramp to get up to the same point of elevation at the third is here in the center of the map so you can actually water your queens across commit with a roach push a roach all in and you can achieve quite a lot of success with it at the same time as i mentioned that i feel like drg should be playing a much more standard game here after a failed all in do we really all in two games in a row i'm not really feeling that we'll see We'll see how DRG approaches this. But now Adept is moving out across the map. Both Adepts even are going to be moving out. Lings are amassing for DRG. As a reminder, because of the late gas, um, Hero, he's safe. Like, he's safe to just poke and prod himself as he commits to the shade. My apologies there. 
a bit of an overextension. I was not expecting Hero to just dive right on in. I was going to say that he can dance on the edge of creep. He can deny uh, creep tumors and, you know, be safe against the Lings. But Hero, he bleeds out in depth adept very early on. A little bit distracted. Ling run by does get eyes on the Oracle opener. DRG aware of what's going on. And a pretty nice start. Pretty good start here from DRG. Kill the adept. Getting into Ling speed. And we'll see if DRG can punish this throw. Meanwhile, the Oracle rotating into the main. Manages to get one drone. Oh, almost gets a second. Does get a second worker as well. Good damage dealt here by Hero. Gets two drones, backs up. Likewise, the third base across the map is going to be threatened. Here we get a surround. DRG sees an opportunity. He pounces on it. He does get the Adept. Good pickups here by DRG. Across the map, Oracle tried to go in, was deflected. And DRG, he doesn't deny, he doesn't delay the third base, but he does get a couple of adapts. Like, these are efficient trades. Very efficient trades here by our Zerg player. Oh. As the Oracle dips in, gets one drone. Nothing too major from Hero yet. Still threading those bases. Going for the stasis in the main base, and DRG, does he react? He does! Does pull away in time. Only one drone is stasis, and from there, Hero, he can back off behind this, getting to his transition. Or setting up for it as he throws down additional gateways. Actually, okay, so he delays his Twilight Council, he delays the Forge in favor of a big warping of Adepts. Or he's going to be harassing with the Adepts instead, for now. He also went for a fourth Oracle, oh my god! He went up to four oracles, denies the fourth. Okay, Hero trying to redeem himself for his earlier losses. Oracles threatening that fourth base once again. At the same time, two oracles, they dive into the, into the natural. We got four workers and back up. Good damage dealt so far. Not a single oracle has fallen. And we're going into Scow, oh my god! <laughs> I was waiting for the tech. I'm like, yo, this Twilight Council is late, and it's because we don't have one. We're going for a Stargate and a Fleet Beacon. We're rushing into Sky Toss. Hero, he's an animal. And he's still doing more damage. Oh my god, the Oracle <gasps> survives. One HP does get away. We've killed nine drones so far. The Oracle barely does live. We can regenerate those shields. We still have two more Oracles harassing here on the right-hand side. As a reminder, two Oracles do want your drones. We're going for the Queen. Oh my god, we're going for the queen, and we do not escape! Again, the revelation was a little bit too greedy there. The oracle goes down. Another did barely survive on 4 HP as well. But we bleed out finally one oracle, but again, that's a little bit scary. So, this playstyle from Hero, he's being as aggressive as possible. He's just being as assertive as he can to keep DRG pinned back while Hero is greedy. Again, Hero does not have charge, no blink, no immortal production, no colossi. He's going straight for a fourth base, and he's rushing into carriers. Like, this is his army. This is all he has. Like, a handful of adepts and two stalkers. That's all he has. But he's getting away with it. Like, DRG's droning. DRG, he's droning. He's resaturating his bases. He doesn't have much of an army himself. He can't push. He can't harass. Bailiness on the way, plus two. Roach speed. 11 drones in production. There is no sign here that DRG is going to be pushing. There's no sign here at all, which means Hero is fine. He's safe and sound. And he gets away with it. I, or he, or he's, he's getting away with it. Lings are going to be poking in. They do threaten the natural, but we do have a full wall. Ling gets eyes on the fourth base. And we have yet to reveal our hand. Again, the carriers, they're hidden in the main base. We still don't know what's going on. DRG, he's spreading creep. He's amassing roaches. No hydrogen, no spire. DRG has no idea that he needs to prepare for the incoming Skytos army. And the question becomes, when will he find out? When will DRG figure things out here? The sooner it is, the better. The later, the worse. Oh, boy. As we do end up throwing down a Spire. I believe this is for Mutas. I believe we have yet to really determine. Oh, I say that. 
we may have caught a glimpse of the, of the carriers. We may have. As DRG is running up to 80. And he's amassing a Ling Ravager army. Now the question becomes, yes, we have Skytoss. And yes, Ling Roach doesn't do anything to these carriers. But we could still break a base. We could still kill the fourth, or the natural, or the third. And here we go. Here we go. The army hasn't spotted. Stasis Trap does go off. Catches some of those things. Roaches are pushing forward. Though we dive on top of the Stalkers. And again, there are only two Stalkers on the ground. Force fields are thrown down. Carriers are revealed. And the Roaches are desperately trying to bust into the mineral line. Good Force fields, though, at a hero. Here come the Bailings. The Bailings are rolling in. And they do bust in. 16 probes go down. Good damage is dealt. And yes, the Carriers will clean this up. But with the completion of this spire, we're getting into Corruptor production. And we get a kill on the Nexus. It was an expensive trade, though. You can see DRG plummet in supply. He threw away a lot of his army to kill a base. And now here comes a counterattack. And how many carriers? Six. A six carrier counterattack. We have 12 Corruptors to defend, plus Queens. Is that enough? Because it's, it's from six to eight. Yeah, two more carriers just now finishing up. Void Rays as well. We can always recall. Queens are amassing. Corruptors are popping out just in time. And DRG, can we hold on? Corruptors are revealed. At the same time, a big link counterattack. Hitting the third base to do recall in time. And we save every single carrier. Clutch recall there at a hero. Oh! That is a cancel. That is a cancel on the third base. Once again, DRG did throw away a little supply to make that happen. And now it isn't just mass carrier. Now there's a mothership. Now there are void rays on the way to help deal with the corruptors. Hero's economy isn't amazing, but I still would say it's comparable to that of DRGs. I mean, I say that we have 80 workers for DRG. Hero, I believe, is long distance mining. Doesn't have efficient mining going on right now. DRG is remaxing. The Zerg player is gonna be is gonna be able to max out first. We have 19 Corruptors, soon to be 25. That's a lot of Corruptors. They are on 0-0. Zero, zero. They're soon to be on plus one carapace. That is true. The upgrades are a little bit lacking, but the quantity is there. It's still a lot of Corruptors. Now, what does Hero need? Void Rays. And Void Rays and Archons, but we are lacking in a ground army entirely, and we're going for a big counterattack. Run into the Corruptors. We spot the main army. We commit here across the map to the fourth. Bailings are crashing in. Hero, he's out of position. The fourth base is going to go down. A big pick up there. From DRG. That is a kill in the Nexus. Now, what I should mention here. Yes, Hero, he is down in economy. He's down in bases. Like He's hurting economically. But his army... We haven't lost any of our Skytoss units. We've lost Oracles, yes, but we haven't lost a single carrier. The carrier army, the Skytoss army, it's building up and it's getting better and better. So even though Hero, he's struggling and he's being forced all in, this push could still end the game. This move out could end the game. DRG may have to resort here to a base trade. As we are pushing forward, how many Corruptors we have? 27. Slow zone is thrown down. Prismatic Lyman is going to be activated. And the Void Rays are going down. One after the other. Void Rays, they are falling. And it looks like we have enough to hold on. DRG shuts down the army. Gets one, gets two carriers and the mothership as well. They force the all in. And DRG, he does have enough. I believe. Oh, it's getting close. Yeah, we're down to four carriers. And, that, and we have reinforcements. We have 11 more Corruptors on the way. And at the same time, the third base has been broken. It was all or nothing for Hero. It was all or nothing. And now he's running out of supply, running out of army. He almost has nothing. And we have a series. Hero trying to spice things up, rushing into Skytoss. He is punished for it. GG gets called and DRG takes game number two. Let's go. Let us go. We are going into a tied-up series. Not quite an ace match. You know, it's a best of five, so not quite an ace match, but TRG does put a point on the board. He does fight back.
Very important here that he stops Hira from getting too much momentum. And getting too out of hand. GG. Again, rushing into Skytos is a risky thing to do. And even though the initial Roach Ravager, even though the initial ground push from the Zerg player wasn't able to kill any carriers or deal any damage to the army, we did kill the third. Very important here, though. Essentially, we forced the all-in. We killed the third. We killed the fourth. We denied the economy. It was all or nothing for Hero. And with that, we're tied up. We're going to game three. Going to game number three. Again, we'll see if we can, or we'll see who gains momentum in this series. We'll see who can take a lead here. Will it be our Zurich player or our Protoss? We're getting into our next game and spawning in the bottom left hand corner of Alkyon and we have our South Korean Protoss player, the Red Protoss representing Dragon Kai Z Gaming, being forced into a tied up series. It is Hero. And spawning in the top right hand corner we have his opponent, we have the South Korean Zerg player, the Blue Zerg representing himself, going for a 12 pool. Oh my god, <laughs> going for a 12 pool. It's is D R G. Let's go. Okay. Interesting. So D R G going to be opening up quite aggressively here on Alkyone. Interesting choice. We'll see what he can what he can accomplish with this. As the spawning pool is about to finish up, Overlord is on the way. Hero skirting around the edge of the map. Interesting scouting pattern here. Oh, he's got oh my wait. Oh my god. We have a cannon rush from Hero against a 12 pool. Wings are amassing, by the way. And what's important here is that I believe we should be able to defend if we get a if we get a read on what's going on. Hero, he does see lack of expansion. Ah, uh, he's checking the gold. Ay, 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 he's checking the gold base, which means he won't see the lings. Or will he? The probe heads on over. We're checking for the gold base. It has not been taken. Hero, a little bit puzzled about what's going on. And that means that the probe scout misses the lings. We don't see how early that spawning pool is, but he goes for it. There we go. He walls off. He's going for a zealot. He does see the base. He does see the lings. He now knows what's going on. And he fully walls off. Second pylons on the way. Cannon as well. Now, again, what's important is that this gate forge opener... It should be fine here against the 12 pool. Should be perfectly fine. The Lings, they apply some pressure. Cannon's about to finish. And Hero will defend. But remember, he wanted to Cannon Rush, but <laughs> And he has no natural base. His Nexus is heavily delayed here. So I want to give the to DRG. DRG, he may not have dealt any damage, but he disrupted the plan of Hero. He stopped the Cannon Rush. He delayed the expansion, forced a big reaction. And we're in an interesting game state. So, on the one hand, yes, Hero's Nexus is very late, but so is DRG's, right? The Zerg player's hatchery is also quite delayed, and now we're stuck droning as hard as we can. Again, a very interesting game state where both players are just trying to get back into their economy as quickly as possible. Ooh, that is a fast boss. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean... We have the Forge. May as well make use of it. May as well make use of it here. As Hero, he's going for a very fast plus one. Uh, this could lead into a two base all in, by the way. Like, this this could hit hard. Adept is going to be able to waddle away. Remember, there are no gases here for DRG. Gases, gas income has been quite delayed. So, no Ling speed. There's that Twilight Council. It's going to be a Twilight Council opener. It makes sense because of the plus one. This could be charge. This could be a plus one charge all in, or it could be a plus one blink all in. I don't expect Glaives with plus one. That typically doesn't really make much sense. Uh, plus one upgrades don't really benefit Glaive Adepts as much as it does the other units. So we'll see. We'll see what Hero goes for as DRG is taking his third base. 
again, just droning up as best as possible. I'm just really curious to see what we go for. And there we go. It's Blink. It is going to be a Blink opener. So Blink first. This should be leading into a Gateway Explosion. I mean, here he could just take a third and go for a longer game and go for a plus two timing. But I feel like we want to be assertive early on. I feel like we want to be in the face of DRG. We'll see. As the probe is moving out. Hey, he's taking a third. He's crazy. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. We're going for a third base. This is a really interesting dynamic here because, again, there's no gateway explosion. There's no harass across the map. There's no scouting either. We skip the adept, so no adept scout. Or well, the adept is chilling here back at home defending against the lings. We're getting into the mid game. Okay. We're getting into the mid game. We're not hitting a timing with plus one, but we can hit a timing with plus two. We can get into a really fast plus two instead. Meanwhile, DRG throwing down his own Roach Warren at around the four minute 50, four minute 40 mark. Standard timing here from DRG. Or I should say more of a safe timing here from DRG. It is going to be droning up a little bit as he is making a decent amount of links. Good chunk of links on the way. DRG, it looks like he wants to try to punish his third. Can he force a cancel? Can he deny the third base? Links, they have been spotted. Link Stalkers, they're not ideal to defend, I'll be honest. They struggle against Mass Ling. But we do have a shield battery. We do warp in. Lings, they do collapse on this. They go straight for the shield battery. Stalkers, not where they need to be. Ooh, and this is dangerous. We can go straight for the Stalkers as well. Yeah, GRG wreaking havoc with these Lings. And expanding is going to be so difficult. We do throw down the force field. The boys are being pulled. And uh, pretty good force fields actually here out of Hero. Does minimize that surface area, does barely defend. Whew, that was... <laughs> I'll be honest, any lesser player most likely would have lost their Stalkers there. They would have lost their Stalkers and maybe even more than that. Plus two is now on the way. We have the Bay for Colossus production. Hero building up his third. Again, just a really odd game state here from Hero. But I'm here to embrace it. I'm, re I'm ready for it. Give, Bobby, give. Here we go. As both players are backing off, they're saturating. Do you have our fourth on the way? Um, I'm just concerned here by DRG constantly making more links. <laughs> like, he's amassing... Quite an army here. He's cutting workers at three base saturation at 66. But there we go. Now he's going to be droning up his fourth. Just delayed his droning. Going for the spire. Observer somehow slips into the main. DRG sees. He's trying to hunt it down. The observer. Do we scout the spire? Oh, we do. Big scout here for Hero. He does get eyes on the spire. He knows what's going on. Does have blink at least. But he will need a stargate. Glorious combat. So Hero is aware. Lings, they take control of the Zonaga. Moving out. Um, I'm hoping that Hero clicked on it. I'll be honest, I'm not sure if he did. The Observer saw the Spire, but did Hero see the Spire? Because if he didn't click on it, this could look like a Spore. That's the problem here. The Spire can sometimes look like a Spore if you don't really pay attention. And I don't see a Stargate from Hero. Uh oh. The main base is vulnerable, the natural is vulnerable, no side defense either. That would be a sign that Hero would know what's going on. He hasn't reacted. The side defense is only here at the fringe bases. Ah, he a hero! <laughs> As instead, he's going to be focusing on his push. I mean, he's building up towards the second Colossus. He's pushing forward. I mean, making mutas right now, we can't quite pull it off. Hero! He is going to be committed. Pushing right through the center. DRG forced to make roaches, not mutas. Does catch a queen. Warping in with additional stalkers. And again, if Hero did see, then his answer to that is going to be to try to break DRG before he can actually make use of those mutas. Lock Rambai is coming in. 
Ooh, and this is forcing Hero back home. Back home. He's turning all the way back around. And doesn't want to lose his fourth. Despite Hero's posturing, Jin commits. Yeah, forced to turn around. And now DRG, he can make meters. He can invest. There it is. 13 meters are on the way. He has the room. He has the breathing room for this. Hero is still moving out. Still moving out. Dives on those roaches. Oh. We diving on the roaches so far. Decent blinks here out of Hero. Good force fields as well. Shuts down some of those roaches. Breaking the base itself. Yeah, the hatchery is going to be going down. DRG cannot engage. At the same time, Ling Rumbai gets deflected. And Hero, we got to go here and now. As were the meters. Are oh, they moving out across the map? They're moving out across the map, which means DRG has even less of him to defend. Can he hold? Can he hold on as the Muse? They get across the map. They get into the fourth base. They deny any kind of mining. DRG trying to set up a surround. Collapsing on the army. Goes straight for the Colossi. He goes for the Colossi, but it's not going to be enough. Hero, he has too much. He's breaking through the Colossi. They stand strong. And yes, even though the Mutas, they do a lot of damage across the map, it doesn't even matter. The Roach Ravager crumbles. GG gets called, and Hero, he will take a lead in the series 2-1. to one. GG. Whew. GG, well, play well played. What's the best defense? A good offense at times. As Hero, his response here to Mutas is to just be in the face of the Zerg player. Make sure that you can punish them if they do make Mutas, as we saw. That was a lot of resources invested in the mutas that were deal it was dealing economic damage, true, but it wasn't helping the defense, and we needed everything possible to hold on as Hero snowballed out of control. Again, with a pretty good upgrade lead because of the fast plus one. Did manage to break through. GG, well played. Hero is now one game away from taking the series, from becoming this week's champion. DRG has to fight back here and now to force the ace match. Can he do it? Can he pull it off? See in chat, he clicked on it. Thank God, thank God. Did click on it. Thank God. I did see in the chat someone saying that um, apparently the finals of the Stars War 11 qualifier is currently ongoing, um, which would be really good. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're busy with our own finals. We're busy with our own finals. And here we go. We're getting into this. But, um, yeah, I hope uh, the matches over there are good. Wish the best of luck to all those players looking to qualify. As spawning in the top left-hand corner of Site Delta, we have our South Korean Protoss player, the Red Protoss, representing Dragon Kai Z Gaming, leading the series 2-1, one game away from becoming this week's ESL Open Cup Asia champion. Onomas is all he needs. Here he is. It is Hero. The best Protoss in the world. And spawning in the bottom right-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the South Korean Zerg player, the Blue Zerg. Was able to fight back earlier, but now... He's up against the wall. One more loss, and he is out of the finals. The series will end. The pressure is on. Can he bounce back? It is DRG. This time, deviating away from the 12th pool into a 15-15. Thank God. <laughs> oh, my. It was crazy for him to go for a 12th pool in the last game, but this time going for a much safer opener instead. We're calming things down as we're easing into game number four. Likewise, Hero doesn't go for a Forge, setting up for a Gate Expand. Like, both players were memeing things up in the last game, but now we're calming things down. Back to the Epic still, exactly. Magnath, he knows, Bobby, he knows. catching up. Hero is allergic to being passive. He is. <laughs> huh? 
He is, Papi. It's it's just against his nature. To be defensive, to be macro-oriented, no, 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 no. You gotta be in your face. Kiber, he's an animal. But we like him for it. That's why he's so great. <laughs> you know, sure, you got your more macro standard players like Showtime out there. Even Max Pax is more akin to that. But Hero, he's all about the chaos. He's all about mixing it up. I mean, hey, how often have you seen a cannon rush in pro play? I mean, Hero didn't pull it off, but he wanted to. That's what I will say. He wanted to pull it off. Did want to whip out those cannons. Uh, maybe next game. If we do go to the ace match. It's possible. For now, we're going to be getting to our openers. We have our tech of choice. It's going to be a Stargate here from Hero. Should be Stargated to Oracle. It's what we've been seeing quite a lot of in this series so far. Outside of the last game. Because of the forge. But we shouldn't be seeing too much deviation from Hero. And there it is. It is going to be the Oracle opener. Leading into additional Oracles. Triple Oracle into a third base. Into the mid game. So send that opener out of Hero. Meanwhile, DRG just going to be joining. We'll be keeping an eye on his gas income. We'll be keeping an eye on his Roach Warren timing. Um, because if he does throw it down a little bit earlier on, then it could be indicative of an all-in. Outside of that, it's just happily saturating his bases as well. We're just sailing on into it. We're easing our way in towards a longer macro game. We'll see if Hero is going to be able to pop off with his Oracle Harass. Likewise, we'll see if DRG can delay the third. For now, third base is on the way. Adepts are being kept at home. Hero, he doesn't even try to harass with the Adepts. He does keep them back. Meanwhile, the Oracle moves out. Running into some Queens. Two Queens at the natural. We have two Queens in the main. A third base is on the way. DRG so far, perfectly safe and sound. Does minimize his losses. Evo Chamber's on the way. That should be for plus one melee. Should be for melee. As Hero doesn't shade across. Does cancel. And again, it's on DRG to keep up with the movement of these units. Both the Oracle and the Adept. Adept cancels the shade. Oracle's a dive in. We get two. We get two drones. We catch some transferring workers as well. Ooh, five, six drones go down. Big catch there from Hero. DRG was holding on, but he we saw a weak point. We saw a juicy mineral line. And six drones go down, and we barely take any hole damage. A very good start here, a very strong start from Hero, as he shuffles around his his oracles, moving out with his adepts. The aggression has only just begun. You have six adepts and two oracles. If we see an opportunity, we could even dive on top of the on top of a queen. We could go for a queen's a bit out of position. That's a kill on the spore. A kill on the spore. Lings are going down. Stasis Trap is denied. Ooh, the Oracles, they take a lot of hits. But the Adepts, they break through the Lings and they're getting into the middle line. Drones are going down. Ooh, we shade into the natural. That's going to be seven worker kills here. The Adepts, they have been popping off. Really good positioning here in the middle line. The Oracles, they pull back. And the Adepts are being cleaned up. But that was seven kills in total. We actually shaded into the main. And we're going for the Stasis. Doesn't quite connect. Now, this is going to trigger a counterattack. DRG, he just cleaned up all the adepts. He can move out across the map, but back at home, we are ready. We have Stalkers. We have a shield battery on the way. We still have an Oracle as well up in the air. Hero is going to be able to hold. So, pretty good damage so far. Looking at the units lost. That's. Oh my god. <laughs> That's 13 drone kills. Did I say 13? 16. 16 worker kills here for 6 adepts and 15 lings as well. Very good start for Hero. Behind this, he's going to be working towards Blink and plus 1. We have a gateway explosion on the way. I believe that's going to be yep, 8 gates in total. Oh, Hero going to be very aggressive here with 8 gate Blink. And there we go. The pylon is being set up to reinforce. This looks like a 3 base all in from Hero. An 8 AK blink can be brutal. And Hero, he has momentum. He already has a lot of momentum on his side. Blink and plus one about to finish up. Rocks are being knocked down just so we can keep reinforcing. Would you come across the gateway? Yeah, we cancel the 8th gateway. Sorry, the ninth gateway. But it is being rebuilt. And now DRG knows. 
the Zerg player knows what's going on. He's amassing roaches, but it's easier said than done as we have the supply blocks. There we go. Five more overlords on the way. We break free. Just getting ready to just make nothing but army. And it's on DRG to survive. Stalkers are pushing in. Oh, the oracles, they did waste some of their energy there. Did waste it. Warping in six stalkers at a time. That's a, that's a lot of stalkers. Go on. We focus down some ravages. Good target firing there out of hero. Lings, they come in from behind. They do collapse here on top of these stalkers, but good reaction. They blink away. The wilds. Ah, we needed a couple more. Wilds, they're barely not enough. Lings, they do collapse on top of the pylon. They depowered the, the gateway. They shut down the reinforcements. Big pick up there by DRG. And we get a surround. We almost do. And we force the on siege. And DRG's holding. Is holding on at the same time. We do have adepts across the map. Not like this. The adepts, they get nine drone kills here at the natural. And again, if Hero wasn't forced or if his warping wasn't denied, then maybe he breaks DRG. It was close. Regardless, the economy has been crippled. Hero, he's actually up in workers, and he's working on plus one armor, second forge, charges on the way. Hero, he's working on the next step. And there it is. Zealots are warping into reinforce. DRG, he is surviving, but this is not an easy hold by any means. Bleeding out some roaches. We have a big lane counterattack. We have a warbit available. Shield battery goes down. Cannon as well. But we do defend. Yeah, the links, they don't deal any economic damage. But Hero does pull back. And there's the fourth. I was waiting for it. I was like, when is Hero going to expand and take a fourth base? Now he is. Takes a fourth. Opens up his natural. The aggression is ended. The aggression has subsided. Hero, he backs up. Again, this was essentially a three base all in out of Hero. Didn't kill DRG, but it did deal some economic damage. And he's not done. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah, never mind. No, he didn't rebuild. He didn't rebuild the shield battery or the cannon. Lings, they come in. They get us around on the forge. Hero, he's racing back home. The forge is shut down. Is killed. Destroyed. At the same time, Hero trying to push forward, gets surrounded. Gets caught out. But who catches who as Hero is going to be able to punish some of these Ravagers? Does focus three of them down. Ooh, even getting a fourth Ravager. Very good pickoffs. Hero, he still maintains his economic lead. The reality is that he did so much economic damage that even though he wasn't able to break DRG, it doesn't matter. He's still ahead. Second Robo is on the way to the bay as well for Colossus production. Good juggling there out of Hero. Ling Rabbi comes in. The side defense isn't done. Ooh, probes are going down. Hero, he's across the map. That's going to be 11 dead workers. Good run by out of DRG. This hero pulls back. Zella drop into the main base. Zella run by towards the fourth. Ooh, and DRG, can he keep up with the multi pronged aggression of Hero? Zealous, they're getting to the mineral line. Drones are going down. Stalkers, they push towards the third base. And DRG is being pulled apart. The tri pronged attack, too much. 18 drones go down. And DRG, sure, he killed a couple of probes across the map, but this pales in comparison to the damage that he's taking. Hero, he cripples the economy, kills the base, kills 18 workers, and backs off. Let's back up. We can see a bit of a desperation move here out of DRG. Rushing on top of the army. Nova goes off, raises some of those roaches. Uh, but DRG is pretty all in. He's all in at this point. It's all or nothing. We have to end it here and now. He does catch some immortals, but it's not going to be enough. GG gets called. Hero snowballs out of control and takes the series 3-1, to one, becoming this week's ESL Open Cup Asia champion. GG.
Chi ba. Congratulations here as Hero. He does it. He takes it at the end, three to one. We did see DRG put up a fight, and it was able, he was able to force a series out of this at least. A punishing Hero for rushing into Sky told us uh, we had a pretty awkward game three on Alkyona. Like I didn't even know what really happened on Alkyona. It was crazy. It was, <laughs> it was just a very unorthodox game, very scrappy game between our players. But here, Hero. He was able to barely break through, and again, it was very impressive that DRG, he was able to deny the warp bins, was able to survive and force back the army, but had lost too many drones. Too, too much economic damage throughout the course of that. He could not keep up army-wise, supply-wise, and he was pulled apart in the end. He was overwhelmed, and congratulations. Congratulations to Hero. Again, he has been on fire as of late. Did quite well for himself at IEM. I know people, I mean, myself included, want him to go further. We don't we don't have to talk about the Cure series at IEM, Smoge. <laughs> but still did very well for himself. And uh, even in Masters Coliseum before that. And I do look forward to seeing more of Hero in the coming weeks and the coming months. I'm referring to DreamHack Dallas. I'm referring to Gamers 8. And, of course, the other major events as well. So definitely looking forward to some more Hero action. GG, well played. Meanwhile, my condolences to DRG, but a big shout out to him because he made it this far. He made it all the way to the finals. And I mentioned earlier today, earlier in this broadcast, how it feels like DRG has been overshadowed, or not overshadowed, but overlooked. Feels like, um, you know, despite his performances and despite his results, a lot of people, you know, they look at Solar, they look at Shin, they look at Dark for good reason. Um, but DRG is not one to be ignored. You know, he's still an amazing player in his own right. I mean, hey, he beat Gumiho, he was able to bring down Oliveira, able to bring down Creator. Some big wins here for DRG. So I do look forward to seeing more of him in the future as well. Congratulations. Congratulations, bye. Congratulations. Uh, and with that, it is time to pay out the predictions. Let's go. Time to pay out those predictions and to wrap things up as well. Um, quickly checking here. Momento. Uh, the Stars War 11 qualifier is still wrapping up. We, I guess we we could try to jump on it. Could try. Not a lot of players there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'll hop over and see what's going on. I'll try to hop over. Hop over. And uh, catch up on what has been going on there. Um, so that is going to be the end of ESL Open Cup Asia. That is going to be the end of this event for now. But I'm quickly hop hopping over to Europe. And we may end up casting some Stars War 11, 11 Last Chance Qualifiers. Which is currently ongoing. Um, I believe there's one qualifying spot. Uh, yes, there's one qualifying spot available. And we, and it looks like the finals have yet started. Okay, okay. So, quickly, just catching up here on what's been going on. Um, in the Stars War 11 qualifier, um, Geralt took down Young Yakov 2 to 0. Geralt, he's waiting for either Euthermal or Milky Cow. Waiting for one or the other to make it through into a qualifying match. And we may as well cast. We may as well cast. Okay. Beautiful, Poppy. Beautiful. So we're going to be going on a short break. When we return, we're going to be live here with the qualifying match of Stars War 11. Again, if you enjoyed this broadcast, then consider following. And this is a weekly tournament, and we cast it every single week. ESL Open Cup Asia. It's been running for 200 and, what, 19 editions? Jesus, that's, that's a lot of editions. That's a lot of weeklies. That's a lot of tournaments. So again, uh, do consider following. We're live here every single day on the Cranky Ducklings. Uh, multiple times a day as we're about to go into another cast. And we are also casting ESL Open Cup Europe later on tonight as well. So plenty of content here in these next 24 hours. Tomorrow we're going to be casting some more Stars War 11. Tomorrow we're also casting a 4 Jumi show match. That's plenty of content here on the Cranky Ducklings. We also have a YouTube channel. We've been casting here on the, on the Cranky Ducklings for, what, six, seven years? It's... <laughs> it's been a long time uh, that we've been casting on a regular basis. So if you haven't heard of us before, then consider following. Because, hey, 
we've been consistent for a long time and we we will continue to be consistent here on the channel bringing you as much content as possible quack puppy quack um we are going to be taking a day off in a couple of days we rarely do again we we're always live here on the channel but um on wednesday i am returning to australia on, re on wednesday i'm flying back which means i won't be able to cast unfortunately the internet on planes is not good enough to stream so I do apologize, but it also means I'll be back at my home setup. I won't be casting from a laptop anymore. I do know that there were a couple of frame drops from time to time in, in this broadcast. So I do apologize, and that will be rectified once I am back at my home PC. So uh, that is going to be happening soon. For those who are curious, I'm in Poland. I was in Poland for IEM. I was, in, I was traveling to Poland for IEM Katowice. I was able to meet, you know, all the casters. I was able to briefly meet and, and rejoin with, like, Pig and Zobrigov and Roddy and all the other players there. And it was a great experience. It was a great experience. I did briefly talk about it uh, during some of these streams. It's beautiful. Uh, I tweeted and tweeted some stuff about it as well. Uh, so, yeah, it was a great time. But um, I'm going to be returning home soon, in a couple of days. In a couple of days. Meanwhile, we're going to be going on a short break. I need some time to set up all the overlays, and we will be get, we'll be getting ready for the Stars War 11 qualifiers. See you soon. It's going to be either Geralt versus Milky Cow or Geralt versus Uwu Thermal, the YouTube man himself, the replacement man. I'm here for it. I'm ready for it. We'll see you guys soon. Until then, thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with some more StarCraft. See you then. Uh, also, follow us on YouTube, we have a Patreon, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Mastodon, we have Blue Sky, we have everything, Discord, follow us, see you soon, bye.
friends, welcome back everyone, welcome back Ooh, to our second broadcast of the day. We just wrapped up with ESL Open Cup Asia, and now we are here with the Stars War 11 Last Chance EU and NA Open Qualifier. This is it, the last chance that these players have to actually make it through and qualify for the main event. And who will make it, or who, to qualify for the closed qualifiers of this region. We'll make it through as we are tied up one to one. We're here in the ace match and spawning in the top right hand corner of Alkyona. We have our red Terran player. It is Milky Cow. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner. Spawning in the bottom right hand corner. We have his opponent. Huh, we have his opponent. We have the Orange Protoss, the Orange Protoss player here from the land of the Netherlands. He's playing random, by the way. It is Ubu Thermal. He's an animal. <laughs> He's an absolute animal. I'm shaking my head. I'm shaking my head. Um, but I will quickly uh, fix up the in-game names. Hold on. Ubu uh, Thermal. Ubu Thermal. One moment. Uh, which color is closest? Bam, beautiful. Be beautiful. Okay, so it's going to be a TVP. Again, Uthermal, he has been playing random, from my understanding, uh, throughout the course of this qualifier and continuing to pick random. His main race is Terran, for those who don't know, and he is mainly a content creator nowadays. Uh, does make a lot of YouTube videos out there, a lot of content on YouTube, and he is mixing it up here with Milky Cow, and hey, mate, he forced the ace match. Now, I don't know what happened in game one and game two. I'm not too familiar with what did occur. We are just kind of jumping into things uh, mid-series, and we'll see how this series does end and conclude. Geralt is waiting for the winner of this series. He's lying in wait for the winner. And we are here to find out who exactly that will be. I uh, do apologize if I'm a little bit distracted. I'm just trying to sort some things out and fix some things up. And so now it's going to be a gate expanded to Cybercore. Send the opener out of U Thermal. Likewise, Milky Cow going for a double gas opener, something more aggressive. Double gas opener is going to be leading into a faster factory, into a faster starport. It's going to be a 1 1 1. And we are going for a committed mind drop. Okay. You do have my attention. So I'm just switching us over in TL and uh, setting up a bunch of overlays. <laughs> just trying to quickly set things up. Let's see, here we go. We're getting into our add-on swap. Now, I assume that this is going to be for reacted Widow Mines, but this could also be reacted Cyclones. But there it is. Widow Mines are on the way. Pretty committed build. It's going to be quite a hefty amount of Widow Mines moving out across the map. We'll see how good Euthermal is at splitting. I'll be honest, I haven't casted Euthermal in quite some time. I think the last time I casted Euthermal was when he was representing Team Roddy in the WTL qualifiers. This was like, what, last year, September or something? It's, it's been a couple of months. Since then, I have not had the luxury of casting Mark, casting New Thermal, but I'm ready for it as he's going for a Stargate opener. Reaper does slip in. Ooh, we do get a probe, two probe kills in the main, and we do get a full scout. We get eyes on the Phoenixes. Now, we are still committed to the mind drop, but it's going to be risky because we do have some anti air to deal with it. Can we avoid those Phoenixes? Mind drop is moving out. We have Cyclones and Vikings amassing back at home to defend against the Phoenixes themselves. And we are committed. We are moving out. Let's go. As the job is making his way towards that natural. Phoenixes are in the main. We have a couple of grounded units here at the natural base. So we are poised. We are in position to defend. Oh, we want to try to bait in the Phoenixes. Bold move. Oh. Is being forced back. Here come the Phoenixes. Is the bait going to work? <gasps> Is the base going to work as you thermal up? Oh, he's looking for the medevac and he doesn't quite come across it. The trap has been set. And is it going to pay off here? Does he notice in time? And it looks like we do bait out one of those shots. Second shot goes off. We get one Phoenix kill. Up, oh, up. Oh. And it looks like we will ooh, get another shot off as well. But we will bleed out these Widow Mines. Not the best connections. Not what we wanted. We did kill a Phoenix, but... I'm sure we wanted more. Like, we were hoping that the Phoenixes would stack and just crash in. So, not the best connections there. Milky, how he backs up. He's building up here with some tank production. Getting into his tanks, getting into his Cyclones. He is moving out. Oh, 
as we do get a lock on it again. Phoenixes are quite low here to defend. This push from Milky Cow doesn't look like much, but likewise, you throw doesn't have much to defend either. Remember, no blink on his stalkers. Vanilla gateway units, no shield battery either. We can break in. Mineshot gonna be going up. Ooh, trying to force a friendly fire. The Marines are so low. Uh, the friendly fire was real, and uh, you thermal, he will defend. He will hold on to his third. At the same time, oh. <gasps> Mineshot goes off. Gets a handful of probes. Barely is avoided. So Thermo is going to be able to stabilize and settle into his third. Likewise, Milky Cow, he backs off, throws down his own third base as well. And it looks like we're going to be settling into a bit of a longer game. We're calming things down, but calming things down. Uh, that is going to give me the opportunity to... Um... To set things up as well. up as Phoenixes, they do head in towards that main. They do catch a couple of these medevacs. Oh, they get one. Big pick up. One medevac does go down. Interesting that we're continuing Phoenix production as well. Like, despite bleeding out some Phoenixes, we're still building it up. Still committed. New Thermal. Working towards charge instead of blink. So charge loss alongside Phoenixes. This can be a pretty effective army, especially if we fight out on the map. The downside here is that breaking these entrenched lines is going to be a tough ask. Not impossible, though, as that's a lot of zealots. And here we go. Euthermal is moving out. Likewise, so is our Terran player, but the tank is caught on siege. Yeah, the tank is caught out. The, the Widow Mines, they don't get any shots off as well. Ooh, and Euthermal is snowballing out of control, just catching Milky Cow completely unprepared. Widow Mines, new burrow. They do burrow. Euthermal is going to be respecting that. It does back off, does retreat. Waiting for more reinforcements. Denying this push. Does deny the push as we dive on the army. Mitchell's going to be going up. Ooh. Decent connections on the Zealots. Phoenix is a, be a bleeding out. And this bio army from Milky Cow becoming that much more effective. Breaks on through, forces back the army. And remember, we don't have any Colossi, we don't have any splash damage. Oh, the Zealots are running out! Running out of Zealots, big mind shot here on the Adepts. Pieces are going down, and Milky Cow is snowballing out of control. Punishing Euthermal from being a little bit too aggressive. And behind this, what do we have? Storm, it's still not done. It's, uh, it's, it's halfway. We need more time. There's the Chrono. We need that Storm as soon as possible. Without it, Euthermal, he might not have enough. He won't have enough. Milky Cow is getting over Sim. He has been losing some of these Phoenixes. Sorry, some of these Metamaxes to the Phoenixes. There we go. Zealots, they come in from behind. Big mind shots go up on the Zealots. The army is over Sim, but we can still kite our hearts out. We can still kite, but... Milky Cow still trading well. Oh, force the Stim once again. The Stims, they're killing him. We do need a moment to breathe here, but no, he refuses. Storm is done, by the way. He is now done. Mine shot's gonna be going off. We've run out of Marines. Milky Cow, he is being forced back. He was so close to breaking Euthermal. Isn't able to. And behind this, Euthermal, he has Storm. He has High Templar. He survives. He survives. He gets his fourth base up and running. He has an economic lead. Milky Cow feeling pretty all in, feeling pretty committed. Now he throws down his own fourth. Does throw down his own fourth base. Looks like he will get on top of the Nexus. Where's the shield battery, by the way? No shield battery. Come in with a flanking storm. A storm was okay. We still have three storms left. We don't want to waste them. Goes up pushing forward. We had a decent EMP earlier. Another storm on the army. Oof. Oh my god. The storm's a little bit too good. We clean up most of the marines. The ghost they still stand strong. Good EMP on the zealots. Oh, the hot pickup. Oh my god. You thermal. 
pulls back, saves the Zealots. But again, this is still such a close defense here, such a close hold. The Ghosts are saved, Hot pick up out of Milky Cow. Showing that, hey, he's not the only one, the Euthermal's not the only one that can micro, that can juggle. Does barely retain his army. Keeping the pressure on. Oh, the Bite Shot. Yeah, an unfortunate warp in within range. More mind shots going off. Zelts are falling. And as you throw more goes for a big Zelda, run by, he's being broken. The supply not here at home to defend. An EMP here on the on the Archon. Uh, we have a couple of storms. That's it. That's the final storm for you, Thermal. It's not going to be enough. Milky Cow is breaking through the defenses. At the same time, the Zelda Rumbai finally gets across the map and it's going to get damage done. Milky Cow stimming everything. Oh, my massive mind shot. 17 probes go down. An insane amount of damage. Zelda, they get across the map. But we have reinforcements. We have plenty of production here. Plenty to deal with it. Plenty of workers go down. 20 workers go down. And the Wooden Mines, they are resetting. They're about to reset. Oh, we're focusing one of them down. Both of them, even. Oof. One does survive. Behind this Milky Cow, he was able to get his fourth base up and running. God, oh, those Immortals. They're so low. They're so vulnerable, but we can't get them. We forced the whole pick up. We forced Milky Cow back. But you throw him like, again, these bases are vulnerable. And Milky Cow, he's just not stopping. He's not slowing down. He's crazy. Refusing to back up. Again, he knows how close he is to breaking you throw him all. Do we have any storms left? We do have three high tempo in that war prism. Do we have a storm? There's the overcharge. Good EMP on the immortals. And up. Oh. Get the EMP. No! The prism goes down! The High Templar along with it. And with that, there's almost nothing left here. As I say that. Oh! We get the Immortal. We barely do. The Immortal is full, but that was a massive pick off. A prism with three High Templar, each with one storm. Not like this. And now, without any threat of a storm, we can dive on this. Ooh. Blinking on four, diving on the army. But I think Milky Cow just has a little bit too much momentum. We're down to one immortal. It's one immortal, two stalkers left, and Milky Cow, he is doing it. He's breaking through. GG, and Milky Cow will take the series two to one, advancing on to the qualifying match. GG. <laughs> GG, well played. Impressive that you Thermal was able to force the ace match. I'm not going to lie, I'm surprised. Um, considering that Milky Cow is, you know, a pro-active player. And to be fair, I don't know... I don't know um, what race you Thermal rolled when he was able to take a game off of Milky Cow. I'm assuming it was Terran, but I'm assuming. I'm not too sure. Um, I'm sure other people may be watching some of the other streams. Regardless, GG, well played. Milky Cow will make it through to face off against Geralt. Congratulations. We have our qualifying match. Let's go. Milky cow. I'm just setting things up and I'm just trying to get a read here and make sure that uh, I have everything correct. Making sure that I have correct capitalization. As we have a fresh series. Let's go. Okay, Geralt versus the Milky Cow. Um, when it comes to the brackets, I will post it in the chat. Because I do notice so I, I got you guys, I got you guys. Because uh, it is still set up for ESL Asia. But switching our scenes over. We can have a look at the brackets together. Bam, there we go. We can have a look at the bracket together. Not the largest of brackets. For those that are curious, um, this qualifier actually wasn't meant to be a thing. 
this qualifier wasn't meant to be around. Uh, but Clem did, he qualified for the event, for the closed qualifier, but Clem did recently announce that um, he won't be available, uh, that he won't be able to travel to the offline event. So Clem has given up his spot, and that means that there's an opening. That means that there is an opening spot available to players from the European or the Americas region. And this is to claim Clem's spot. And who will it be? Um, quickly just... There we go. Moving this over and zooming in, a, zooming in a little bit as well. Bam. There we go. Just to get some better eyes on this. Uh, from the top, we had Kelezer versus Harsim. Ooh, Harsim, he knocked down Kelezer 2-0. Harsim then fell to Young Yakov. Very impressive that Harsim took down Kelezer. Like, in my mind, Harsim nowadays is a bit more of a content creator. So, really cool that he was able to keep up with Kelezer, but did fall to Young Yakov. Geralt was able to bring down Young Yakov in the end, and Geralt advances on in the upper bracket. Milky Cow, he popped off here. He he took down Wayne. Very impressive. Milky Cow, he 2 0s Wayne. I rate Wayne quite highly, to be honest, as uh, one of the best Zerg players in Europe. So for Wayne to go down to Milky Cow, clearly Milky Cow is on fire. Clearly he is deserving to be here in the qualifying spot. And who will take that Clem spot? Who is the Clem replacement? Will it be Geralt or Milky Cow? We're here to find out. We are here to find out. I know the ESL logo is still there. I know. <laughs> I wasn't able to switch everything over. And, oh, you know what? Let's set up predictions. Let us set up those predictions while we can. To determine who will make it through. Manage prediction. Finals. Best of three. As a reminder, this is going to be a best of three as well. Best of three. Not a best of five. Between Geralt and Milky Cow. Beautiful. Be beautiful. If you're in the chat, predictions are open. Predictions are open so you can place your bets on how you think this series will unfold. And who will qualify for the Stars War 11 European and North American closed qualifier? Who will take Clem's, Clem's place? Who's it going to be? And here we go. We're getting into this and spawning in the bottom left hand corner. Oh, sorry. Uh P predictions open <laughs> predictions they are open in the chat so you can place your bets on who you think is going to qualify good luck best of luck there as a reminder it is a best of three and spawning in the bottom of the hand corner of alkyone we have our polish protoss player the red protoss representing Psy storm gaming Ooh, patiently waiting for his opponent but can now flex his skill here in the qualifying match the polish protoss Geralt. And spawning in the top right hand corner, we have as opponent, we have the blue Terran player. Currently teamless, but deserving to be on the team. He just took down Euthermo. He took down Wayne as well. Very impressive result so far. It is Milky Cow. Oh, we're going for a proxy. <laughs> this might be a fast one. I'm not opposed to a fast series because when is the next cast? In three hours and 40 minutes. In three hours and 40 minutes, we're going to be live here on the channel with ESL Open Cup Europe. And I would like a break, a small break, <laughs> before that happens. But it's not up to me. Not up to me at all. It is up to our players here. Let's go. Well, the Prep Scout is coming in and Geralt, he does miss the proxy. Now, again, it is only going to be a singular proxy. Rax, not the most committed of proxies. It is going to be proxy Reaper. And the SV is coming in. So the way this works is that we're going to be proxying the Reaper. The SV can go throw down an eBay block. There it is. I was going to say either a bunker or an eBay. We do force the unnatural, natural. Geralt force to expand elsewhere. The Reaper's on the way. We are looking to wreak some havoc. And the probe scout does confirm. Hold up. Where is your Rax? What have you done? There's that bunker now on the way. We cancel the eBay. And the goal, the role of this bunker is to deny mining in the mineral line. If it does finish, the bunk, the Reaper can dive in and we cannot mine until the bunker has been dealt with. Zealot does pop out. 
Can we get on top of the SCV? The Reaper does arrive. Ooh, SCV goes down. Big pick off. Big pick off there from Geralt. It does force a cancel on the bunker. This could have been so much worse. And the Reaper is now going in further, but the Stalker has arrived across the map. We're transitioning. We have the factory on the way. We're going for Proxy Marauder. Oh my, he's crazy. He's doubling down. He's doubling down here with Proxy Marauder, not just Reaper. Marauders are on the way. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, Hellions are amassing. We are going to be transitioning with a CC behind this. So, none all in, but we are committed. We are quite committed here. As the Zealot is going to try to push on board here. We do force back the Reaper at least. Getting damage done. The supply block is real. No, we forced down the supply. <laughs> Zealot somehow makes his way into the main wish. We disrupt the opener. We disrupt the CC. Going down to Starport behind this. SCV goes down. But we've been building up Marauders. And we are pushing in. And with these Marauders, we cannot mine. Not from the natural base. We do have a couple of adepts coming in. Stalker, at least one of them turning back around. We do catch some of the Hellions. But the Hellions, they get away. They get across the map. Ooh, and Carol, he's in a lot of trouble. He's forced to recall back home. We do have that recall. There is a shield battery on the low ground at the natural. We couldn't we can force an overcharge. Hellions, they barely do make their way ooh, towards the main base. Stalkers are being focused down. Hellions, they bust into the main. We have an adept! Good target firing out of Geralt. I was going to say that those Hellions, they can wreak havoc. They can kill a lot of probes. But the Hellions go down. There's one Marauder left. Ah, we're down. To, we're up to two. We're getting back up to do. But Geralt, for the most part, he's defended. He has held. We're waddling in a widow. Oh, my. He's crazy. <laughs> Milky Cow is just rallying everything across the map. Calm down. The Wood of Mine does fall with the Marauders. They're going to be waddling back home. And Geralt, he is going to be able to stabilize. Getting into additional gateways. Getting into this three-gate setup. Three-gate setup here from Geralt. Does focus on one of those Marauders as well. He catches both. Barely. We'll keep his Stalker alive. Good target firing there out of Geralt. And back at home, what do we have to work with? We have a third TC on the way. We have a tank. We deny mining at the natural. Milky Cow is in a lot of trouble. And again, this third TC tells us that Milky Cow is not going for an all-in. The command center is on the way. It tells us the Milky Cow is trying to, trying to macro out of this and get into a longer game. Banshee does reveal itself. Cloak in production. Carol taking a lot of hits there from that Banshee. But he will get a kill. A Banshee goes down. Thankfully, there is another Banshee on the way. A uh, Cloak does complete. Geralt, uh, he's got an Observer. I was about to say, like, has he read this well? And is he getting ready for Banshee Harass? The answer is yes. <laughs> does have Detection. Does have that Observer. Banshee's moving out. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Ah, fixed in two minutes. I do apologize. <laughs> no, it's been a... Oh, my God. I do apologize for it showing you thermal, uh, but it is now fixed. Sorry, I was a little bit distracted. I've been trying to get the overlay set up, and yeah, I did forget about the name. It does happen from time to time. Do apologize, but thank you for pointing it out. Thank you in the chat. Thank you. Do appreciate it. Do appreciate it as we do have high ground vision. No blink. Oh, sorry. Blink is done. We do have a decent amount of stalkers. We're diving into the main. We are going for the dive. The tank looking a bit exposed. Can we focus it down? We do have a clutch repair. There we go. We do repair in time. The tank does hold. Milky Cow stabilizing you on two bases. It's going to be able to stabilize in these two bases. 
Likewise, Geralt happily just taking his third base, taking up towards a bay for Colossus production, charges on the way as well. Now, as a reminder, Geralt, he doesn't have to break his Terran opponent. He doesn't have to break the Terran here on two bases. We can just contain. The weak condition for Geralt can just be to contain Milky Cow, delay the third for as long as possible, get our own fourth base up and running, and look to just macro out of this. There's no pressure on Geralt to force the issue. If he does, he might overextend. Oh, the Banshee. The Banshee goes down. We do miss the Cloak. Remember, Cloak was researched and we did miss it. Third base now being taken. It is spotted. We are going to be trading out a Stalker. Oh, let's be fair to escape. Getting a handful of Marines. Good control here out of Geralt. Does pull back in time. Observers make, getting eyes on any kind of move out on the main army. Ooh, and as Milky settles down here at his third base, we get a big warp into the main. Charge is done. We do get into the middle line. SMEs are going down at the same time. Sulk is going to be threatening that front line as well. Tanks are sieged. And we're committing. Yeah, we could hive on it anyway. We focus down the first tank. We focus down the second and almost the third tank as well. Oh, it's so close. It, we get it. Barely with the final swipe. The tank goes down. We go for another big warp into the main base. More boys being pulled. More SMEs falling. And even though Geralt, he's trading out his army, it's worth it here. He has the better economy. He's breaking the third. Mineshot going to be going for the friendly fire. No. SCVs they take a lot of damage. 21 SCVs go down. The Trader Bind. And a good dodge there out of Geralt as well. Very nice control. There's still Zealots in the main base. Finally, they're being cleaned up. But I spoke to... Oh, there we go. I heard a warping sound. It was just the, the Prism on Sieging. We do pull back. Milky Cow, he's holding. He's holding on here to his three base setup. He's on 44 workers. He's down 20 SCVs. And Geralt, he's getting a fourth. That's what we spoke about. Geralt, all he has to do is take a fourth base. Maintain his economy and get into Colossi, and that's exactly what's happening. I mean, he's doing that and then some because he didn't have to try to pull Milky Cow apart. Didn't have to, but he did. The damage dealt was insane. 23 dead workers. And what have we lost? Zealots, a couple of adepts, nine stalkers. More than acceptable losses here for Geralt. Getting back into the main. Ooh, the prism does get focused down. Good target firing out of Milky Cow. That's good positioning, I should say, from our Terran player. But ah, uh, here come the Colossi. Now, if we had the War Prism to reinforce, I think we can push and break the third. 100%. Without the War Prism, I'm not so sure. Yes, there we go. The Colossi are going to be pulling back. We have reinforcements here, and there's too much anyway. GG gets called, and Gerald takes game number one. GG. GG, well played. Geralt does take a lead in this series. And as a reminder, it's a best of three. It is a best of three, not a best of five. Very little room to work with here. Milky Cow, the pressure is on. And can he bounce back here and now? Can he bounce back in game number two? I mean, he needs to if we want to force an extended series. I'm hoping for that, but it's not on me. It's on our players here. It is on Milky Cow. Let's go. See, in chat, I love that Milky always sends it. Milky Cow, he's a very aggressive player. And I, I appreciate it as well. Like, I love casting Milky Cow. Whether it's against Protoss, Terran, or Zerg, Milky Cow is just always in your face. And, I mean, at times it does work, right? It's like, uh, you know, it's very high risk, high reward. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, he puts it all on the line. Puts it all in line and, you know, at times things can swing out Game of your favor as well. Oh, as it looks like we're going to be remaking here. Um, oh, uh, we're not sure. <laughs> Rogue Mac, I believe, I think, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah, we are remaking. 
as game number two is not going to be on Oceanborn. It's going to be on Hecate. I'm going to be loading into Hecate here. Just catching up with the chat. Uh, what race did you throw more win with? I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't know. I, I just know it was random. I just know it was random. Hero is pretty much the only Protoss that Koreans play slash study because he's in all the tournaments. Uh, kind of. I mean, I see some people in the chat uh, throwing some shade at, like, classic creator. I would not say so. Um, Like, when I think of the best Protosses in the world, I do think, like, Hero, I think Classic, I think Creator, I think Nightmare, then I think Max Pack Showtime uh, alongside them. But um, I would still rate the Korean Protosses a little higher than a lot of the others out there. Um, they're a little bit overshadowed because I don't see them as often, but they're, they're pretty good players in their own right. This is in regards to the previous series. But here we go. We're getting into game number two. That's by the by. We're getting into game number two and spawning in the top right hand corner of the Stars War 11. Last chance EU and a open qualifier. This is it. Can we qualify? Can we make it through into the closed qualifier? He's one game away representing Storm Gaming. It is Geralt. And spawning in the bottom left, but also going for a proxy in the center of the map. We have the Red Terran player, currently teamless, but deserving to be on a team. Made it this far. Can he make it even further? Can he force the ace match? It is Milky Cow. Going for the proxy racks. It's an Ursadak, that's it. I keep calling it an Ursadon, but I think uh, the Ursadon is the modern version and the Ursadak is like the primal version, I think. He's no shot! He scouts! Geralt, he does move out with the probe scout. He does come across the racks, and with that, he's going to try to shut it down. I believe the racks should finish. I believe the racks should finish, but Geralt does get eyes on this, so he can prepare back at home accordingly. As the Reaper is on the way, SV thereafter, we do send out a second probe. Ideally, this is to deny the eBay block. There it is, Nexus is already on the way on location and there is no ebay block available there's no bunker available either as the scv is just far too low we're going to be switching out one scv for the other though as we want that bunker oh ooh, we will throw it down bunker is on the way and can we finish it this time remember the power of this proxy is to get oh, is to get the bunker up but it is cancelled it is denied zealot did arrive in time and back at home, we're transitioning out of this. We're pivoting away. First Reaper has arrived. We are, investing, we are investing into additional Reapers. This time, we're not going Marauder. Reaper dips in. He wants a probe. Oh, so far, he does get one. He gets two. He wants a third probe, and he looks like he will get it. Three probe kills in total. Pretty good damage so far. Ooh, but that's three probes for the Reaper. As the Reaper is sniped. Good movement out of Geralt. Does shut it down. And now we're floating back home. We're getting out of this proxy. <laughs> As the dust does settle, I mean, Milky Cow has potential for more damage. He has potential. He still has a second Reaper. But now he's stuck with his racks not producing anything, not making any add-ons. It is going to be an inefficient start here for Milky Cow. As it looks like he's trying to get into a Widowmine drop. Meanwhile, first Widowmine shot goes off. We get in! The Stalker does manage to slip in, and can we delay the Starport? It's going to be close. We do get a kill on the SEV. Boys are being pulled. They try to go for the surround. Unable to. Another SEV falls. And again, it's a Twilight Council blink-based opener. Now, how many gateways do we go? Two, three, or four gateways. How aggressive does Geralt want to be? Meanwhile, Milky Cow expanding because of these stalker scouts we were able to get eyes on the third cc we were also able to get eyes on the additional widow mine production so Geralt should be fully aware that a mine drop is coming we 
we are preparing for that mind drop. Speaking of the Wither Mines, they're still stuck back at him. Ooh, we do barely avoid the shots. That was close. That was close here. Oh, oh as we get another SCV. You can see Mookie Cow trying to bait the army within range of the, the shot. My shot goes off. He gets the Adept. Does pay off in the end. Adept goes down, but we did bleed out one of those Wither Mines. Now we're going for a delayed mine drop across the map with only a single widow mine here. Geralt chasing this back. Going for a defensive warp in. And this mine drop shouldn't get any damage done, but ideally it should scout. And there we go. We get eyes on additional gateways. We have two gates on the way. One gateway already done. It's going to be three gate blink out of Geralt. And Milky Cow should be somewhat aware. So Mind Drop comes in. Oh. Mind Drop does come in. We don't waste the shovel. We have an Observer and we can take that that Widow Mind down. Oof. Doesn't get a shot off. Now, 3 Gate Blink is a very safe way to play just because it gives you extra production to warp in to defend. Uh, it can allow you to gain some map control, but we won't be committed like a 4 Gate Blink would be. We won't be diving on top of the army or pushing into any of these tanks. We are getting our third base up and running. So again, a much more defensive style here out of Geralt. Very safe play, is what I should say. Oh, he wants that medevac. And he will barely miss it. And yeah, medevac does barely manage to escape in the end. Third base is getting up and running. Raven Harass comes in. We do manage to get a probe. We get one. Get a worker slipping into the main. Oh, oh my god. Almost getting the observer in the main base as well. I mean, uh, some decent order to harass. Nothing major, only one probe kill. But at least we're keeping Milky Cow busy, and at least the Raven is still alive. As well, we're keeping Geralt busy. As at least the Raven is still alive, and Geralt is getting into his Colossal production. Milky Cow back at home, he's stabilizing on two bases. Getting into his 3-1-1 setup, building up a tank count just so we can defend against the Blink Stalkers. And getting into Biomine thereafter. So pretty standard play here at a Milky Cow. This is the setup that we expect to see on two bases from our Terran. And the question becomes, do we push out or do we throw down a third? And there it is, 30 CCs on the way, so Milky Cow is going to take it slow and steady. Adept does commit. We do tank the shots. Yeah, Mind shot goes off. Four SCVs go down, even forcing a bit of friendly fire. Well done there by Geralt. Raven Harass coming back in. Geralt, ooh, bleeding out a couple of probes. Milky Cow, he does sneak out across the map. He does bypass these stalkers. Is pushing. Has to be careful with the tank. Ooh, as he gets caught out. No. We pick up a tank for free. Big pick up there by Geralt. But is he ready for the army? Is he ready to receive? He has one. Now two Colossi. He has a shield battery. He has an overcharge. He's in position. Yeah, Widowmine's going to be going down. I have service here as well. And we will completely shut this down. Milky Cow. Yes, he got across the map. But Geralt was ready for it. Likewise, Milky Cow bled out a tank. Down to one. He's going to be reinforcing. So he's reinforcing on the left. He's going for a drop on the right. Milky Cow going to try and go for a split push. While he expands. And again, the aggression of Milky Cow is not just to get some damage done, but also to keep Geralt busy to allow Milky Cow to expand. To allow him to get his third. Probe Scout is going to come across the army. Joe comes in. Geralt out of position. Is a bit out of position here. Nice mind shot on the army. At the same time, we're pushing towards the fourth base. Geralt, not where he needs to be. Twilight Council is going to be going down. We do force a cancel here. We should force a cancel on this northern base. It's going to be close. Ooh, that was a kill, not a cancel. 
Ay, ay, ay. We do avoid the mine shells. We do get on top of the tanks. But Geralt, he's bleeding out a bit too much. Losing a base. Bleeding out his zealots. Overcharge is forcing. Can we get on top of the Colossus? We can. We can try. We go for the Stim the Colossus. It's going to be going down. Milky Cup pulling Geralt apart. He's just pulling him left and right. Sniping a Colossus. Sniping a base. But Geralt's main army is still looking quite terrifying. And this may just trigger a counterattack. It may just force Geralt into an all-in. Prism is on the way. Three Archons as well. It's all or nothing for Geralt. Ooh, and he does come across the drop. What man's going to be barring. That's a lot of Marauders. Stimming on four, changing this down. But Archons, they make it just in time. Now, Geralt, he's expanding on the right-hand side. Behind his army. Drop comes back in. Geralt, he's backing off. Yeah, I assume he's going to go for a big counterattack, but it looks like Geralt, he has been deterred. He will fall back. And Milky Cow, he's not looking too bad. Economically, it's looking a bit rough. Milky Cow is still on three bases, but even though Geralt has a higher worker count, you can see here he's oversaturated. He's heavily oversaturated. He needs his fourth. He needs that fourth base. And then Geralt can start keeping up in army supply. That's a big if, though. Storm is on the way. We're on how many Colossi? We're on two. Ooh, wait. on two Colossi. Looks like the bay was sniped. My apologies, I did, mi I did miss that. The bay was sniped. Twilight Council as well. And Milky Cow, you might just have too much. Vikings are pushing forward. Do you have the overcharge? Overcharge does buy some time. Mind shot to bait it out. No big connections. Yeah, Milky Cow not liking his chances. He does back up. Does retreat. Uh, meanwhile, do we have a fourth? We There we go. I was like, do we have a fourth base? Now it does start up here for Milky Cow. It's on the way. Geralt is going to be forcing this back. <laughs> Did sim forward for a moment. Didn't quite dive on it. Again, Milky Cow, I still like his position in general. If he can keep the momentum going. Like, can he deny this base again? Can he go for another split push? He's been trying to break the fourth base, but has been unsuccessful. And now Geralt, he's getting a fifth. He is getting his fifth base. Sell it run by coming in. Do deflect it. Milky Cow in position. I runs into Colossi. A little bit less than ideal. Thankfully, Milky Cow does load up, does get the hell out of there. Does get the hell out of there. More Zell's gonna be going down. We can see Geralt, he is starting up Disruptor production, but without Disruptors, like, his army is still a little bit vulnerable. Milky, Milky Cow can still break, can still break through. We get a cannon. Uh, the ghost a bit exposed. Ooh, one ghost goes down. The drop here on the right hand side is being cleaned up as well. Milky Cow throwing away a lot of supply. Yeah, the drop is cleaned up. Geralt pushing through. Takes down some Metamax, takes down some Rollers. These are expensive losses here for Milky Cow. Gets another loss on another Ghost. Another Ghost goes down. Uh, expensive losses here. And here come the Disruptors. Here come the Purification Overs. Geralt, he has arrived. Blinking on Ford, collapsing on the army, and Geralt, he's snowballing out of control. We do dive on top of the Colossi. We got one. But then we still have another behind this, and we still have disruptors as well. Never goes off. No! Big connection. We take down the Marauders. Another Nova will connect as well. Uh, not quite. Only Stalkers left. Wow. And a handful of Zelts. We still have the Immortal as well. 21 SCVs go down. Here come the reinforcements. What we were lacking. 
Mind shots are resetting. Uh, the base itself is it going to go down. It burns down. The repair a little bit too late. GG gets called and Milky Cow has been broken. Geralt will take the series 2-0 qualifying for Stars War 11, the European and America's closed qualifier. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations. Congratulations here to Geralt for qualifying. I mean, he's an amazing Protoss player and he's been doing so well over the past year of StarCraft. It's been amazing to see him grow as a player. And yeah, with that, Geralt, he will actually be a part of the closed qualifier. Now, he's not a part of the main event. Not yet. We're going to find out tomorrow. Tomorrow is day one of the closed qualifier. We have many amazing players taking part in it, and Geralt will be joining them. My condolences to Mookie Cow. He did have some good moments. I will say he had some really good moments in this game where he was able to really flex his multitasking and put Geralt's multitasking to the test. And Geralt was struggling. He was struggling to keep up. He was being pulled apart. But then Geralt established his fourth. He was able to re-establish his fourth base, settle into a four-base economy, get back into disruptor production as well, and did feel like maybe Milky Cow was a little bit too passive, or maybe just allowed that to happen and allowed momentum and mo momentum to just peter out from his side. And GG, GG, well played. Nonetheless, a solid run here out of Milky Cow. I mean, he took down Wayne and New Thermal to make it here. It's a very impressive run, uh, but Geralt was able to be a bit proved to be too much to him in the end gg gg well played congratulations congratulations and with that we have all of our qualified players quickly just double checking here we can actually uh switch our scenes over we can switch our scenes over to have a look at the wikipedia page here we go Okay, so there we <laughs> scrolling on in here, we can have a look at the run of our players. Um, so today we had Geralt qualify here through the last chance qualifier, and he's going to be joining many others. As we scroll down a little bit further, this is the bracket. We have Geralt, Shameless, Showtime, and Skillless. We have four Protoss players available here. In the qualifier, we have one Terran in Spirit, and we have three Zerg players in a laser, Nikic, and Rainer. Oh boy, so eight players in total. Again, there are certain players from the European region that aren't taking part. The big names that aren't here are the Zerg players in Lambo. Lambo isn't a part of this. Serral either. Serral and Lambo, they aren't a part of this event. They did not partake in the qualifiers. The other big one is Hero Marine. Of course, Clem said that he's going to be traveling, so Clem isn't available, which is why he forfeited his spot. Otherwise, Clem would be a part of this. Um, but Hero Marine is the other. It's Hero Marine, Lambo, and Serral. They did not partake in the qualifiers. They will not be part of the main event. And they won't be traveling. They won't have the opportunity to travel to the offline finals, which is a shame. Which is a shame. Uh, it does mean that it does feel like the European region is a little bit weaker as a result. Only a little bit. We still have, you know, the best Protosses in Europe in Showtime and Skillless. We have Spirit, one of the best Terrans in Europe. I would say top two, arguably top three, depending on how you rank him against Hero Marine. And you have Raynor, top two Zerg. Top two, second only to Serral. And a laser as well, just under it. So some good representation nonetheless. And we have our bracket. It's going to be Raynor versus Shameless. Showtime versus Skillless, Geralt versus Nikic, and a laser versus Spirit. Ooh, that is a spicy one. It's going to be played out in 24 hours. A laser versus Spirit does stand out to me as a very, very intense series, and we will most likely be casting it, or we will be casting all of it, actually. It's all going to be casted tomorrow on the Cranky Ducklings. We are going to be live here with, with Stars War 11, the European and America's closed qualifier. Um, again, it's going to be a multi-day event. Every match is casted. So it is double elimination. So we have these eight players working into the upper bracket semis, into the finals, into the lower bracket as well. So a lot of games are going to be played out. A lot of matches are going to be had. Look forward to it. It's going to be a week full of StarCraft. Oh, boy. With that, though, we are done. We are going to be wrapping things up.
we are going to be wrapping things up here and we are going to be closing out again we were live how, how long have we been live five hours <laughs> pretty pretty decent broadcast here uh, we're going to be wrapping things up we're going to be back in three hours time so we have a little bit of time here to rest to get some food to take a break in three hours this channel is going to be live once again with esl open cup europe the european weekly is in three hours time and we're going to be here to bring it to you live on the cranky ducklings again you know, we have plenty of content on the channel. We're live every single day. And just like today, we're live at times multiple times a day. So three broadcasts here. Let's go. Getting all the StarCraft. We're always, we're always on that grind set. If you want to follow us, if you want to support us, exclamation mark socials. Exclamation mark socials in the chat. You can get a link to our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Discord. As I just mentioned, we are also live on YouTube. And we also have plenty of VODs on YouTube as well. So you can check out our YouTube channel if you're interested in some more content. If you can't wait for us to be live, you can check out our VODs over there if you're interested. Uh, likewise, you can support us on Patreon. Exclamation on Patreon in the chat. Patreon does fund our tournaments, events like Sparkling Tuna Cup, Sea Duckling Open, and Master Swan Open as well. Plenty of events that we host here on the channel, and you can help grow our events via Patreon, if you wish, if you wish. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for the support. We'll be back in a couple of hours with ESL Living Cup Europe. Until then, enjoy yourselves, take a break, get some food, get some snacks, and come back for some more StarCraft. Until then, thanks for watching. Hasta luego. Ciao, papi, ciao. Hasta luego. <laughs>